This is the ninth book in the How to Train Your Dragon series. There are three to four CDs in each book. I will release one audiobook at a time to build up suspension. Subscribe and turn on notifications to be notified when the next audiobook will be ready. Tune into them next time. Side note. I do not claim by any right to say that I published them. But give full credit to Cressida Cowell and David Tennant. I hope you enjoy the wonders of these books that I have enjoyed over the years. How to Steal a Dragon's Sword by Cressida Cowell Read by David Tennant Warning! Any relationship to any historical fact whatsoever is entirely coincidental. You have been warned. About Hiccup. Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III was an awesome sword fighter, a dragon whisperer, and the greatest Viking hero that ever lived. But Hiccup's memoirs look back to when he was a very ordinary boy, and finding it hard to be a hero. A small plea to listeners. Please do not blame the story. Up until now, Hiccup has just been playing at adventure, learning to be a hero when the stakes are not so high. But darker and more difficult times are coming now to the Isle of Berk. Please do not blame the story. The story cannot help itself. For sometimes we do not realise it at the time, but the story we are all a part of is not just a story about Vikings and islands and dragons. It is a story about growing up. And one of the things about growing up, one of the inescapable, inevitable laws, is that one day, one day, one day, it is going to happen. I'm sorry, but it's true. Prologue by Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III, the last of the great Viking heroes. Now that I am an old, old man, the past seems very far away. But once there were dragons in the archipelago. And once I was a boy, a boy who in the thirteenth year of my life made a terrible mistake. I released the dragon Furious from the prison of Berserk. The dragon promised to fly into exile in the icy wastes of the north for one year only. One year's grace, and then he vowed that he would bring down a dragon rebellion whose only aim was the absolute and utter extinction of the entire human race. Over the next year, the boy that once was me grew like a weed, at least three inches taller. My arms were sticking right out of my shirt sleeves. But the year came and went, with no sign of the dragon furious or of his rebellion. I heaved a sigh of relief, and began to hope that perhaps the terrible hurts of a hundred years of imprisonment had been soothed by the chill of those innocent snows, and diving free and joyous through the pin-sharp cold waters, chasing the fleeting seals in that endless chilly wilderness, the dragon had returned to the happy, carefree life of his ancestors. Perhaps he had remembered himself up there in his element, and what if he had forgotten his promise? And maybe he might not return after all. Perhaps. What if? Maybe. But in the quiet watches of the night, the words of the dragon furious came hissing and burning back into my brain, and they were not words that melted like water into snowdrops. They were words of flame, and they hissed and leapt into burning, terrible life in my dreams. We shall scourge this world with fire and leave no wretched human being alive, not a single one. For over the last hundred years, I have been looking into the past and into the future, and I tell you this, boy, humans and dragons cannot live together. The words spat through my brain like living, burning snakes, so I will call the dragons from far and wide, from the depths of the ocean and the ends of the earth, and we shall fight the final battle before it is too late. No, 
I shrieked in my dream, no, 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 no. But time cannot tick backwards. The boy that once was me could not stop it. And the dragon was coming. One, the greatest day of your life, not. One long ago winter's midnight, Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III awoke with a frightened start. Despite being the hope and heir to the tribe of the hairy hooligans, Hiccup was a gangly, skinny, ordinary-looking boy with a kind of face that was easy to overlook in a crowd. To tell the truth, he had not been sleeping very well. It is difficult to sleep well if one's bed is a hammock suspended three-quarters of the way up the hard way of Angry Mountain. The hard way of Angry Mountain is a cliff so high that it takes two days and a night to climb it. It is so vertical that a climber has to hammer in a couple of nails and spend that night sleeping uneasily in a hammock hung precariously from the shiny rock. Hiccup's riding dragon, the Windwalker, sleeping on a little shelf of rock a couple of feet away, was supposed to be looking out for danger. However, it was still winter, the Windwalker's hibernation time, so he was barely even awake in the daytime, and now that it was night, he was sleeping so soundly he might as well have been dead. His long, untidy body sprawled messily on the ledge, snoring as loud as a cow with a cold. Anything dangerous would have had to come right up and sit on his head before he'd take any notice whatsoever. Toothless, Hiccup's tiny, selfish, common or garden hunting dragon had not noticed anything either. He was fast asleep on Hiccup's chest, sending out smoke rings that filled the hammock. But it was danger that woke Hiccup up. He was sure of it. Hiccup's heart was pumping like a jack-in-a-box, and he was suddenly wildly awake, for with every fibre of his being he sensed danger. Danger all around him. Frankly, they should have been safe enough, high up on a cliff face, in the middle of the winter time, when most of the dangerous dragons in the archipelago were still hibernating. The only danger should have been if the hammock fell down. So why did Hiccup's heart tick so quick, and why was his stomach so faint that he was nearly sick? Moving very slowly, he didn't want to dislodge himself, Hiccup peered over the edge of the hammock. The bottom of the cliff was sickeningly far below. Hiccup swallowed and tried not to look down. They were so far up he could see for miles in every direction, as if he were looking down on a map of the archipelago, to the west, the sea, to the north, the sinister jagged gash of the gorge of the Thunderbolt of Thor, further north still, the drifting icebergs and ragged peaks of the cold mountains, and here, right here, the strange mainland landscape of ice and snow, relieved by weirdly warm bubbling pools belching drifting smoke upwards like dragons snoring. A couple of feet away on the cliff hung the patched hammock of Hiccup's best friend, Fishlegs. Fishlegs, too, was snoring, but that was probably his asthma. Fishlegs was, unfortunately, allergic to his own dragon, Horror Cow, who was in there with him. Or it could have been his hay fever. Fishlegs was the only person Hiccup knew who could get hay fever in the middle of the winter. And above, way above, was the night sky, brilliantly studded with stars. The sky was full of noises. Sounds more eerie than thunder, stranger than lightning. A high-pitched sound that made the eardrums throb, like whales calling to each other in an alien universe. And up there in the sky, Hiccup could see advancing black, shadowy shapes, slowly flying towards them over the gorge of the Thunderbolt of Thor. They were too far away for him to identify which types of dragon they were exactly, but there was something nightmarish about their wings, and he knew them deep in his soul. When a young rabbit spots a hawk circling above, it may never have seen such a creature before, but there is some ancestral memory that tells it to be afraid, to leap in great panicky bounds to the safety of the burrow. So it was with these dragons. It was not, of course, that Hiccup had never seen dragons before. He lived in a world full of the creatures, both wild and domesticated. But what was different about these dragons was their behaviour. They were a number of different species, and they were acting as if they were in a hunting party. And dragon species did not generally join together to hunt humans. Maybe they had done, once, long ago. 
but for as long as the old ones could remember, they did not hunt humans. A wild dragon would eat you, of course, if you happened to cross its path and it was hungry, but there was no organised hunting of the human, as perhaps there had been way in the past. Hiccup's scalp prickled all over with fear, as if he were being climbed all over by black beetles. He strained so hard to hear into that blackness that it was as if his ears were growing outwards. And somehow, above the roar of the wind, he could just hear a truly terrifying noise, a savage hiss in Dragonese, but nastier than he had ever heard Dragonese spoken. It was so cold with hatred. There was something scarily trance-like about the way the words were spat out, so faint he could hardly catch them. But perhaps it was better if he could not hear them after all. Make red your claws with human blood, obliterate the human filth, torch the humans like a wood, the rebellion is coming. Closer, closer flew the advancing dragons, heading straight for the cliff where the hammocks perched. Hiccup craned his neck even further upwards. About sixty feet above him were the hammocks of the other young warriors of the tribes of the archipelago, hammered into the cliff just like his own. They were a half an hour's climbing ahead of Fishlegs and Hiccup, and while Fishlegs and Hiccup's hammocks were made out of brown patched blankets, theirs were made out of old ship sails. The gaudy patterns of these sails, such as red and white stripes or blue and gold diamonds, made them stick out against the cliff like a flamingo sitting in a bog. The mysterious dragons were heading straight for them. Hiccup could see what they were now. He recognised them from their wing patterns. They were a mixture of some of the nastiest types of dragons in the archipelago. Razor wings and tongue twisters and doldrums and vampire ghoul deaths. I've got to warn the others, thought Hiccup, and he opened his mouth to shout, but terror seemed to have strangled his vocal cords like it does in your worst nightmares. Squeak, panted Hiccup faintly. Squeak, squeak, squeak. That wasn't going to do much good. And then, dragons! And as an afterthought, really nasty ones? This wasn't even waking up toothless, let alone the young warrior snoring peacefully unawares high above him. The dragons were horribly near now, flying in close formation. Most unnatural behaviour for dragons. They were drawing down their legs and stretching out their talons, ready to strike. The warriors were totally helpless. They'd be killed inside their gaudy cocoons as they slept. Hiccup leant across to the small ledge in the cliff where he had stowed his rucksack. Hands shaking, he drew out his bow and an arrow from the quiver. Perhaps it was lucky that Hiccup was so far away. If he could see what the leader of the dragon pack was doing now, he might have fainted. For the leader was a tongue-twister dragon. Tongue-twister sounds like quite a sweet name for a dragon, but I am afraid that tongue-twisters remove the limbs from their victims so that they can no longer run away. I'm sorry, but it's true. Hovering perfectly still next to one of the hammocks, the tongue-twister slowly opened its mouth and outflicked its tongue, a tongue thicker than a man's muscly arm. The forked ends of that tongue were flexible and delicate. The tongue slid inside one of the hammocks, the one belonging to Hiccup's unpleasant cousin Snotlout, and rummaged around as if looking for something. Hiccup took careful aim and fired the arrow. Of course, he was aiming at the tongue-twister. Hiccup wasn't that bad a marksman, actually. Not as good as he was at sword-fighting, but not bad. But to do Hiccup justice, it is difficult to fire an arrow from a wobbling hammock, particularly when you are using a bow and an arrow both bent out of shape, ironically, by Snotlout himself. The slightly crooked arrow left the bow and spiralled upwards, weaving erratically in a drunken fashion. At the last minute, it plunged to the right, missed the dragon entirely, and sank into Snotlout's left calf. It wasn't quite what Hiccup had intended, but it did have the desired effect. Sort of. Snotlout let out a small, muffled scream, as you would, of course, if you'd just been shot in the leg by an arrow, and leapt out of the hammock, much to the surprise and annoyance of the tongue-twister, who hadn't yet got hold of one of Snotlout's limbs. Of course, in his half-asleep, arrow-ridden state, Snotlout had completely forgotten he was three-quarters of the way up a cliff. Down he plunged, hurtling down that hysterical drop, past the hammocks of his fellow warriors and past Hiccup himself, who reached out desperately to try and catch him, though Snotlout would have been far too heavy. And that would have been the end of Snotlout, if there had not been a tree growing out of the cliff face not far below Hiccup. The tree broke Snotlout's fall, and though he carried on downwards, he just managed to grab hold of one of the lower bendy branches to save himself. 
So, there was Snotloud, dangling from the tree, a 3,000 foot drop below him, so surprised that he too could not make a sound, staring up at Hiccup with round, terrified eyes. Help me, you idiot, mouthed Snotloud gracelessly. Snotloud was not one for being polite, even when he had just been saved from a nasty fate at the tongue of a tongue twister, and he was still depending on the person he was insulting to save his life. He couldn't hold on for long, but was slightly out of Hiccup's reach. Hiccup frantically scrabbled around in his hammock, trying to get out one of his climbing ropes so that Snotloud could grab onto it. But even at the best of times, manoeuvring inside a hammock is like trying to put your underpants on inside a pillowcase, and in this instance, with a hammock fugged up with toothless as smoke, it was like taking part in some bizarre sauna-like sweating ceremony. Back and forth, Hiccup struggled and swayed, but he couldn't find the end of the beastly climbing rope, and his hands were slippery with perspiration. He gave a frantic wriggle like a stranded worm, and accidentally drew his sword instead of pulling out the climbing rope. With a dreadful ripping sound, the sword cut the old faded brown hammock right in half. Whoa! Now, at last he could find his voice. Dragon attack! It was an enormous shout, the full terrified blast of Hiccup's lungs echoing off the dark walls of the cliff, sending the shout back again and on and up. A couple of feet away, Fishlegs caught the full blast of the shout and rocketed into wakefulness like an exploding starfish. He very nearly fell out of his hammock as well. Way, way up the cliff, every hammock wobbled and wiggled as its occupants blearily sat up, blurting, What's that? What's going on? Eek! squealed Toothless in alarm, opening his eyes and putting out his wings as he realised he was plummeting towards the ground. The dragons paused in their attack, hovering for a moment in the cold night air. They adjusted the lights in their yellow eyes, an extraordinary trick that some dragons possess, from a slight glow to a dazzling glare, and turned their heads downwards, and pinpointed Hiccup, swinging on his hammock remains, illuminating him in the dazzling brightness of their many searchlight eye beams, so that he shone in brilliant detail against the darkness of the cliff. Uh-oh! Windwalker, wake up! yelled Hiccup, waving his sword around wildly. He yelled this in Dragonese, for Hiccup was one of the few Vikings before or since who could speak this fascinating language. <sighs> snored the Windwalker. The swarm of dragons, eerily still hanging way above Hiccup, hissed with slow, chilling anger. Something in their eyes clicked. It was the little focus lid, a shutter that came down over their eyes and enabled them to see objects pin sharp from an extraordinary distance. They hung there for a moment more without moving. Only their eyes shifted a little, following the waving of Hiccup's sword. And then they folded back their wings and dived. The prey dive. What a beautiful sight, if Hiccup had only been in the state of mind to appreciate it. It's a shame that he was hanging by only one blanket strand off the highest cliff in the archipelago at the time. For the prey dive is a glorious feat of aerial acrobatics, where the dragon goes into freefall with his wings folded back. And to see a swarm of gigantic dragons performing this simultaneously, so vertically and so close to the hard way of Angry Mountain that their wings were practically skimming the cliff itself in the dead of night time, well, I can tell you. That should have been a privilege and a pleasure, the kind of sight to see before you die. And frankly, if you see this kind of sight, the likelihood is you're going to die pretty soon anyway. The lead dragon opened his jaws as the dragons came screaming down at Hiccup, who had made a final wild wriggling swing back onto the cliff at the last minute, and the entire swarm of dragons missed him and carried on, unable to stop in their brilliant dive down the cliff. Hiccup scrabbled around wildly, desperately trying to get a foothold on the glass-smooth rock face. He could feel his fingers sliding slightly down what was left of the hammock. He couldn't hold on much longer, but there was nothing for his feet to grip onto, and he swung out again over the dizzying drop. Meanwhile, Toothless was bouncing up and down on the windwalker's stomach, desperately trying to get him to wake up. Wake up! Wake up! Or Toothless will grind your bones into broth! yelled the little dragon. Wake up, you lollipin! L -l Lazy bones! L -l Loser! <sighs> the windwalker's snores were happier and more contented than ever. In his dreams, he was flitting happily from tree to tree, and a dear little butterfly was gently tickling his stomach with its dear little butterfly wings. Fishlegs tried to get himself out of his hammock to help, but his foot got stuck in one of the ropes. Clang! 
The fiftieth dragon, another tongue twister, having screeched past Hiccup at 150 miles an hour, did a lightning last-minute breakneck turn, gripping onto the cliff with the hooks on the ends of its wings. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant flying skills. With eyes firmly set on Hiccup, the tongue twister rapidly began to haul itself by its wings across the cliff towards the dangling and seemingly helpless Hiccup. Toothless had given up bouncing on the Windwalker's stomach and was now heaving with all his tiny strength, trying to nudge the happily snoring Windwalker off the ledge in the hope that that would bring him to his senses. Oh, don't go, dear little butterfly, whispered the Windwalker in his dreams, blowing reproachful crooning smoke rings. Stay with me, little fluttery one, and we'll dance the flower dance together. Hiccup, you fool! shouted Snortloud, hanging on by his hands to the tree a couple of feet below. Do something for once in your life! I can't hold on much longer! But Hiccup had problems of his own. Aye! screeched Hiccup as the tongue twister crawled bat like ever closer, and as it opened its mouth, he could see the dreadful, muscly, hairy tongue lurking slug like in the depths. The dragon's alligator jaws snapped open and its horrible tongue snaked out and around Hiccup's sword, dragging Hiccup's left hand with it off the rope. The dragon shifted its grip a moment and, shivering with revulsion, Hiccup felt the tongue curling around his whole arm. Ping! Another strand of the blanket broke, leaving him dangling by only the tiniest threads above the drop. The dragon paused, preparing to twist off Hiccup's arm with the sword. Tongue Twisters Statistics Fear Factor Score 9 Attack Score 9 Speed Score 7 Size Score 8 Disobedience Score 9 Total Score 42 Tongue Twisters are gigantic mountain-dwelling dragons. They twist off their victims' limbs with their long, muscly tongues, thus rendering them helpless and unable to move. 2. Why they were there in the first place. I'll take a little breather while the dragon pauses, just to recap on what had brought Hiccup to this situation in the first place. It's always very irritating when you get hurtled into the middle of a story without any explanation as to why the heroes got there and how they got there and what on earth they were doing camping three quarters of the way up the hard way of Angry Mountain in the middle of the winter in the first place. It was a perfectly barmy idea, surely. Here is what happened. Bright and early that morning, the tribes of the archipelago had gathered at the foot of Angry Mountain in a great, noisy, jostling crowd of tents and sledges and skis, greeting old friends and enemies with a bump of their massive bellies, hunting dragons wheeling above them in the air, riding dragons getting into dragon fights. Perched right on the top of Angry Mountain was Flashburn's School of Sword Fighting. The tribes were travelling there for the annual three-week celebration of feasting, fighting and festivities, which ended on New Year's Day with a sword-fighting competition and the New Year New Warrior ceremony, in which youngsters across the archipelago finally crossed over from childhood into adulthood and became warriors of their tribes. There are two ways to climb Angry Mountain. There is the easy way, a gentle, pleasant incline that you can stroll up quite merrily without even getting out of breath, that is the way the adult warriors would take, with their sledges and tents and riding dragons and driver dragons and weapons and provisions. And then there is the hard way, a sheer vertical cliff face of rock that takes two days to climb. That is the way the young warriors-to-be would take, to prove their worthiness to be admitted into the tribes. The test had first been set way in the distant and dangerous past, when Vikings did not have riding dragons to aid them so the rule was the cliff must be climbed without dragonly assistance. The warriors-to-be were looking up at the gigantic rock face rather dubiously. They were a motley crew of pimply adolescents, all of them much larger and more muscly than Hiccup and Fishlegs. Apart from Kamikaze, who was a good friend of Hiccup's, a tiny, fierce little bog burglar with a great deal of blonde hair that looked as if she had carelessly combed it with a pitchfork. Gobber the Belch, teacher in charge of the hooligan pirate training programme, was giving the warriors-to-be a quick pep talk. Gobber was a a six-and-a-half-foot man-mountain with lungs like a foghorn and ears like deformed cauliflowers. He didn't have a sensitive side. 
OK, warriors, listen up, he shouted. This is a stroll in the park. All you have to do is spend the next day and night climbing the sheer vertical cliff face. Once we get to the school, you will be practising for the sword fighting competition on New Year's Day. This is your chance to learn and get tips from the greatest sword fighter in the archipelago, Flashburn himself. Oohs and ahs from the warriors-to-be. Oh, I can't wait to meet Flashburn in real life. Kamikaze chatted excitedly to Hiccup and Fishlegs. He's supposed to be the perfect hero. Here he comes, called out Thuggery the Meathead, pointing upward. A gorgeous red tiger dragon with Flashburn crouched very low on its back dived down out of nowhere from above. Kamikaze let out a wow and punched the air as the dragon zoomed over their heads so low that they could feel the wind of its wings. The dragon swooped so very low that Flashburn leant over and very cheekily grabbed Stoic the Vast's helmet off his head before flying upwards again. Stoic the Vast, Hiccup's father, was built in the traditional Viking mould, with muscles like footballs, a beard like a thunderstorm, and about as many brain cells as would fit into a teeny tiny teaspoon. He was not amused. Oh, that Flashburn, he hasn't changed one bit! snorted Stoic, as everybody laughed, and the youngsters ooed and aahed. Come down, you show off, yelled Stoic. It's going to be nightfall by the time we get going at this rate. I don't know these heroes, no consideration. Finally, with a graceful zooming swoop, Flashburn's red tiger came in to land directly in front of Stoic, and Flashburn did a complete double somersault over the dragon's head, landed on his feet, and offered Stoic back his helmet with an elegant bow. There you are, Stoic, my dear. Don't call me dear, fumed Stoic, snatching it back. Get on with it, why don't you? Flashburn smiled and sprang onto a nearby rock so that everyone could see him. Flashburn was an extremely good-looking man with a lot of long blonde hair. His famous gold sword-fighting belt was around his waist and the captured swords of some of the most famous sword-fighters in the archipelago thrust into it. Greetings, old fatsoes! smiled Flashburn good-humouredly. Why, Mogadon the Meathead, you've been on weight, I hardly recognised you. Bertha! I'm not sure that shade of violet really suits you. Mad Guts the Murderous, you're losing your hair already! Greetings, warriors-to-be! Flashburn ignored the slight rumblings of annoyance from the older warriors. I have the great good luck and the extraordinary good fortune to be the great Flashburn himself. You may cheer now. The younger warriors cheered. Flashburn seemed to expect it. He pointed at the vertical cliff face of rock. This, the hard way up Angry Mountain, is the ultimate test. Are you the stuff that a hero is made of? Or are you a jellyfish in a skirt? If you pass this test and get to my school, which is, of course, the most brilliant school in the universe, you will be practising for the sword fighting competition on New Year's Day and competing for the sword fighting belts. The green belt is the lowest, then blue, then purple, black, red, and after that you progress to bronze bronze, silver and gold when you have earned the right to call yourself a Flashmaster. And you only get a gold belt if you beat another gold Flashmaster. Of course, we're not expecting any of you to get that far. There are not that many Flashmasters in the archipelago. You never made Flashmaster level, did you now, murderess, my dear? Madguts the murderess gave a furious strangled grunt. No finesse, explained Flashburn kindly. The murderers fight like pigs in pyjamas. Madguts gave a dreadful roar and charged at Flashburn's sword drawn. Flashburn did not bother to draw one of the many swords thrust into his sword fighting belt. Instead, he reached into the nearest rucksack and took out a spoon and an apple. This seemed to enrage Madguts even further. Madguts lunged forward like an infuriated bull, and Flashburn's spoon and Madguts' sword met in a bewildering flurry of metal feints and parries. To the delight of the cheering tribesmen, ten seconds later, Madguts found himself flat on his back in the snow, with an apple stuck on the end of his sword and a spoon on the end of his nose. You see? No finesse. And dead as a dodo in less than ten seconds, grinned Flashburn, bowing to the applause. And I wouldn't laugh too hard. Nobody here could have lasted any longer. Thus endeth the first lesson, warriors-in-waiting. Cheerio! 
he cried, springing on to his red tiger with a perfect godlike vault, winking at the women and waving his sword in goodbye. And good luck! We'll have the banquet ready when you get there! Remember, there is nothing wrong with a healthy sense of self-respect, especially when you're as brilliant as I am. He's so cool, isn't he? sighed Kamikaze. As you said, purred Stormfly, Kamikaze's beautiful golden hunting dragon, batting her eyelashes, he is the perfect hero. Hey, no, they're not so perfect, grumbled Toothless, who was smitten with Stormfly. Even for a human, he's got a big nose. They had come, at last, to the parting of the ways. With much hearty patting on backs and cheery waves, the adults of the tribe marched off to go the easy way, on their skis and skates and with their driver dragons pulling sledges, and the warriors-to-be began to fasten on their gigantic rucksacks for the long climb up the hard way. We'll beat you to the top, grinned Kamikaze, running to join her gang of bog burglars, a terrifying gaggle of female bodybuilders, because girls are better than boys and always will be. Stoic the Vast bustled up to wish Hiccup goodbye. Good luck, Hiccup, my boy. No pleasure, but remember. I became a gold flashmaster when I was only 18, and so I'm expecting great things from you, Hiccup. Great things. Signs of leadership and so forth. This is your chance to impress your peer group and the other tribes. Great, said Hiccup gloomily. No pressure, then. Stoic stomped off happily, and old wrinkly Hiccup's grandfather hobbled forward. There was an expression of slight horror in old Wrinkly's old whelk eyes, a tremble to his ancient limbs. I have a dreadful foreboding. That terrible danger awaits you at the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting, Hiccup, muttered old Wrinkly, holding up a skinny finger. The world will need a hero, and it might as well be you. Keep your things in tip-top condition, for they are the king's things. Old Wrinkly pointed at Hiccup's shabby collection of equipment. And remember, look after your sword, Hiccup, for it is the sword that points the way. Good luck. The old man shook Hiccup's hand as if he were shaking it for the last time, tears in his eyes. And with that, still muttering to himself, he hobbled off to join the elderly and the children who would return to keep the home fires burning on Berk. Great said Fishlegs. That's great, that is. Terrible danger, my favourite kind. And what was all that weird stuff about your things being the king's things? I have no idea. The thing about grown-ups, said Hiccup, trying to squeeze his blanket into his already bursting at the seams rucksack, is that they're always wanting you to be this great hero and leader. What's wrong with being normal for Thor's sake? What's wrong with just being so-so at stuff? They're just totally unrealistic. Uh Uh-oh, said Fishlegs. For at that moment, reality was approaching, in the form of someone who most definitely did not think Hiccup was a great hero and leader. It was Snotface Snotlout, Hiccup's unpleasant first cousin, a large, arrogant boy with the most enormous nostrils you have ever seen, closely followed by his sidekick, Dog's Breath the Durbrain. OK, listen up, hooligans, grinned Snotlout, addressing the thirteen or so hooligan warriors-to-be. Hiccup will not be leading this group, because he is not a leader. I am. But Hiccup is the son of Stoic the Vast, protested Fishlegs. Who cares, grinned Snotlout, giving Fishlegs a painful kick in the shins and a shove to Hiccup that was so violent it sent him sprawling onto the ground. Hiccup is scrawny and weedy and useless. He can't play bashy ball to save his life. His dragon is the size of a frog, and we can't be led by someone who has a friend like you. This was not a very kind thing to say, but, admittedly, Fishlegs was a little challenged in the Viking department. He was asthmatic, knock-kneed, and nearly blind without his glasses. He was prone to hay fever, eczema, chillblains, and chesty coughs. He did have gifts, of course. He was good at composing poetry, and he had a nice sarcastic sense of humour but neither of these skills were particularly prized in the hooligan tribe. Snotlout drew his sword. With the flash cut, gloated Snotlout, making some lunges at imaginary opponents, I shall be the first warrior in training to make it to Flashmaster level. Trust me, I will. As for you, purred Snotlout, maybe they should create new sword-fighting belts for you two. How about yellow belts? Or pretty pink ones? That'd be good for a couple of cowards and their teeny-weeny little weapons. 
<laughs> snorted Dog's Breath. Ha, 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 laughed the warriors-to-be from some of the other tougher tribes, the Visithugs, the Bashamoiks and the murderous, gathering round them as they sensed some fun was starting. Who are these pathetic words, Snotlout? grinned very vicious the Visithug, a brute of a boy with a vigorous forest of hair sprouting from his ear holes. Surely they can't be hooligans. They pretend to be, sneered Snotlout. Snotlout's eyes went as small and mean as a shark's. He lunged at Hiccup's rucksack and rip, rip, rip went the flash cut. Oh dear, cooed Snotlout, holding up Hiccup's shredded hammock. My hand slipped. I seem to have caused a tiny little tear in your hammock. How will you make it the hard way up Angry Mountain when you haven't got anywhere to sleep? What a shame. You'll just have to stay awake for the whole night. You big cheater, snot loud, replied Fishlegs hotly. You're just scared that if Hiccup makes it to the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting, he's going to beat you. This really annoyed snot loud. The one thing that Hiccup was truly gifted at on the pirate training programme was sword fighting. He hadn't fought Snotlout in a while, but Snotlout wasn't as confident in beating him as he would have liked to be, and that made Snotlout really mad. Whips! 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 yelled Snotlout, lunging at Fishlegs' hammock too, and ripping that to bits as well. Both he and Dog's Breath then launched themselves at the shabby equipment, kicking it all over the place and giving Hiccup and Fishlegs themselves a good kicking into the bargain. A grinning, very vicious, helped them, and Dog's Breath held Hiccup down while Snotlout removed Hiccup's sword from his scabbard and held it up for everyone to see. And that made everyone laugh like anything, for Hiccup's sword, Endeavour, was not very impressive to look at. Your mighty sword, Chief Hiccup, or is it a dagger? Silly me, I seem to have bent it, smiled Snotlout as he smashed the sword on a rock before hurling it as far away as he could. Oh dear, cooed Snotlout. How will you make Gold Flashmaster now? Well, the hooligans and the Visithugs thugs and the Bashamoiks and the murderers were nearly sick. They thought that was so funny. Don't cry, little ones, lisped Snotlout, putting on a baby voice before he and Dog's Breath slouched off. You'll be better off with an excuse to stay here with the old people and the children. Come on, everyone, follow me, yelled Snotlout. See you, losers! And the rest of the grinning warriors-to-be began to climb the cliff after him, leaving Hiccup and Fishlegs bruised and sore and looking sadly at the wreckage of their belongings. They were used to being humiliated by Snotlout in front of the other hooligans, but this was worse because it was in front of the other tribes. It did not bode well for the three weeks they were going to spend at the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. You see, sighed Hiccup gloomily, the grown-ups have totally forgotten what it's like to be thirteen and have to deal with someone like Snotlout. Hiccup's sword had landed in a snowdrift some distance away, and it was Toothless who found it. Dragons are very good at sniffing out metal. It had indeed got a little bent in the process. Hiccup tried to bend it back again, but it was still a little skew with. All of his belongings had got similarly bashed up. There was a large dent in his shield, caused by the big fat foot of Dog's Breath the Durbrain. The ticking thing was smashed and ticking wheezily like it was out of breath. His bow was bent and most of his arrows were broken. If these were indeed the king's things, or whatever old Wrinkly had been going on about, they were definitely not in tip-top condition now. How are we going to sleep if we don't have hammocks? asked Fishlegs. We'll just have to make our blankets into hammocks, said Hiccup. And by the time they had done that and collected their broken things, which Snotlout and Dog's Breath had hurled all over the place, they were a good half an hour behind everyone else. Windwalker, Hiccup said to his riding dragon, you really ought to go round the easy way with everyone else. But Windwalker looked so saddened by this idea that Hiccup relented. Oh, OK then. I suppose as long as you don't actually help us climb up, that's fine. They didn't say you couldn't be here. You spoil your dragons, you really do, said Fishlegs as they began to climb the cliff. And we do, do deserve it, said Toothless. All that day they climbed steadily up the cliff, with poor Fishlegs trying not to look down because he was afraid of heights. When night fell, they hammered in their nails and hung the brown blanket hammocks off the face of the cliff, and Fishlegs was so exhausted he fell asleep immediately, as did the Windwalker, a little way away, balanced precariously on a tiny ledge, and Toothless curled up under Hiccup's waistcoat. 
Hiccup took a little longer to fall asleep, swinging from the hammock like he was on the deck of his father's ship, the Blue Whale. He looked out over the jagged slit of the gorge, laid out beneath him, just like it was indeed one of Thor's thunderbolts, and as if he really was a boy of destiny, and the god himself had reached down to earth and was striking Hiccup with his lightning. And when, finally, he did fall asleep, it was with old Wrinkly's words going round and round in his head. Terrible danger awaits you at the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. The world will need a hero, and it might as well be you. And remember, look after your sword, Hiccup, for it is the sword that points the way. The sword that points the way. The sword that points the way. Three, grappling with the problem. Now there you are, you see. That explains what Hiccup was doing three quarters of the way up Angry Mountain, and that some sort of danger awaited him up at the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. If, of course, they ever even made it to the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. Now, where were we? Oh, yes. The revolting tongue twister had slid its tongue around Hiccup's arm as he dangled from the hammock, completely vulnerable and suspended over a 3,000 foot drop. The dragon had paused, its disgusting mouth open with black saliva dripping from its fangs. All seven of its eyes were focused on Hiccup's sword and his sword alone. The dragon shifted its grip a moment, preparing to twist off the whole arm with the sword. And Toothless, who had given up trying to wake the Windwalker, realised that he would have to take drastic action himself. He leapt up and bit the dragon as hard as he could, right on the tip of that disgusting tongue. The dragon gave an ear-splitting scream of pain. The tongue unwrapped itself in a flurry of splattering black saliva, and the tongue twister lost its grip on Hiccup's arm and the rock and fell into freefall off the cliff. Thanks, Toothless, breathed Hiccup, and he gave a final lurching, desperate swing and landed on the ledge just at the moment that the hammock finally gave way. In an instant, the now furious tongue twister pulled out of freefall and was flying back up towards them with bat-like flaps, murder in its seven eyes. Hiccup could see the entire swarm had come out of the prey dive and were following. What were they after? Hiccup thought extremely fast. Look after your sword, Old Wrinkly had said, for it is the sword that points the way. Suddenly, Hiccup understood. The dragons hadn't been looking at him. What they wanted was his sword. Here's my sword if you want it, yelled Hiccup, leaning backwards and with one swift sleight of hand, drawing Fishleg's sword out of his backpack. He held it aloft for a moment to make sure the dragons had seen it, and then he threw it as far as he could down into the gorge. It made a beautiful arc as it fell. The multiple dragon eyes snapped like clockwork to the sword. The lead tongue twister leapt after the dropping sword, and the other dragons swarmed after it too, snapping and snarling and pushing one another out of the way, like dogs chasing a stick. That'll keep them busy for a minute or so before they realise it's the wrong one, thought Hiccup. I can't hold on much longer, panted Snotlout, nostrils flaring, eyes popping, teeth gritted. Save me, you useless twerp! He's far too heavy for me to pull him up, thought Hiccup. As he looked around desperately, he saw beside him on the ledge the ropes and grappling hooks he and fish legs had used on the climb. With frantic fingers, Hiccup tied one end to a splinter of rock protruding from the cliff and dangled the grappling hook over the edge of the ledge, as if he were trying to catch a crab at the pier. Ah! screamed Snotlout as his fingers finally gave way, but just at the moment that they did, the grappling hook caught Snotlout's belt firmly and held, and he swung out, swinging from the rock by his waist. OK, so Snotlout was safe now, for the moment at least, but the situation could still be described as not good. Not good at all. Those dragons were coming back. Just as soon as they discovered that they were going after the wrong sword, they would be back, and the warriors-to-be were stuck there, unable to move. It would be like shooting fish in a barrel. Toothless, Hiccup ordered, I want you to fly as quickly as possible up to the school. Find my father, find Flashburn, find anyone, and make it clear we need rescuing. OK, squeaked Toothless, unexpectedly obedient, and he zoomed off, deeply relieved to have an excuse to get out of there. 
All the young warriors were awake now, and most of them had climbed out of their hammocks and taken up as firm a foothold as they could on the cliff, their bows loaded, their spears and swords drawn. The hunting dragons too were wide awake, their necks swollen, ready for the next attack, peering down into the darkness of the gorge. There were yellow pinpricks in that darkness that grew into eyes, and a chanting that began softly and grew louder. Make red your claws with human blood, obliterate the human filth, torch the humans like a wood, the rebellion is coming. Here they come, yelled a young danger brute. Brace yourselves! And a great wave of dragons came roaring up for another attack, pouring out fire before they even reached the cliff. This time, the Vikings' hunting dragons came flying out to meet them. Smaller though they were, they flew aggressively to meet the onrushing dragons, screaming defiance. One went down in a blaze of flames, a huge monstrous nightmare belonging to very vicious the Visithug, which sank its teeth into the neck of a much larger grim wing, which then gripped it round the throat, and snapping, biting, screaming, down they went, doomed into the gorge in a somersaulting ball of fire. The attack was fierce and furious, but it did not last long. The rebel dragons were beaten back this time, and up they soared, a huge dragon battalion flying in rough formation, up into the sky and then diving down again back into the gorge. There was no applause from the panting, embattled young warriors as the dragons retreated and disappeared, for they knew that this was just a temporary relief, and the dragons would attack again, and again, and again, until there was not a human being left on that cliff. This was how dragons fought. Hiccup had seen it all his life. A dragon attacked in waves, engaging and then retreating, and then attacking again, like a cat playing with a mouse. The ragged line of young warriors clinging precariously to that cliff face was a pathetic sight now, heaving for breath, hair singed, faces raked with blood gashes, their hunting dragons with great livid green talon scars and mauled ears. Many of the rucksacks and hammocks were already in flames. The silence on that cliff face spoke volumes. These young people had been brought up since babyhood in a battle society. They were outnumbered, and they knew they wouldn't be able to hold out until rescue came. They were done for. It would take a miracle to save them now. Someone started singing, softly, defiantly, as they hung there in the tension of the waiting. I was born a hero, and a hero I will die. Let me join The heroes who are living in the sky. You can take away my bright red blood, but a hero I remain. Just let my world be free again and I'll not have died in vain. What do we do now then, Snotlout? Very vicious the busy thug called down. Snotlout had drawn his sword and was struggling to look dignified, but this is very difficult when you are hanging by your waistband from a hook, your legs dangling uselessly with an arrow poking out of one of them. Furthermore, he had just been through a very trying experience and he hadn't a clue what they should do next, so for once in his life he was slightly lost for words. He just opened his mouth and shut it again like a fish on a hook. At last he gasped out, Ready for battle, men! Which wasn't very helpful under the circumstances. We're not on, men, boy Oh, shouted down Kamikaze, grinning her battle smile. What do you think, Hiccup? Now, you see, Hiccup wasn't as good as Snotlout in the looking tough and posing with your skeleton tattoos department, but he was considerably better at the cunning plans dreamt up in the heat of battle department, which, some might say, was more useful in a leader. A leader has to use the equipment he has to hand, and the territory to his advantage. Could Hiccup have read a copy of Sun Tzu's Art of War in the Meathead Public Library? He certainly knew a lot about military tactics. Hmm... Let's see now. They outnumber us four to one. They have wings, talons, teeth and fire. And we have... Hiccup's eyes fell on the grappling hooks. Listen, everybody, Hiccup shouted up the cliff. Attach your grappling hooks to the ropes that tie you all together and tie the other end to any rocks or boulders you can find. The bigger the better. The young warriors were desperate now and in a mood to listen to any plan, however ludicrous or dangerous so with frantic fingers they did as Hiccup had ordered. When the dragons strike, yelled Hiccup, I want you to get in close and throw your grappling hooks onto their backs. Down in the gorge, a warning hum, a distant threatening whir, a glow of yellow appearing in the gloom. Here they come again, yelled the danger brute, and the warriors swallowed, put back their shoulders and tried to get a firm foothold on the cliff 
and a close grip on their grappling hooks. Up the mighty battalion of dragons flew, closer still and closer. Wait, 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 shouted Hiccup. Then, when the dragons were almost upon them, throw your hooks! All along the cliff, the warriors threw the grappling hooks with the long ropes up onto the attacking dragons, as if they were living dragon mountains or moving fiery buildings. Some of the grappling hooks missed their moving targets or slid harmlessly, bouncing off the dragons' backs, but many more hit home, lodging onto one of the spiny back fins as if it were a ledge or burying their sharp pointed edges into the tough dragon flesh of a leg or a shoulder. As before, the leader dragon trumpeted, Retreat! And the dragons disengaged to soar upwards as they had previously, intending to dive back into the gorge and mount yet another attack. But that was not quite what happened. Up the dreadful dragon battalion rose, blazing triumphantly with fire, chanting or screaming with victory, leaving the burning wreckage of their victims on the cliff as they prepared to remount the attack. But many of the dragons were caught by the grappling hooks, and with them the ropes, and at the other ends the boulders. As the dragons rose, so the ropes first tightened, then, one by one, snapped the stones from the ledges. All at once the air was a tapestry of crisscrossing bonds and boulders catapulting across the sky. The dragons shrieked in alarm as the boulders smashed against one, then another, and the ropes whiplashed against heads and wings and talons. The frightened dragons fought to pull away, and when they could not, they turned and attacked one another or entangled other dragons in the mess of ropes. The dragon leader, realising what had happened, screeched for the dragons to stay calm, to pull together, not to panic. But the dragons had not flown together long enough for that, and if dragons hate anything, it is being bound or chained. The ropes terrified them, and pandemonium broke out. One moment they were a victorious, soaring dragon battalion, the next... To the joyous amazement of the young heroes on the rock face, they were a chaos of shrieking dragons fighting tooth and talon to get free and dragon after dragon breaking out of the ropes and deserting, streaking for the horizon. The sagas may tell a different story, but that was how Hiccup III won the Battle of Angry Mountain, leading a troop of youngsters clinging to a cliff against a dragon foe that outnumbered them four to one, using only some old grappling hooks and ropes. Four, a game of hide and seek. Just as the rogue dragons disappeared and the cliff face rang out with the young warriors' cheers, the Windwalker finally woke up. Oh, have I missed something? he asked innocently. Snotlight was still dangling from the tree below Hiccup and he had to be rescued by Very Vicious and Thuggery and a couple more of the bulkiest meatheads and busy thugs who climbed down to help pull him up. For some reason, they seemed to think that it was quite funny that Snotlight was suspended from the cliff by his underpants with an arrow sticking out of his calf. Ha 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 ha! Very Vicious and Thuggery roared with laughter. You look just like a fishy on a hook. You will regret this cousin of mine. Snotlout promised himself, removing the arrow from his leg. Just you wait. You will regret this hiccup, and my time will come. But in his wounded state, he allowed himself to be flown up to the top of the cliff on the back of the windwalker nonetheless. It was only one o'clock in the morning, but nobody felt like hanging around in case those rogue dragons came back, and besides, most of the hammocks had been burnt to ashes. So the young warriors climbed the rest of the cliff in the darkness of the night time, and it was quite tricky, for they had so few of the grappling hooks and ropes left. They reached the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting by about six o'clock, according to Hiccup's ticking thing, and by then the young warriors were a pathetic, bedraggled sight. It was the largest castle that Hiccup had ever seen. It was also strangely silent. They cried up at the walls to be let in, for the drawbridge to be let down, but the great grey walls answered them not. Up on the battlements, flocks of never birds, nesting in the towers above and awoken by the commotion, called back with their own longing, melancholy cries, which sound remarkably like, Where are you? The exhausted young warriors threw up their grappling hooks, scaled the castle walls and collapsed, exhausted on the battlements. I thought we'd really had it that time, gasped Fishlegs. Fishlegs was sprawled beside Hiccup. He had lost his helmet 
and his dragon horror cow had been so frightened when she heard the words of the rogue dragons at the cliff face that she had flown on top of Fishleg's head and entwined her claws into his hair for safety, mooing in a terrified way. Infant dragons often climb onto their mother's back or head and cling to it in times of peril. Kamikaze was so beside herself with overexcitement, she was chattering even quicker than normal. You were brilliant, Hiccup, brilliant! That whole grappling hook thing was awesome! Even in his ragged, singed, exhausted state, Hiccup felt triumphant. Now that they were safe, the young warriors came over to thump Hiccup on the back and thank him for his idea about the grappling hooks. Oh, good work. What was your name, Hiccup? grunted very vicious the busy thug, gruffly, slapping him on the back so hard he nearly fell over. Sorry about the misunderstanding earlier. I told you, grinned Thuggery the meathead, he's surprisingly cool. Hiccup wasn't used to getting this kind of attention from the tougher, older Vikings. Normally, at best, they ignored him, or at worst, laughed and jeered. This was what my father meant about getting the respect of my peer group, thought Hiccup, red with embarrassment and pride. It felt good. But he still had a feeling of terrible unease at the edges of his mind. He had defeated those dragons, for now. But why were different species flying side by side to attack the warriors in the first place? Why did they want Hiccup's sword? And what was that horrible thing that they were chanting in Dragonese? And it wasn't long before the warriors stopped congratulating each other and started looking around at their surroundings questioningly. What was going on? Where was everybody? Kamikaze's excited chattering died away. The silence was deathly. They had never been to the Flashburn School before, but they knew there ought to have been lookouts on the battlements, even at night time. Where were they? There were spears neatly stacked, and shields balanced as if someone had just put them away tidily. But nobody was there. And Old Wrinkly had said that terrible danger awaited them at the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting, thought Hiccup. A flap of wings, and Hiccup jumped but it was only Toothless, coming to sit on Hiccup's helmet, looking very relaxed and pleased with himself, and eating what looked like an enormous mouthful of wild boar. "'What have you been?' asked Hiccup, a little irritated. "'I asked you to get help, not get yourself some breakfast. We were in real trouble down there.' Toothless started guiltily. "'Oh, yes, Toothless was looking. Toothless la, la, looked everywhere.' "'Why is your mouth full?' asked Hiccup sternly. "'Not eating,' explained Toothless, batting his eyelids innocently. "'Just to chew in the air.' "'Well, that air smells like wild boar,' said Hiccup. hello shouted Thuggery the meathead. "'Is there anybody here? Come out and declare yourselves!' Answer came there none. "'Where are you?' called the Neverbirds. The young warriors looked at one another. Perhaps they weren't safe after all. Nobody said it, but what they were thinking was, maybe there are some of those rogue dragons even here, in this very castle. They drew their swords and began to wander cautiously through the deserted building. But everywhere they went, all they met was silence, apart from the howling of the wind and the cry of the neverbirds. Where are you? which was, unfortunately, rather appropriate for the slightly sinister game of hide-and-seek they were playing, and didn't help their nerves. It is a spooky experience, tiptoeing through the darkness of an unfamiliar abandoned castle in the dead of night, not knowing whether someone or something may jump out at you at any moment. The young warriors were experienced burglars and soldiers, of course, so they crept through the castle like seasoned commandos. Two of them stood on either side of a door, and then they all burst through, axes and swords at the ready and checked under tables, behind doors, beneath tapestries. Nothing. Where are you? croaked the Neverbirds. Hiccup's back was tense, nerves as tight as catgut, expecting at any moment dragon claws upon his back, dragon fire upon his neck. There were great training rooms with swords and spears stacked in racks on the side, huge empty towers and an enormous central fighting arena with torches flaming all around it. Someone must have lit those torches. But where were all the people? Finally, having wandered for half an hour through echoing halls and the warren of empty corridors, 
hiccups and very vicious as warriors to be, all met somewhere in the middle, outside a great glowing windowed banqueting hall. Just as Hiccup's nerves could barely stand it, there was a whir of wings overhead. Somebody cried out, Dragons! And a number of tense young warriors to be let fly their north bows without thinking, Warden's whiskers don't fire, you imbeciles! You nearly took my head off there! yelled a furious voice from above. It was Stoic the Vast, aboard his great dragon Bullheart. Open the castle doors! The adult warriors who had taken the easy way up Angry Mountain were arriving. As they staggered through the castle doors, it was clear that the easy way had not been all that easy, what with one thing and another. The adults had been attacked by rogue dragons too. Scorched faces, riding dragons that limped with scarred limbs and red ripped ears, someone rather inexplicably carrying a blackened, burnt piece of mast, still with a flag flying bravely from the end, shell-shocked, serious. This was the state in which the adult warriors arrived. The tired chieftain's expressions were unusually grim as they landed their riding dragons on the battle arena. Wordlessly, they took in the state of their young warriors-to-be, ash-streaked and bleeding, raked with talons and blasted by fire, their clothes flapping in rags about them, still coughing from the smoke, all unmistakable signs of a full-scale dragon attack. The warriors-to-be were tough young adolescents, but even though they were trying to carry their broken weapons with their usual swagger, their eyes betrayed them. You could see the fear in those eyes from their extraordinarily close brush with death. They were scared. Dragons had never behaved in this way before. An attack of this nature, with different species joining together, was unheard of in the archipelago, and they were terrified it was going to happen again. "'Are you all alive?' growled Bertha, chief of the bog burglars and Kamikaze's mother, a great thunder-thighed mountain of a woman whose singed plaits were still smoking slightly. Kamikaze stepped forward and gave the salute. All alive, she said, thanks to Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III, but the castle is deserted. That really rattled the chieftains. Biceps of Thor, bellowed Mogadon the meathead. Don't tell me Flashburn has been defeated. Impossible! The finest hero the archipelago has ever known, and his forty warriors and the red tigers, they're undefeatable. How can this be? Together, they pushed wide the gigantic door of the banqueting hall, as tall as a house. (coughs) Nobody there again. There was a big golden cauldron sitting on the remains of an extinguished fire, but the ashes were still smouldering. The long table was set for a great triumphal banquet, the banquet of the new warriors, and a joyous feast it should have been indeed, with the torches lit and a thousand Vikings toasting the new generation. The tribes of the archipelago trooped into that banqueting hall in funereal procession and surveyed what ought to have been the triumphal feast. The food was set on the long tables, a great wild boar sitting in the middle, with a few little gummy bites taken out of it, but that would have been toothless. Knob or no brains found a chicken leg and gnawed on it enthusiastically. Mmm, tasty, and still warm, he grunted. Still warm? That meant the inhabitants of the castle had been there very recently. But where were they now? Where are you? The distant song of the Neverbirds floated hauntingly through the window. It was a mystery. <laughs> The noise came out of nowhere, an imperious ringing knock, like the great god Thor knocking on a metal door with the tip of his axe. Sounding out in a deserted castle on a clifftop with the wind howling around them and the inhabitants of that castle having mysteriously disappeared, the effect on the exhausted Vikings who had spent the night fighting rogue dragons, well, the effect on those Vikings was pretty devastating, I'd say. What was that? whispered Grabbit the Grim, his two black and blue eyes boggling, his grip tightening on his still smouldering axe. What was that noise? (coughs) There it is again, exclaimed Stoic in astonishment. It was a loud echoing noise, as if someone was knocking on a metal door and expecting an answer. (coughs) Where are you? Where could it possibly be coming from? wondered Stoic. Uh Uh-oh, thought Hiccup. Maybe it's Fishlegs' knees knocking together, suggested Snotloud, 
but he said it with less than usual swagger in his sneer because there was something deeply unsettling and spooky about such a knocking in such a setting. Well, shiver my cockles and blister my bunions. It seems to be coming from the cauldron, exclaimed Stoic. It was indeed coming from the big golden cauldron. Something or someone was inside that cauldron, and that something or someone was knocking the insides with a clear, loud knock. Investigate the cauldron, no brains, ordered Stoic. Um, I've got a little cramp in my leg, actually, Chief, said Nobber. Old war injury. It comes on occasionally. The Vikings had been brought up on stories by the fireside of skeletons being brought back to life in a cooking pot, so they could hardly be blamed for their terror. The chiefs looked at one another. They stepped forward to the cauldron. The golden cauldron was surrounded by eighteen muscled chieftains with their weapons drawn, not to mention most of the warriors in the archipelago. Grabbit the Grim threw back his shoulders and knocked on the lid himself. Three bright, bossy knocks. He cleared his throat, importantly. "'Come out, whoever you are,' he ordered. "'This is Chief Grabbit the Grim speaking.' Come out with your hands above your head, for you are surrounded. The cauldron was abruptly silent. This time, Stoic knocked. If you don't come out on the count of three, he warned in his most important I must be obeyed voice, we will be forced to lift the lid ourselves, and I warn you, we are very heavily armed. Silence from the cauldron. Well... Those eighteen hairy chieftains would rather have been blown by storms into the back of next week before they lost face in front of one another. They were afeard. Oh, yes, they were. They were afeard right down to their unkempt toenails. But they were going to lift that lid anyway, even if there were one hundred ghosts inside, having degenerate ghost parties with their ancestors. Mogadon, murderous, said Stoic imperiously. Help me lift the lid. Oh, don't lift the lid. Please, don't lift the lid. Poor Fishlegs was practically crying, he was so frightened, and Hiccup had to agree with him. It seemed a good idea to keep that cauldron shut. The lid was so heavy, it took all three Vikings to heave it off the cauldron, and it clanged to the deck with a great ringing clamour. And the three Vikings bellowed as if they were one Viking. As something flew out of the cauldron. A chicken! yelled Baggy Bum in relief. It's only a chicken! Only a chicken! Ha 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 ha! boomed the Vikings, hugely embarrassed and relieved. Ha 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 ha! When, hang on a second! squeaked Fishlegs in alarm. There's something else in there! And there it was, clawing out of the cauldron and grasping hold of the rim from the inside with a ghastly, groping grasp. A human hand with fingernails tipped with iron. Five. Something nasty in the cauldron. <coughs> Screamed the hooligans, the murderers and the grims, the bog burglars, the silence, the bashamoics and the other tribes of the archipelago, stampeding around the banqueting hall like panicking water buffaloes as the white hand stretched towards them. Ghosts and ghouls, breathed Stoic the Vast through white lips, born out of the cooking pot. Snaggletooth jumped right into Gobber's arms and appeared to be trying to climb on top of his head. Baggy Bum the Beer Belly attempted to climb under a bench and jammed there, tight as a cork in a bottle. In fascinated horror, Hiccup fixed his eyes on a second outstretched hand, white as coral and covered with an unidentified grey-green slime of some sort, as it shakily reached out of the cauldron and grasped the edge of the rim. And slowly, slowly, up out of the cooking pot, there rose a human head, as paper-white and grinning as a skull, and as the figure rose higher and higher, they saw it was the figure of an old woman, with long white hair and half-blind eyes covered with a thick grey layer of scum and a nose as sharp as the point of a knife. A ghost! A ghost! A ghost! screamed the Vikings. For the old woman was skinny as a skeleton, and her grey breastplate and long white robes and malevolent expression were exactly the sort of things you might expect a ghost to be wearing. Hiccup was peering through his fingers now, and he let out a gasp 
as he suddenly realised that this wasn't a ghost at all. In fact, it was something considerably worse than a ghost. It made an undead warrior ghost from Valhalla look like a fluffy little kitten on a playdate. Still so painfully white, so drained of colour that Hiccup could hardly bear to look at her, the bones so close under the skin that it was like staring straight at a skull, tapping fingernails tipped with iron. Dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, exclaimed Hiccup in horror and surprise. It's Alvin the treacherous, his mother. Well might Hiccup be horrified and surprised, for Alvin the treacherous, his mother, was a thoroughly unpleasant and powerful witch, and Hiccup had thought that she was dead. If she was alive, that meant that her son Alvin was too, and this was very bad news indeed, for Alvin the Treacherous was Hiccup's arch-enemy. "'Do you know this ghost, Hiccup?' asked Stoic the Vast in amazement. "'It's not a ghost at all,' said Hiccup. "'It's Alvin the Treacherous's mother, and she's a very dangerous witch.' "'It's not a ghost, guys! It's only a witch!' yelled out Mogad on the meathead in relief. The dripping witch slithered her way out of the cauldron. In front of their astonished eyes, she scuttled across the hall on all fours like a dog or a wolf, her iron fingernails clicking on the stone floor. Oh, it sent a shiver down the spine to see the way she moved, like a beetle or an evil thing, not like a human at all. She sat on the chair at the head of the table, she tipped her head to one side, waiting for questions. She got them. Madam, bellowed Stoic the Vast with a strong sense of injury, you owe us an explanation. What on earth are you doing popping out of cauldrons and frightening us at this late hour? The witch's voice sent chills down the spine, something between a hiss and a whisper with just that edge of evil to it that makes you sit up straight and check that your soul is still intact and that she hasn't sucked it out of you while you weren't watching. My name is Excelino, and I am the castle's witch. I do not like, said the witch, her voice as dry as ice, either to pop into or out of cauldrons. However, the castle was invaded by dragons of the most dreadful and dangerous kind. Flashburn and his warriors were defeated, and there were no survivors, apart from myself, for I had the foresight to creep inside this cooking pot and hide myself just in time. Hiccup looked around the room. No flame marks, no overturned chairs, no blood, no sign of a struggle of any sort. She lied. But why would the Vikings not believe her? They had just had the most terrible and bloody battle against rogue dragons themselves. What was more natural than that Flashburn and his warriors had been carried off by those very same dragons? Uproar in the banqueting hall. Cries of, Carried off by my trousers and we must avenge! But why? asked a bewildered Grimbod. What is this happening? What is going on? The witch's half-blind eyes gleamed. Someone has set free the dragon Furious from the prison of Berserk, and he is bringing a dragon rebellion that will kill us all, hissed the witch. Gasps of horror from the Viking tribes. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. So that was the dragon Furious who attacked us on the cliff, thought Hiccup. What you have seen in those dragons is the coming of the Red Rage, said the witch. And what? asked Stoic the Vast, not really wanting to know the answer to this question. What exactly is the Red Rage? The Red Rage is where the dragons mass together in a pack to hunt down their prey. No quarter is given, smiled the witch, Excelinor. The only aim is to hunt down every man, woman and child until they become extinct. Silence in the banqueting hall as the tribes tried to take this in. Doom! screamed the witch, her voice the spine-jingling scratch of nails on a blackboard. Doom has come to the archipelago! Nonsense, blustered Stoic. The dragons are just getting a bit frisky, that's all. Ask your son, whispered the witch, for he it was who set the dragon free! she said joyfully. Oh, brother.
there was a collective gasp of horror, and to Hiccup's utter, cringing, burning embarrassment, all the tribes of the archipelago turned round to stare down at him, tutting furiously and pointing their fingers and shaking their heads. That was all it took. Only a couple of hours earlier, Hiccup had been the hero who had saved all the young warriors at the Battle of Angry Mountain. Now, in an instant, that was all forgotten, and he was the idiot who had put them all in deadly peril by setting free the Dragon Furious. Hiccup turned absolutely flame-red, right to the tips of his ears, and wished he could disappear up the chimney. "'He spoke to the Dragon Furious,' hissed the witch. "'Ask Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third what the dragon said to him about the rebellion.' "'What did the dragon say, Hiccup?' Stoic turned to his son. "'Well, I've been trying to tell you that for ages, father,' Hiccup burst out, squirming uncomfortably. "'The dragon said that we had one year before he returned to wipe out the whole of the human race. "'But that was such a long time ago, and the year passed, and I sort of hoped that maybe he'd forgotten about it.' "'Another terrible silence. "'Stoic the Vast made a noise like an exploding kettle. "'Most fathers would agree with his frustration.' How could you possibly keep something like this from me? The extinction of the entire human race? You'd have thought that was important enough to mention in passing! I did mention it, but you were always too busy to listen, Hiccup pointed out miserably. Stoic controlled himself with a strong effort. What should we do, oh great prophetess? asked Mogadon the Meathead, speaking for all the tribes. How can we prevent this terrible thing from happening? The witch smiled, and what a nasty smile it was. You need a new king of the Wilder West. Uproar in the banqueting hall. Cries of, never, never again shall we have a king. The tribes of the archipelago were an independent lot who spent their whole time burgling and fighting each other. They did not want a king to boss them around and tell them what to do. They hadn't had a king of the Wilder West for many years, and they didn't want to start having one now. In fact, this kind of talk had got the witch into terrible trouble in the past. Ugg, the ugly thug, the king of the mainland, had only had to hear her talk of prophecies and a new king, and he had imprisoned her in a tree trunk for twenty years. But timing is everything. Now all the witch had to do was stick her finger in the air and hiss, Doomed! We're all doomed if we do not do this! And because of their recent mauling at the hands of the red rage dragons, Everyone fell magically silent. Only the king can save us now, and luckily, purred the witch, the last king of the Wild West, Grimbeard the Ghastly, left behind a certain prophecy, a prophecy that has been handed down from witch to witch for generation after generation. Tell us the prophecy, O oh great sorceress, cried the Vikings. The witch leant forward and she whispered these words as if she were telling them a wonderful secret. And in the quietness of that banqueting hall, the Vikings leant in to hear the witch speak as the fire crackled and the wind howled. The dragon time is coming, and only a king can save you now. The king shall be the champion of champions. You shall know the king by the king's lost things. A fang-free dragon, my second best sword, my Roman shield, an arrow from the land that does not exist, the heart's stone, the key that opens all locks, the ticking thing, the throne, the crown, and last and best of all the ten, the dragon jewel will save all men. Hiccup was finding it difficult to stand up straight. He felt a bit like some invisible net had risen up around him and was trying to choke him. The witch was a spider, spinning her story web through the room, weaving it in and out of the Viking's ears like smoke. And he was part of that story, a story that he felt up until then, like his boat, the hopeful puffin, had been turning round in random circles, but in fact might have a purpose, a pattern that he had not previously seen or understood. For Hiccup had Grimbeard's second sword hidden in his scabbard. Grimbeard's smashed ticking thing tucked into his waistcoat. 
a rectangular Roman shield with a dent squashed in it by dog's breath of Durbrain in his right hand, an arrow from America, the land that does not exist, sitting in his quiver, the key that opens all locks hanging from his belt, half a ruby heart stone in the bracelet round his arm, a toothless dragon flying above him. The king's lost things. Impossible, thought Hiccup. Impossible. I found all of these things by accident. I wasn't even looking for them. There are no accidents, said the witch grimly, as if Hiccup had spoken aloud. What is she up to, thought Hiccup, standing as still as a statue turned to stone by a gorgon. Why does she want me to be the king? Is that really Grimbeard's prophecy, or has she just made that all up? And if she already knows what the right things are, why doesn't she just steal them off me? Nobody was thinking of Hiccup, apart from Fishlegs and Kamikaze, who were staring at him with their mouths wide open. Hiccup shook his head at them to tell them not to say anything. Everybody else was far too busy thinking what a great king of the Wilder West they themselves would make to notice that there was one among them who already had most of the king's lost things. The throne is safe in Hooligan Harbour. The crown is hidden below Flashburn School. Nobody knows where the dragon jewel is. And why would they think that Hiccup's smashed-up, bashed-up possessions were equipment fit for a king? Of course they wouldn't. And how could they imagine that the new king of the Wilder West would be a skinny little thirteen-year-old whose fault this all was in the first place? Again, of course they couldn't. It was the last thing on their minds. But this is impossible, cried a grim bod. Arrows from a land that does not exist. Keys that open our locks. Heart stones. Ticking things, fairy tales and fiddlesticks? How are we to get hold of all these things in time before this red rage builds and this furious dragon attacks with even more power next time? And what can this king do to stop him anyway? Find the king, urged the witch. Find the king and the things will come. In three weeks' time you were to have a sword fighting competition in this school to mark your young warriors moving from childhood to adulthood. Throw this competition open to all. Find out who is the champion of champions. And then you shall find your king. Well, now the witch was talking the Viking's language. Anything involving cunning and brain power, impossible tasks and riddling talk about lands not existing, that was a little baffling to most of the Vikings. But a good old-fashioned sword-fighting competition... Why shine up my shield and sharpen up the good old blade there? Everyone fancied their chances in a sword-fighting competition. There was a babble of excited laughter and stamping feet. And when I said open to all, drawled the witch. The crowd was so focused on the witch telling her story that they had not noticed people creeping in at the door, dropping down from the windows, leaking into the room like rats. People with slit noses and not enough ears and teeth that had been filed into points some that barked like dogs or crept on all fours like their mistress. Outcasts, breathed Stoic the Vast, and every Viking in the room had drawn their sword already, as you do when you smell a rat. But we have turned our backs on these people, Mogadon the Meathead reminded Excelinor in his sternest voice. They are too villainous, too mean and vicious, even for us Vikings. Then maybe you have turned your backs on yourselves hissed the witch. Perhaps this calamity has come upon you because you have grown soft and forgotten what it means to be a Viking. Who knows? The gods will tell us by guiding who wins the competition. Eldest Elder, boomed Bertha of the Bog Burglars, addressing the oldest of the Vikings, a tiny, unbelievably wrinkled old Basham Oik. Surely the outcasts cannot join in this competition? They are common criminals. Watch your tongue, little Bertha, swiftly hissed the witch. They are my chosen people, and my son Alvin, whom they now recognise... A particularly nasty note came into her voice, and a few of the outcasts whimpered, once again as their chief, is a direct descendant of Grimbeard the Ghastly by his eldest son, Thughart the Treacherous. The eldest elder sighed. He had had a hard night fighting rogue dragons, and he was getting way too old for that sort of nonsense. I'm afraid that this is true. The outcasts are just as likely to be heirs as anyone else. 
So that was the witch's game. She wanted her son Alvin to be the king. Hiccup stole a look at a tall figure who had crept in with the other outcasts, a figure so shrouded in furs that you could not see who it was. But Hiccup knew. A protruding tip of a golden nose, the glimpse of an ivory leg, a sliver of a blade beneath the thick black fur. All of that told the story. Alvin the treacherous as I live and breathe. Slowly, Alvin pulled down his hood to reveal his wicked face. Bald as an egg, a smiling villain with too many teeth, he didn't seem to have lost anything this time. Alvin had been a little careless with his limbs over the years. Instead, he had gained a rather handsome wart right in the middle of his chin, caught from his mother, perhaps, for she was covered with the things, and since his wooden nose had caught fire in the blaze and berserk, he now had a nose made of gold. Good morning, Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third, purred Alvin the Treacherous pleasantly with a graceful wave of his hook. What a very great pleasure to see you again. Up the witch jumped onto the banqueting table, kicking aside the cups. And now for a pledge, my pretties, she crowed. A pledge by my once brown eyes. It's not that I don't trust you, of course, but we are Vikings after all. Your chieftains must pledge on behalf of their tribes that whoever wins the sword fight and becomes champion of champions will be the right true king of the Wilder West, and they will bow down to them as their king. The witch's voice was dark now. It would be a hard promise to make, for island tribesmen were proud of their freedom. It must be blood on the paper for this one. None of your spit and cross fingers nonsense. There was paper and ink on the table, which was surprising, because it was a banqueting hall, after all, and the witch made the eldest elder write out the pledge right then and there. The chieftains looked at each other in the candlelight. Don't do it, screamed Hiccup's thoughts, but what could he say? He was in a slightly awkward position, because it was him who had set free the Dragon Furious in the first place. One by one, they took the pledge. A swift cut of their swords on their fingers, and the pledge was signed. I pledge that whomsoever shall win the sword-fighting competition on the New Year's Day shall be right true King of the Wilder West, and I shall bow down to them as my king. Signed, Bertha, Madguts the Murderous, Stoic the Vast, Mogadon, Dangerous the Tenth of the Danger Brutes, Alvin the Treacherous, Excelinor the Witch, Underhand the Ugly Thug, Stand-in Chief, Grabbit of Grim, Boily of Basham, Deadly Dog Dillard, Chief of Glum, Percival Peaceable, Quentin Quitlife, Very, Very, Very Vicious the Vizzy Thug, Not Present, Berserks, Hysterics, Lava Louts. Remember, a promise is a promise if it is made in blood. Alvin the Treacherous was the last to sign. He stepped forward with his sword, the Storm Blade. The witch took the blade, cut both herself and Alvin's fingers, and pressed both their hands together to the paper. Oh, that was a solemn pledge indeed. A pledge made by eighteen chieftains on the top of a mountain in the dead of a winter's morning, with the wind howling all around. You can't break a pledge like that. And when the chieftains had made it, they gave the paper to the eldest elder. It's a shame that poor Flashburn can't be here, sighed Bertha sentimentally. He'd win the sword fighting competition and be the champion of champions so easily. Yes, isn't it a shame he isn't here, smiled the witch. And now, if nobody minds, I think I'll head off to bed. Flashburn gave me a small hut just behind the battle arena. If anyone wants their fortune read over the next couple of days, or some nutritional advice for the sword-fighting competition, well, that's where I'll be. And down she dropped on all fours and scuttled out of the room, her long white hair dragging in the dust behind her. An uncomfortable silence descended as she went. No one wanted to mention the on-all-fours thing, but it was a little eccentric, let's face it. And all heaved a sigh of relief as she left, as if something nasty had just left the room. As indeed it had. What are we waiting for? roared Mogadon the Meathead. This is a funeral after all. Let's get feasting, everyone! 
So that was how the banquet of the new warriors turned into Flashburn's funeral. No one knows how to celebrate a funeral like the Vikings of the archipelago. Even after being up all night having their horns blown off by rampaging dragons, those Vikings were still up for a party. In fact, the tension had given them an appetite. They set about demolishing that banquet and singing wild sea songs and dancing on their battle-sore feet without a care in the world. Hiccup watched them from by the fire, head in his hands, his mind racing about what all this meant. Why did he have these king's things? What was the witch's game? And when would the dragon furious attack again? The outcasts watched the Vikings too, prowling in the shadows. Alvin was by the door again, in his furs, tap, tap, tapping with that ivory leg. And watchful, ears down, slinking under the tables, flying at the windows, the hunting dragons and the riding dragons of the tribes of the archipelago watched the merriment as well. What side would they be on when the dragon furious attacked? Would they stay faithful to their masters or join in the rebellion? Only time would tell. Six. Trouble at the school. Ha ha ha! It was two weeks after their disastrous arrival at the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. There had been no sign of rogue dragons chanting the Red Rage or the Dragon Furious. The warriors to be, from tribes all across the archipelago, had gathered in the battle arena to watch Fishlegs' practice bout against Lard Tommy Lowwatt. The laughing young warriors to be were surrounding the fight, and they appeared to be finding it amusing. Watching Fishlegs fight was always the highlight of their day. Lard Tommy Lowwatt was not a good sword fighter. He was as round as he was high, and so stupid he had been known to attack his own arm. But Fishlegs had a severe disadvantage. Horror Cow was still sitting on top of Fishlegs' shoulders, her talons gripped into his hair. Her nervous collapse was such that even now that the danger had passed, she still refused to eat, sleep or come down, despite Hiccup tempting her with bits of cucumber and carrot. She just sat on Fishlegs' head, sad and blinking. Poor Horror Cow, her tail hanging limply. I'm so sorry, she mooed apologetically when Hiccup begged her to let go. I just can't. And if there was a loud noise, she clenched her claws, winding Fishlegs' hair around so painfully that he screamed like a hyena. As you can imagine, none of this improved Fishlegs' sword fighting. Take it from me, it is extremely difficult to sword fight effectively when you have a dragon attached to your head. It throws off your balance. Although opponents did find Fishlegs' sudden inexplicable girly screaming off-putting, Plus, Hiccup had thrown Fishlegs' best sword in the gorge, so Fishlegs was having to fight with his spear sword, which he affectionately called Mr Pointy. Fishlegs had no parents to give him expensive sword-fighting equipment. Fishlegs had found Mr Pointy on the scrap heap at the blacksmith's, so it wasn't really in battle-worthy condition, having a tendency to wobble a little and rattle in its hilt when struck. Fishlegs was quite a sight, therefore, stumbling round Lard Tommy Lowwatt, trying to defend himself with the wobbly Mr Pointy, while the dragon attached to his head squirmed and squealed in alarm and tried to get as far away as she could from the swords. There was a nasty moment when Horror Cow became so alarmed that she actually put her paws over his eyes so Fishlegs could not see Lard Tommy's lunges. Horror Cow, I can't see, yelled Fishlegs. I'm so sorry, mooed Horror Cow, but it's all so violent and aggressive. Can we not do something nice? And then, as if things couldn't get any worse, halfway through the fight, Mr Pointy's blade fell out, leaving poor Fishlegs with only the hilt in his hand. Ha 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 ha! Roared the crowd of watching warriors to be. A collapsible blade! Let's see whether we can take that dragon off your head for you, shall we? Sneered Snotloud, flexing his fist and punching it into his hand. Poor, traumatised horror cow gave a yowl. No violence! I'm a vegetarian! The crowds of warriors-to-be closed in on Fishlegs, and all might not have gone well with him if... Look out! yelled Hiccup from above, landing the windwalker right beside Fishlegs, sending Snotlout and Dog's Breath spinning into the dirt. Fishlegs scrambled onto the windwalker's back, and they took off. Yeah! Look! It's that Hiccup who released the dragon furious, coming to the rescue of his weird friend! shouted Snotlout. Weirdos! yelled one grimboard. Freaks! shouted very vicious the Vizithug. 
A minute later, the two boys were sitting with their friend Kamikaze on top of the second to the left tower, having a little breather from sword fighting practice. They were all wearing green sword fighting belts. Toothless was playing with Kamikaze's hunting dragon, Stormfly, and one eye, the saber-tooth driver dragon, an old friend of Hiccup's, was sitting beside them on the battlements. Thanks, said Fishlegs. I had that situation under control, but thanks anyway. Don't mention it, said Hiccup. They're going to kill us when they catch us, said Fishlegs. Well, I'm not exactly the most popular person round here at the minute, so I don't care, said Hiccup. It was true. Ever since it had been revealed that Hiccup freed the dragon furious, the warriors-to-be had stopped speaking to him. It was as if he was cursed. Hiccup noticed that even the adult warriors gave him a wide berth when he approached, getting as far away from him as was physically possible, as if he had some kind of dreadful catching disease. It was a little depressing. So, what with one thing and another, Hiccup and Fishlegs and Kamikaze were spending quite a lot of time keeping out of everyone's way up there on the second to the left tower. They had a great view of the fighting, leaning over the battlements, peacefully chatting. This is not good, said Fishlegs to Hiccup. Alvin seems to have got really, really good at sword fighting. They squinted down at the battle arena, where hundreds of the tribesmen were practising their sword fighting in battle bouts. Alvin the Treacherous was practising against Giant Grim. Giant Grim was a magnificent sword fighter, a flashmaster bronze belt and a contender to win the whole competition. But Alvin was doing surprisingly well against him, despite his ivory leg. When they first met him, a couple of years earlier, Alvin wasn't all that good at sword fighting. But he must have been practising hard, and he had really bulked up in the muscle department. One Eye, the saber-toothed driver dragon, opened his one eye. If the horrible human with the hook becomes king of anything, he said, I, for one, will be instantly joining the Dragon Rebellion. I don't know why you haven't joined it already, purred Stormfly, naughtily, being such a revolutionary and everything. I have a bad leg, said One Eye, with dignity. I could beat the lot of them, said Kamikaze, spiritedly making lunges with her sword against imaginary opponents. But I'm a bit concerned about my foot. Kamikaze had had the misfortune to put on her boot two days earlier, only to find a sea urchin had mysteriously found its way into the toe. She had managed to get the prickles out, but was still limping badly. It's that witch, said Fishlegs. I know it is. Sea urchins don't throw themselves out of the sea and put themselves into boots all on their own. The witch must have put it there. She wants Alvin to win this sword fighting contest and be the king of the Wilder West, and she's going to try and get rid of everyone who is a good sword fighter and might get in his way. It was true. Odd things had been happening to the good sword fighters all week. Remember, said Fishlegs, Haley Thickarm sprained her sword arm in an arm wrestling competition with an outcast. And my mother's lucky sword has disappeared, said Kamikaze. She doesn't fight half as well without a lucky sword. Mogadon the meathead had developed a stomach complaint that had him rolling around and itching. He's eating something that disagrees with him, the witch had explained. My pink medicine should make him better. But the pink medicine made him worse. It was all looking very suspicious. The three heroes squinted down at the battle arena. Watching all of these fights was the crooked figure of the brown-cloaked witch, sitting smoking a pipe in the doorway of her fortune-telling hut. The fortune-telling hut was a sinister little dwelling squatting behind the battle arena like an ugly fat gnome. The witch had set up shop there, It had a sign outside saying, Fortunes told, futures improved, written in wobbly capital letters. People had been visiting the hut all week to have their fortune told and to get a home-baked fortune cookie. Everyone who visited the hut came swaggering out, looking very pleased with themselves. Hiccup suspected the witch was telling them all that they were going to be the next king of the Wilder West. Oh, sighed Toothless, sniffing the air. Those cookies smell so yummy. Dragons have an extraordinary sense of smell, and he could smell the lovely aroma of fresh-baked cookies wafting up from that horrible little hut, even from all the way up at the top of the tower. The witch seemed to sense they were watching her, and maybe she wasn't so blind after all, for her head tipped upwards, and she looked straight at them. Instinctively, all three of them ducked behind the battlements, three pairs of eyes just peering over the edge. The witch cackled and removed her pipe. 
He's doing well, my Alvin, isn't he? She called up to them. He's got a good chance of being champion of champions, don't you think? Come and try my cookies sometime, duckies, and maybe I can improve your fortunes too. She jammed her pipe back in her mouth and went back to watching the fighting. This is not good, said Fishlegs. We can't let Alvin become the next king of the Wilder West. Who are we going to find who is good enough to be Alvin? Flashburn, cried Kamikaze excitedly. He's the perfect hero. Yes, but he's completely disappeared, Fishlegs reminded her. Again, I bet you it's that horrible witch. What could she possibly have done with Flashburn and all those red tiger warriors? Do you think, Fishlegs paused and swallowed hard, do you think the witch could have killed them? She looks nasty enough for anything, admitted Hiccup. He hoped it wasn't true, but what on earth could she have done with them otherwise? I think you should win the competition then, Hiccup, said Kamikaze. After all, you have got the king's things and Grimbeard's second best sword and everything. Hiccup sighed. I'm okay at sword fighting, but I'm way smaller than everyone else. And given that nobody's even talking to me right now, I don't think they're going to want me to be the king of the Wilder West. We just have to find someone else to win and be the king and then we can give them the things. I wonder what is so important about this sword anyway, Hiccup wondered. Why did old Wrinkly say the sword points the way? And why were those red rage dragons so keen to get hold of it? Hiccup's sword, the Endeavour, was rather dull and uninspiring to look at. But the sword had a secret. Hiccup had discovered this secret years ago when he first found the sword. You can read about this in How to Be a Pirate. If you twisted and twisted it, the knob at the end of the sword fell off to reveal a hidden compartment. There was a will inside, signed by Grimbeard the Ghastly himself, saying that this was his second best sword and he left it to his true heir. Hiccup unscrewed the secret compartment now and took out the piece of paper and reread it for the hundredth time. But it still gave no clue as to why it might be important to the Red Rage Dragons. Nothing about rebellions or kings of the Wilder West or anything helpful like that. Hiccup, what are you doing up there? You don't look like you're practising your sword fighting. Come down here at once. It was the loud, bellowing tones of Stoic the Vast, who had won his sword fight and had spotted his son up on the tower. Hiccup jumped, hastily stuffed the piece of paper into the pocket in his waistcoat, thrust his sword into his green sword fighting belt and leapt onto the windwalker's back again. The riding dragon swooped down, a mite sleepily, for it still hadn't recovered from its long winter hibernation. Hiccup landed beside a sweating Stoic the Vast. Yes, father? Now, Hiccup, said Stoic sternly, you really ought to be practising your sword fighting. You need to put up a good show in this competition, particularly because I think people may be blaming you a little for this whole freeing the Dragon Furious Red Rage business. Not me, of course. I understand that it was all a complete accident. Well, it wasn't a total accident, Father. I did mean to free him, admitted Hiccup honestly, but perhaps a little unwisely. In fact, I think we ought to consider freeing all the dragons before the Dragon Furious attacks again. Free all the dragons, repeated Stoic the Vast, dangerously quiet. What are you talking about? Well, father, continued Hiccup eagerly, if the dragons are already free, then there would be no need for a rebellion, so we can stop the war before it even starts. Stoic's head was going round and round. He wasn't the brightest barbarian in the business, and this was way too complicated for him. Silence! roared Stoic. Enough of this freeing nonsense. You've got us all in enough trouble as it is. And I don't want you hanging out with that fish eggs with a dragon on his head boy any more either. You're making us look ridiculous. It's not fish legs' fault he's got a dragon on his head. We're trying to get it down. It just won't come down. Stoic struggled to keep his temper. I understand, Hiccup, but people are already looking at you suspiciously. And if you wander around with a runty-looking boy with a large dragon attached to his head, people are going to start thinking that you're odd. And odd is not something that people like around here. We've been through this before, Father, said Hiccup. Fishlegs is my friend, and he stands by me, so I have to stand by him. That was before you brought shame on all this tribe by freeing the Dragon Furious! It came out harsher than Stoic had intended. Hiccup was quiet, shocked. You have to grow up, Hiccup, said Stoic, more calmly. You are my heir, and you need to put away childish things and show a little leadership. Practice your sword fighting, son. Enough talk about freeing dragons and whatnot. 
Just practice your sword fighting and get a good belt. That's all I ask. And Stoic stomped off. I think you should show off your sword fighting a little less, father, said Hiccup, dejectedly. The witch is getting rid of people who are any good. But Stoic had already left, and he wasn't in the mood to listen to this excellent advice. Seven. Fortunes told, futures improved. The next day, Giant Grim came down with the same mysterious stomach complaint as Mogadon the Meathead. Wasn't Giant Grim the one who was sword fighting Alvin the other day and doing quite well? said Fishlegs. And wasn't it him who visited the witch's fortune telling hut later on that day? That was indeed. Giant Grim. The witch has got him, hissed Fishlegs. And then two days after that, hard-bottomed Hi-Hat lost his lucky hat and refused to fight at all unless he found it again. The witch has got him, whispered Fishlegs. Young Aggie Ardick, Long Legs Lardy Guts, Rubella the Rude, all wonderful sword fighters, fell victim to the same weird problem that Kamikaze had. They put on their boots, only to find a sea urchin nestling in the toe and were limping around the castle as a result. The witch has got them, hissed Fishlegs. Have you ever heard of a whole herd of homing sea urchins nesting in shoes? Hiccup begged his father to pretend to be worse at sword fighting. Please, father, it's the witch. She's getting rid of anyone who is any good. I've seen her watching you in the battle arena. And for Thor's sake, whatever you do, don't visit her horrible fortune-telling hut. But Stoic would not listen. He was too proud. Nonsense, roared Stoic the Vast. I will visit whoever I like, Hiccup. I've spoken to several people who say the witch has already improved their futures, and I hear that her cookies are delicious. But when the next lot of brilliant sword fighters went down with weird illnesses and minor accidents involving sea urchins, even the stupidest of the Vikings began to get worried. Wouldn't you? The battle arena was awash with spotty, itching sword fighters, limping and clutching their tummies, and poor, superstitious people like hard-bottomed Hi-Hat, unable to fight at all, just roaming the castle looking for his lucky hat. The outcasts were the only tribe that seemed unaffected, practising quietly with each other on the edge of the arena. No longer were there the merry parties, the practising late into the night. Once again, the castle seemed the haunted place to which they first came. Let us leave this cursed spot, cried Mogad on the Meathead in the banqueting hall that evening. Too many bad things are happening, and it is too risky here anyway. What if the rebel dragons were to attack? They could wipe us all out in one go. The witch was sitting quietly, poking the fire. Oh, but you cannot leave, said the witch, her voice as sweet as poison. A promise is a promise, if it is made in blood. No, you must stay here a little while as you pledged and fight to be the champion of champions on the turning of the year. The Vikings turned to the eldest elder and anxiously he raked up his white hair until it stood all on end. He took out the piece of paper that the chiefs had all signed up to and checked it. Oh dear. A promise is a promise, admitted the eldest elder, reluctantly. <laughs> if it is made in blood. That was a quiet feast in the banqueting hall that night, with no one talking to his neighbour. No one walked about on their own. They went about in big groups with weapons drawn. No one ate a piece of food before their own dragons had tasted it. They checked very, very carefully inside their gloves and shoes, the torches stayed burning all through the night in the dormitories. Each tribe posted sentries that paced the room while the others slept to watch out for danger sneaking in at the doors and the windows. And then, only one day before the sword-fighting competition, all of Hiccup's worries came true. The witch got stoic the vast. Not with a nasty tummy ache or even a sea urchin in the shoe, no. It was far worse than that. Stoic the Vast disappeared entirely, just like Flashburn and his forty warriors. It happened like this. On New Year's Eve, Hiccup was awoken in the middle of the night. After three weeks of sword-fighting practice, morn, noon and night, Hiccup was so exhausted he had to be shaken awake, and when he opened his sleepy eyes, a very, very sick feeling came to his stomach. 
as he realised that standing all about his bed were seven of Stoic's most important warriors, flares in their hands, and they were arguing fiercely. This is ridiculous, fumed Baggy Bum the beer belly. This is a national emergency. You can't put this boy in charge. He isn't even a proper warrior yet. He's not ready. He may never be ready. Let's face it, nobody dare tell Stoic, but he's a bit of a little weirdo. Look at his arms. Like two pieces of spaghetti. I should be the temporary chief of Stoic's younger brother. Hiccup will become a full warrior tomorrow said Gobber the Belch, heavily, and we must give the boy a chance. By report, he fought bravely and cleverly on the angry face, leading them all to victory. Perhaps he will do the same for us. Look, roared Baggy Bum, sheer luck. We can't make this boy the chief because he was the one who set free the dragon furious. We all know that. None of the other warriors will even speak to him. The other tribes think he may be cursed. The shedding free of the Dragon Furious was an accident. I had plenty of accidents when I was thirteen, argued Gobber the Belch. Hiccup had no idea that Gobber would stand up for him in this way, and he was rather touched. None of this matters, said Nobber No Brains. Hiccup is the heir, so he's the stand-in chief. Back and forth the warriors argued, until at last they voted, four against three, that Hiccup should be the stand-in chief. But if it all goes horribly wrong, grumbled Baggy Bum the Beer Belly, and trust me, it will with this weirdo in charge. I will take over. Hiccup swallowed hard, white as paper. What is going on? Why do I have to be the stand-in chief? Where is my father? Is he ill? Is he wounded? Your father has gone missing, said Nobber No Brains. He went out earlier this evening. He said he had someone to visit, and he has never returned. You are the chief, for the moment. What are your orders? They were all looking at him. Beyond the circle of the seven men, all the hooligans were awake now, and looking at him. Snotmout gave Hiccup his meanest, most spiteful look, and whispered, Go on, cousin, cry. Blub for your father like the baby you are. A chief puts his own personal feelings aside for the good of the tribe. Stoic's words floated through Hiccup's brain. A chief must show no fear, no worry. A chief is a leader first, and a man second. Hiccup stood up and buckled on his green sword-fighting belt, trying to keep his hand steady. He looked Gobba the Belch straight in the eye. Hiccup's thoughts were shrieking. Where is he? He must have gone to visit that horrible witch, but what has she done with him? She couldn't have killed him, could she? But he kept his face calm. Search the castle ordered Hiccup. Gobber the Belch and the six other elders bowed, three of them furiously and reluctantly. The hooligans had the castle all in uproar searching for Stoic, going through every chamber in the school, waking everybody up. But they found no trace of Stoic. Search the witch hut too, ordered Hiccup. But Hiccup, protested Nobber No Brains, the witch is an elder and she's super scary. It's an insult. You can't search the hut of an elder. Search the hut repeated Hiccup, on the witch's door. I am so sorry, madam, bowed a deeply embarrassed Baggy Bum. We have come to search your hut. Orders of our temporary chieftain. Unconventional and a bit of an insult, purred the witch, her hooded snake eyes looking, if anything, a little amused. But of course, be my guest. She knew we were coming. Seven hooligan warriors squeezed into the little fortune-telling hut and searched it very thoroughly indeed. They found nothing, of course, and had to come out red-faced and apologise to the witch again in front of all the other tribes. I forgive you, smiled Excelnor, because your standing chief is so young and inexperienced. He does not know how rude he is being, but he will learn, she said grimly, turning her white, sightless head like a clockwork thing in the direction of Hiccup. Oh, yes. What a threat she could get in that soft voice. He will learn. You see? A scarlet baggy bum the beer belly spat savagely to Nobber No Brains as they stomped away from the hut through the whispering crowds. He's making us look ridiculous already. The hooligans carry on their search for the whole of the next day, but there was no sign of Stoic the Vast. Hiccup had a sleepless night that New Year's Eve, worrying about what might have happened to his father and he was still awake when the sun rose on New Year's Day. 
It was a glorious, cold winter's morning, with not a cloud in the sky or a breath of wind. Perfect weather for a sword-fighting competition. At breakfast time, Toothless and Stormfly paid their own secret visit to the witch's hut. Toothless and Stormfly would do anything for food. The delicious smell of the fortune cookies had been tempting them for weeks, so when Stormfly discovered a small hole in the back of the hut, she dared Toothless to squeeze through and steal some of the cookies. No, 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 said Toothless, looking at the hole. He was scared of the witch. Toothless, not hungry. His stomach gave a big rumble. The witch isn't in there, said Stormfly. I saw her go to the banqueting hall for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, you're quite sure, said Toothless. There's no witch in there. Quite sure. I'll keep a lookout in case she comes back, said Stormfly. Stormfly batted her eyelashes. Stormfly was a mood dragon. Mood dragons are chameleons, and now she turned a lovely pale violet as she cooed. You're such a brave, wonderful dragon, Toothless, and you're just the perfect size to fit through that hole. I'm too big. No, said Toothless, for once standing his ground. Stormfly looked through her lashes at him. Toothless is a scaredy cat, she sang. Toothless not a scaredy cat, howled Toothless. Yes, he is, sang Stormfly. Toothless hovered around the hole, suckling it furiously, gathered up all his courage and squeezed through it. One minute later, he shot out again, all in a tizzy, like he was being pursued by wolves, his mouth and talons full of fortune cookies. He dropped some at Stormfly's feet and flew off with the rest to find Hiccup. Hiccup and Fishlegs and Kamikaze were standing outside the banqueting hall, joining the queues to get in. Hiccup was hoping that the breakfast would wake him up, for he was feeling very rough after his sleepless night when Toothless landed on his shoulder. "'What are you eating, Toothless?' Hiccup scolded. I hope that's something edible and not a key or a bracelet or something. Toothless opened up his claw to show Hiccup the fortune cookies. Hiccup gave a gasp when he realised what they were and hurried round the corner so that no one else would see them. Where did you find these, Toothless? In each fortune cookie there was a piece of paper sticking out. Written on the pieces of paper were the words, You are the King of the Wilder West. Toothless gobbled up another one, paper and all, before Hiccup could stop him. Eventually, he spoke through a mouthful of cookie, spraying crumbs in all directions. He's in the witch's hat, said Toothless. Hiccup jumped. Who is? Your father, replied Toothless. How do you know? asked Hiccup. His uh, sword was on the table, explained Toothless, and there was a big uh, hat. Hard bottom high hat's hat, asked Hiccup. Toothless nodded. He gobbled up three more of the fortune cookies before Hiccup could tell him not to. I knew it, thought Hiccup. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Hiccup ran around the corner again and looked in the door of the banqueting hall. He could see the witch, shrouded in her brown cloak, eating at her place by the fire. He had at least five minutes, he reckoned, before she finished and got back to the hut. Where are you going? You're going to that witch's fortune-telling hut, aren't you? Hissed Fishlegs, running after him. You're crazy! She'll kill you if she finds you in there! Fishlegs whirled his arms around like windmills. At least go in there with somebody else, like a whole search party! I have to find my father, said Hiccup. I can't ask anyone else. They already think they've searched the hut. As soon as we know my father's in there, we can get reinforcements. The witch is in the banqueting hall. We'll just search it very, very quickly before she comes out. Mm -hmm said Toothless, red in the face. He had something very important to say, but he couldn't say it with his mouth full of three fortune cookies all at once. He tried to swallow them, but there were way too many of them. She's going to catch you! I know she is! cried Fishlegs. Oh, brother, this is awful! I know this is going to turn out like it always does with some dreadful surprise, or us up to our armpits in poisonous piffle worms, or brain pickers, or something! You don't have to come too, Hiccup pointed out. Of course I have to come too, moaned Fishlegs. I'm your sidekick, aren't I? And sometimes you need me, not often, but you do. And imagine if that was the one time I wasn't there, I'd feel awful! I think it's a brilliant idea, said Kamikaze, running along beside them. And you really need a burglar like me if you're going to thoroughly search that old hag's hut. It's got to be a professional job. Witches are excellent at hiding things, but they can't hide things from me. I have magic fingers and I'm the best hunter in the archipelago. <coughs> said Toothless, desperately munching at the fortune cookies and trying to flap in front of them to stop them. Kamikaze put on her black gloves while running along, not as fast as she normally did because she still had a pronounced limp. I will go through this hut with a fine tooth comb, I'm telling you. 
She took a comb from her pocket, raising her finger in the air. I will search it like a sniffer, crossed with a bloodhound, crossed with a wolf. I will leave no witch tooth unturned, no sock unsniffed, no cauldron uninvestigated. When I am done, I will know everything. That witch will have absolutely no secrets left. They stopped outside the hut. It was a very small hut, very small indeed, and it was spooky. I do not believe it, whispered Fishlegs. He had just noticed that between the wobbly sign saying Fortunes Told, Futures Improved and the sign in smaller letters below, Lost Property, there were letters carved over the door in a handwriting he recognised. Letters carved long ago by a man long dead, a dreadful old pirate with a wicked sense of humour. The letters read, Beware ye who enter here. Grimbeard the Ghastly, this must have been his hut. Oh, 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 oh as Horror Cow gripped her claws. This means that there will be some horrible surprise, some booby trap, some disaster. This means, said Hiccup, that we're getting warm. All three of them drew their swords. <coughs> Toothless was going crazy, mouth full of fortune cookies, unable to speak, but throwing himself in front of the door, trying to stop them from going in. Don't worry, Toothless, said Hiccup soothingly. We won't go in for long and Stormfly will keep a lookout for the witch, won't you, Stormfly? Stormfly, who had finished her cookies, was loitering by the door. She nodded. Of course I will, she said. I'll just pop in with you for a second to get some more of those cookies. They're absolutely delicious. <coughs> Toothless was turning cartwheels in the air. He was so hysterical to tell them something important. Hiccup took out the key that opens all locks. Oh, I can't look, moaned Fishlegs, putting his hands over his eyes. Hiccup opened the door. Eight. Oh, for Thor's sake, of course they shouldn't search that fortune-telling hut. Have you not read any of Hiccup's memoirs before? As soon as they opened the door, they regretted it. A crooked little room, so dark that they blinked and struggled to see, and it took a moment or two to peer into the blackness as they stumbled forward, Toothless protesting desperately and trying to pull Hiccup out again by grabbing the back of his waistcoat with his talons. And as their eyes adjusted to the very faint light of a dying fire and a couple of slug bulbs drowning pathetically in a bowl of water, in one ghastly moment the implications of the room burst upon them. Cobwebs everywhere a mess of bottles and potion and bits of meat, maps and scribblings and decaying paper on the walls with great complicated charts and family trees splattered with what looked like blood, things drying on washing lines that might be fingernails or bits of hair, a game of chess on a table with one leg propped up by books, a large dark cupboard in the corner of the room, a great cauldron on a dimly flickering fire. And in the centre of it all, in the centre of it all, a brown cloaked figure sitting in a chair as if it had been waiting for them. Oh, they turned as soon as they saw what was in that hut. They turned and tried to run, scrabbled for the door they had just come through on desperate legs with hearts beating quick and a dreadful sick feeling in their dropping stomachs. But to no avail. A great wind came from behind them as the door was slammed shut by unseen hands and it was too late. They were trapped. I thought you'd never arrive, Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third. I've been waiting for you for ages, drawled the brown cloaked figure, and it slowly pulled back its hood. It was the witch. <coughs> At last, Toothless managed to swallow the last mouthful of the fortune cookies, and he squealed, You see, you see, Toothless tried to tell you the witch is still in here. Must be somebody else in the banqueting hall. Toothless dived down Hiccup's shirt, whirling round his stomach and ending up somewhere in the hollow of Hiccup's back, trembling. The witch smiled. She spoke as if she understood Dragonese. Yes, one of my outcast friends is at this very moment sitting in the banqueting hall wearing one of my brown cloaks. You see, I have more than one. She was upright, but hunched over like she was used to a smaller space, turning a great sand glass over and over in terribly wrinkled hands. 
She was still so painfully white, so drained of colour that Hiccup could hardly bear to look at her. Bones were so visible under her skin that it was like staring straight at a skull, tapping fingernails tipped with iron. Tap, tap, tap on the sand glass. Tick, tock, tick, tock in Hiccup's pocket. A scary sight. The witch, etc. It's so nice to have you here all on your own, my children, cooed the wicked witch, without all those horrid, mushly grown-ups. Would you like a cookie? She pointed to a large basket of delicious-smelling cookies sitting on the table. No, she purred. Then what can I do to entertain you? Do you play chess? I may have to warn you that I am very, very good. Beside the chess game on the table, there was a high hat, stoic sword, a cigar case that Hiccup recognised as belonging to Ugg the Ugly Thug, and Flashburn's red necktie. But I am in the middle of a game. Or oh, perhaps, said the witch, her voice as sweet as poison, perhaps you have come to have your fortunes told and your futures improved. The three Vikings looked at her, mute with terror, like three little mice that had been cornered by a viper. Or maybe you have lost something. What have you done with my father, you horrible witch? asked Hiccup, getting straight to the point and gesturing to his father's sword. Well, now, my ducky darling father's a rather overrated, I fear, said the witch, but I love a guessing game. What do you think I have done with him? Your warriors searched the room earlier and found nothing. Did they look in the cupboard? asked Hiccup. There was a large, dark cupboard in the corner of the room. The cupboard is locked, replied the witch, and no one knows where the key is. And yet there was a key hanging round the witch's neck. It was careless of you to lose your father, but perhaps I can help you find him again. Let's play a game of hide-and-seek, and the prize shall be your father. If you find something for me, well then, perhaps I can find your father for you. If you fail to find the thing I want, well, the witch shrugged her shoulders, then your father shall remain unfound. A very, very nasty smile came over the witch's skeleton face. Forever! That's not a very nice game, said Kamikaze. I'm not a very nice person, said the witch. What do you want me to find? asked Hiccup. I want you to find me the lost crown of the Wilder West. What makes you think that I shall be able to find this crown if you haven't been able to find it yourself? asked Hiccup. Just a feeling, said the witch, looking at him with acute dislike. Look at you, you horrible little boy. You're absolutely festooned with the king's lost things. Without even trying, they're throwing themselves at you. The witch was hissing like a serpent now, and she pointed one by one to the things. You have six of the things already. The Roman shield, the ticking thing, the arrow from the land that does not exist, the key that opens all locks, the heart stone and the second best sword. You're just showing off, really, aren't you? I didn't mean to get these things, protested Hiccup. It was all an accident. There are no accidents, said the witch grimly. Why did people keep saying that? It's as if those things were looking for you, said the witch. As if you were some horrible hiccup-shaped magnet stealing my darling Alvin's destiny. Well... Now I am back. I can boodle that look right back again. You just see if I don't. You are going to give these six things to me, cooed the witch. I most certainly am not, declared Hiccup. Not now, but eventually you will, the witch assured him. Now you will find me the lost crown of the Wilder West. Bring me the crown and I will give you back your father. So where do we look for this crown, then? asked Hiccup. There was a cauldron in the middle of the room, hanging from a tripod over a fire. The witch bent down and moved the fire, burning in a brazier to reveal a trapdoor. She opened the trapdoor to reveal a well underneath. Oh, for Thor's sake, moaned Fishlegs. What did I tell you? We'll be up to our armpits in poisonous piffle worms before we know where we are. The witch giggled 
and it was like stones rattling in a tin. Down below this room is a dungeon. The only way in is down this well. And that, my dears, as far as I know, is the only way out. And what is in this dungeon? asked Hiccup. Well, it's either nothing dangerous at all, grinned the witch, or it's rip roarers, brain pickers, death and darkness. Somewhere down in that maze of tunnels is the fire pit, and somewhere in that fire pit is the lost crown of the Wilder West. And being Grimbeard, he has probably booby trapped the place in the most fiendish way, groaned Fishlegs. Oh, Hiccup, we really can't do this one. The witch looked at them, her head tilted to one side. So, do you choose to play my game or not? You have no sword, said Hiccup, slowly. There are three of us, and you are an old woman. I could just overpower you and open that cupboard with my key. You could, said the witch, playfully, but my fingernails are poisoned with the deadliest of poisons known to man. If I were to scratch you and one drop of this poison were to get into your blood, you would die a long and agonising death. So I wouldn't do that if I were you. The witch twirled her iron fingernails. When Hiccup looked closer, each iron-tipped nail had been dipped in a dark purple substance, a little like ink, and a lot like death itself. "'These nails,' said the witch, "'are as full of death as an apothecary's shop. I tried them on the rats, and the rats didn't like them, not one bit.' She gestured to the corner, where a line of rats were lying with their stiff little legs frozen in the air. Oh, the children shivered, yes they did, to see those little corpses all in a row. And it might be that your father is not inside that cupboard after all. I could be lying, sang the witch delightedly. Isn't this a great game? Wonderful, said Hiccup, politely. And how do I know that you are telling the truth about the crown being down that well? You don't, sang the witch. I could be lying about that too. I could just be trying to get you out of the way. That's the whole point of the game. Am I lying? Am I speaking the truth? Play a round of liar dice with me while you decide and we'll see how lucky you really are. In her bony hands, she took the dice, poured them in the shaker and rattled it three times. So, she cried, and then, let's see now, as she set the shaker on the table, lifted the lid a mere crack and peered inside greedily. Oh, four skulls in one bone, who'd have thought it? I'm a lucky, lucky woman. Will you take it, Hiccup the Third, or will you call my bluff? Liar dice is a game of luck and wit. If Hiccup took the hand, he would have to beat it with his next throw. Her face was a mask. Was it truth, or was it a lie? I'll take it, said Hiccup at last. A wise decision, nodded the witch. But now you have to beat my throw. She passed the shaker over. Hiccup opened the lid. She spoke the truth. This time, four skulls and one bone. Hiccup picked up the dice with the bone on it, threw it back into the shaker, and without looking to see where it landed, he passed the shaker back to the witch. Five skulls, said Hiccup, horrendous haddock the third. He got to his feet. The witch and the boy had been talking about more than a game of liar dice. I'll go and get this crown for you, said Hiccup, because I have no other option, for if I do not, you will kill both my father and myself. Correct, said the witch. Hiccup sighed. He checked the ticking thing. This means we only have three hours to find the crown and get back in time for the sword fighting competition. Correct, said the witch again. We'll miss you so much if you're late. And if I bring back the crown, you set me free, of course, said Hiccup casually. Of course, cooed the witch. Word of a treacherous. Huh, said Fishlegs. We've heard that one before. I need my friends to come with me, said Hiccup. Why, said the witch suspiciously because if I leave them here with you, you will kill them. Because I never do hero work without them, said Hiccup. Kamikaze here is a burglar of some distinction, and Fishlegs here is half man, half dragon. We call him Tracker Boy. Woof, yelped Fishlegs to back him up. As you wish, 
shrugged the witch. In your pot, my duckies. Good luck. So Hiccup and Fishlegs and Kamikaze climbed into the swinging cauldron, which was still a little hot from the fire, and clank, 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 the witch took hold of the tripod's handle and reeled them down into the bowels of the earth. Come on, Stormfly, called Kamikaze, just in time, for they had nearly forgotten the beautiful mood dragon, who had been quietly munching her way through the basket of fortune cookies while this conversation was going on. When she got to the end of the chain, the witch looked down the hole with a grunt of delight. Then she went down on all fours and crept back to the table and took off the lid of the shaker to see what Hiccup had thrown in the dice game. Five skulls, whispered the witch to herself angrily. He is a lucky, clever little rat. Thor rot him. Well, he'll need all the luck and the cleverness he can get down there, he will, she added with savage satisfaction. The game isn't over yet, not by a long way. And she hobbled back to her chess game. Nine. Going down. The three of them sat side by side on the cauldron, six hands on the chain in the middle. Within sixty seconds they had descended into total blackness, apart from the eye beams of Toothless and Horror Cow and Stormfly. After five minutes, they were still going down. Oh, 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 whispered Fishlegs as Horror Cow's talons tightened. I never thought I'd say this, but I even feel sorry for Alvin having her for a mother. Do you think that wicked old skeleton really has stoic trapped in her cupboard? I think so, Hiccup whispered back, but it's very difficult to tell because she's such a good liar. The one thing I'm sure she was telling the truth about was those poison fingernails. Hiccup shivered a little for he was so very frightened for Stoic. My father'll be all right. He'll be all right, Hiccup repeated to himself over and over again for comfort. This is so annoying, said Kamikaze. At this rate, we're going to be really late for the competition. Ha! Huh, spluttered Fishlegs. We're not going to be late for the competition, Kamikaze. We're going to miss it entirely. And you know why we're going to miss it? He said in his chattiest voice. We're going to miss it because we are going to be dead. You're right. Being dead is always annoying for morale was already low and sinking lower and lower the further they sank down the well. This was already a really long way down. How much further were they going to go? Hiccup looked up. The circle of dim firelight that was the wellhead was now no bigger than a pin. Fishleg's hands were sweaty on the iron chain. He tried to peer down into the blackness below. What do you know about brain pickers, Hiccup? Well whispered Hiccup. I know they feed on people's brains by sucking them out through their ears. Lovely, said Fishlegs, shakily. And I suppose you're right as rain after that little operation. Even Lord Tommy Lowwatt can't function without some sort of brain, Fishlegs, said Hiccup. Although they're quite small, brain pickers are one of the most feared dragons in the archipelago. Even sea dragonous Giganticus Maximus are scared of them because nobody likes the idea of having their brain sucked out. Fishlegs swallowed hard. And what other dragons are we likely to meet? Well, the cave dragons are a pretty nasty bunch down here, said Hiccup. Hopefully they'll all still be hibernating, but Grimbeard has found the most dangerous place on the planet to hide his crown. There's rip-roarers, horrible creatures that dribble and scream. They tear you limb from limb if they get you. And then there's breath-quenchers, a bit like gigantic pythons. And burrowing slitherfangs, of course, and sticky worms. They trap you in a web and cover you in slime before they eat you. But Hiccup wasn't able to finish the long list of particularly unpleasant and dangerous dragons that might inhabit the dungeons of the Flashburn School of Sword Fighting. Because the cauldron in the well at last reached its dungeon destination with a thump so violent that the cauldron tipped sideways and the three young Vikings spilled out onto the dungeon floor. Ten. Are you the stuff that heroes are made of, or are you a jellyfish in a skirt? They had landed in a large cave chamber with walls of ice, the air breathtakingly cold. It was lit up by glowworms and slug bulbs and the odd blinking light of an electric sticky. An electric sticky is a bit like an electric squirm, but it clings to cave walls with a sticky substance it secretes out of its bottom. Do not pick one up. They give you a terrible electric shock, plus they're not very hygienic. It was exceptionally beautiful. Somehow, Hiccup had not been expecting that. 
The ice gleamed blue and green and yellow, winking rainbows as the slug bulbs buzzed dozily across the cave like enormous round bumblebees of light. Gorgeous ice stalactites dripped from the ceiling in fantastically contorted shapes. There were numerous different tunnels leading away from the chamber, and a strange noise like a distant rumble. Or could it be roaring? How interesting, whispered Hiccup slowly. The tunnels are made of ice. They must be lava tubes, or perhaps they're the old tunnels of a giant burrowing slither fang. You always get interested at really frightening moments, moaned Fishlegs. What if that giant burrowing slither fang was still alive? Then it would be roughly ten million years old, said Hiccup. Look, the cave dragons are still hibernating. We just have to keep as quiet as we can and search for that fire pit the witch was talking about. I mean, something like a fire pit has got to be pretty obvious, don't you think? Where do we start? whispered Fishlegs. They spent the first hour going round in circles. The tunnels were icy, and they could race down them at quite a speed on their bone skates, shooting through tunnels that looped in and out of each other like a web spun by a spider that had gone crazy. They had one slightly alarming moment when they entered a cavern that was dripping with dragons of all shapes and sizes, over every rock and hanging from the ceiling in thick clusters like bats. But Hiccup was right. They were all still hibernating, and the three companions backed out of the chamber without being detected. However, an hour later, they were back where they started, at the cauldron and the well, with no sign of a fire pit. OK, whispered Hiccup. This is going to be harder than I thought. These tunnels go on forever. He checked the ticking thing. We only have two hours left. But Stormfly had shot ahead and spotted something. Look! She screeched, zooming back to them in a glorious golden swoop. She had spied something with her sharp yellow eyes. There seems to be a trail of some sort of chain at the edge of the corridor. Should we follow it instead of going randomly round in circles? Although that is fun. I saw that crowed Toothless. I saw, saw the chain too. You saw it first, Stormfly, he added hurriedly, because you're brilliant, but I saw that too. The chain looked like it was going somewhere, unlike themselves. It started right back at the cauldron tipped on its side and snaked as far as they could see along the corridor ahead. OK, said Hiccup, for want of anything better to do, everyone draw their swords and let's follow the chain. Hiccup picked up the chain as they went along, thinking that a piece of chain might come in handy, better than a rope, of course, because it wasn't flammable, and they followed it to see where it led, up tunnels and round bends. And then Stormfly dived round the corner, disappeared, and gave a muffled scream, only dwarfed by the scream Toothless gave as he flew round to save her. But by the time the other three got round the corner, in a right panicky hurry to rescue both dragons, the drama was over. Stormfly was sniffing. Ha! Huh, only a human and Toothless was squeaking, I knew that, and swooping nearer to investigate. A human? It was a human in a predicament. The human had skated right into the invisible web of a sticky worm, and he had become all tangled up in it, upside down. He was whispering something at them in a hissy, furious sort of way, but it was difficult to make out the words, because he was whispering upside down, and he was a long way down the corridor. But as they moved nearer, skating quite slowly because they were weary, they could hear what he was saying. And then, as they got nearer still, it was a continual tirade of abuse. Fools! Ignoramuses! Stupidissimos! Toothless flew ahead, turned upside down to check who it was, and flew back to them. It's Flashbone, said Toothless. Really? Yup, said Toothless. It's definitely him. Well, that improved their mood no end. Oh, goody! sang Kamikaze. It's the perfect hero! Hooray! breathed Fishlegs. Hiccup felt a great lifting of the heart. Their luck had turned. This was just what they needed. Flashburn was the kind of brilliant hero who could find the crown for them, and if they could only get him back up to the surface, he could beat Alvin in the sword-finding competition standing on his head. Flashburn didn't seem very pleased to see them, though. Numbskulls! One-celled jellyfish! Dodos with no brains! He whispered as loud as he could whisper. If you want us to help you, advised Hiccup, once they had reached the very cross hero and he carried on insulting them, perhaps you should be a little more polite. 
Some help your being, whispered the upside-down hero with a healthy sense of self-respect. These chains are my brilliant way of finding my way back. Only a genius like myself could think of such a thing, and you idiots have just picked them all up. Don't worry, said Kamikaze, gaily. Stormfly here has an incredible sense of direction. She can find our way back in about five minutes. And who are you, you blonde pipsqueak? Flashburn tried to draw his sword, but of course all he could do in that sticky web was wriggle around like a caterpillar. And what are you doing in my territory? I am not a blonde pipsqueak. I am a very famous burglar, and we are looking for the lost crown of the Wilder West, said Kamikaze, rather offended but still chatty. You should never tell Kamikaze a secret. She was the chattiest person in the whole archipelago. That horrible witch Exerinor sent us. I think it's supposed to be in some sort of fire pit. Have you seen it anywhere? Curse that double-crossing, triple-lying, forked-tongued witch, fumed Flashburn. Twenty years ago, that woman told my fortune before she disappeared off the face of the earth. I would be king of the Wilder West, she said. And of course, it seemed obvious, considering I'm the cleverest, bravest, most charming, patient, good-natured and most brilliant sword fighter in the archipelago. All I had to do was find this beastly crown and the thing was a done deal. So... The witch has had you looking for this crown for the last twenty years, gasped Hiccup. This was exceptionally bad news. Well, obviously not all the time, snapped Flashburn. What are you, some kind of gormless idiot? I have a school to run, but off and on, yes, I've been looking. And then she and her beastly son turn up in rags after twenty years of not a word, not a line, and I put a roof over their heads, and I gave her horrible son one-to-one sword-fighting lessons. Uh Ah, thought Hiccup. So that's how the witch became the castle witch and how Alvin got to be so good at sword fighting. And she got me to send away my 40 warriors on some ridiculous, trumped-up quest because she said they'd get in the way. And how does she repay me? She kidnaps me just before you arrive and tells me I have only three weeks to find the crown or she'll leave me down here forever. You're lucky, said Kamikaze. She only gave us three hours. She asked you to find the crown? You? The hero with a healthy sense of self-respect seemed to find this hilarious. A limping blonde pipsqueak, a freak boy with a dragon on his head and a skinny little weirdo. Oh, that's ridiculous. That is... I am the greatest hero the archipelago has ever known, spat Flashburn, which would have sounded more impressive if he hadn't been trapped upside down in a sticky warm web at the time. I am good looking. I am brilliant. I am brave. I am intelligent. I have searched every tunnel, every inch of every cave, and if I haven't found the crown or the fire pit after 20 years of looking, trust me, it isn't there to be found. Are you weird little freaks going to just stand there gawping, or are you going to cut me down? The hero with a healthy sense of self-respect really needed to work on his manners. This did rather explain why he had so many enemies across the archipelago. He's rude, isn't he? said Fishlegs. Very rude, said Kamikaze. And he hasn't found the crown, even after looking for twenty years, she sneered. He doesn't seem to be the perfect hero after all. Kamikaze shook her head, enormously disappointed. That's because it's impossible to find the crown, hissed Flashburn furiously. Hiccup here is always doing impossible things, said Kamikaze, unimpressed. And he's half your size. Shut up, shut up! Flashburn's upside-down face was so red, he looked like he might explode. Shut up and hurry up. Release my brilliance to an admiring world. What are you waiting for? That depends, said Hiccup slowly. Answer me a question first. If you were the king of the Wilder West, would you free all the dragons and ban slavery in all its forms? Well, you can imagine. Flashburn laughed like a drain at that one. Of course I wouldn't. What a ridiculous question. Who would do all our dirty work if we didn't have dragons and slaves? Hmm. Okay, decided Hiccup. Cut him down, but keep the chains round him. We can't risk this one making his way back to the sword fighting competition. So Kamikaze cut him out of the web, and when he was the right way up, he was an extremely cross man with a slightly sticky moustache. Untie me, you villains, he panted. I give you my hero's word, I will not run away. But they had all read Flashburn's book, Sword Fighting with Style, which recommends many ways of outwitting your opponent, one of them being lying your head off. We're not in a trusting mood, grinned Kamikaze, and your lucky hiccup set you free at all. I'd have been tempted to leave you here. So off they set again, 
skating down the bewildering maze of tunnels for hour after hour, with the hero skating behind them on a long chain attached to Kamikaze's wrist, complaining and whispering insults all the way. I told you, hissed Flashburn, I have mapped every inch of these wretched tunnels, every winding corner is imprinted in my brilliant brain, and trust me, there is no fire pit. Hang on a second. The hero cocked his head a trifle mid-sentence, as if listening for something. Click, click, click. And then, a very faint ripping noise. Oh, for Thor's sake. Rip, roarers. What could possibly have woken them up? Skate for your lives! Those creatures tear you apart! Shrieked Flashburn in a dreadful whispering bellow, eyes popping with terror. And Fishlegs put his head down on the ice and refused to move. Limbs splayed like a sprawling starfish. Fishlegs! whispered Hiccup, tugging on his arm. Come on, you can do it, Fishlegs, you can do it. We have to get out of here now. But Fishlegs was exhausted from trying to keep up with everyone else. He wasn't a great skater at the best of times, but with horror cow attached to his shoulders, it was impossible to balance, and he had fallen over so many times, he had had enough. No, said Fishlegs, and he laid his head on the ice. I should never have come. I'm just holding you up. You can go on if you want to. I'm just going to stay here and die. The runt is right. We should just leave him, hissed Flashburn, trying to skate but held up by Kamikaze's chain. It's like I said down at the bottom of the cliff. He's not the stuff that heroes are made of. He's just a jellyfish in a skirt. Do you not know what rip roarers do to you? I am a good-looking man and the world needs me. I must be saved. Some hero. Fish legs, you really are going to die if you stay here, hissed Hiccup. I don't care said Fishlegs, closing his eyes. I'm too tired. It's nice here. It's quiet. I'll just die here on this nice, comfy ice. It's all hopeless anyway. Scritch, 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 rip, rip. Hiccup could hear the clicking of nails on the ice getting closer and closer and closer as a pack of rip roarers came snuffling through the dark ice corridors towards them. Oh, for Thor's sake, it's never hopeless, Fishlegs, said Hiccup desperately. We can still make it. Trust me, we can do this. Rip Roarers Statistics Fear Factor Score 8 Attack Score 8 Speed Score 8 Size Score 7 Disobedience Score 8 Total Score 39 Rip Roarers are muscular cave dwellers that, like their cousin the raptor tongues, can squeeze themselves into very tiny spaces. A swarm of rip roarers tears its victims to pieces. 11. Rip roarers and electric stickies. In the desperation of the moment, an idea popped into Hiccup's mind. Why hadn't the witch taken away the king's things from him when she had the chance? Because she knew he was going to need them down here. He took the ticking thing out of his pocket. There were numerous arrows on the face of the ticking thing. One told the time, another predicted latitude, another always pointed north. And then there were various arrows that seemed to have no function at all, as far as Hiccup had been able to work out. And there it was. On one fat arrow that he had assumed was purely decorative, there was scratched a tiny little crown. A crown surrounded by tiny flames. Look, fish legs, the crown, panted Hiccup. Grimbeard's ticking thing can show us the way to the crown in the fire pit. Fish legs opened a weary eye. Horror cow relaxed her talons a second and mooed approvingly. Luck is on our side. Do you see, fish legs? A tiny, dim light of hope arose within fish legs, and he staggered to his feet. Somehow, Hiccup and Kamikaze supported him between them and they carried on skating, dragging Flashburn as the scruffle, scruffle of feet came closer and the panting grew louder. Down the tunnels they slid, a shambolic crew indeed. The rip roarers were gaining, gaining and beginning to howl as the four of them swerved round a corner. They entered a large cavern and they were just skating through it when Toothless's sharp eyes spotted something and he squeaked, Look! Over to the right of the cave floor was a neat rectangular hole cut into the floor by human hand, for nature could not cut those lines so straight. Down, ordered Hiccup, and one, two, three, down the hole jumped Fishlegs, Kamikaze, Flashburn, and then last of all, Hiccup, holding his rectangular shield above his head. 
Just as he leapt down the hole, he had a stomach-melting sight of the first four rip-roarers screaming round the corner, jaws agape, before he slipped through the gap and... Clang! The shield covered the hole completely. It was as if the hole had been cut for the shield. And maybe it had. Long, long ago. Hiccup hung from the straps, swinging. There was a three-foot drop to the floor. Let go! Kamikaze shouted up. No! shouted Hiccup. They'll follow us! Scritch! Scritch! They heard the spine-curling jangle of knife-sharp claws landing on the metal of the shield above. Clang! A great dent was punched into the shield as the full force of a rip-roarer body landed on it. And the middle section of the metal was inches away from Hiccup's face. Oh, for Thor's sake! Scruffle, 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 as paws and talons picked at the edge of the shield. Any second now, and they would get a good grip and lift the entire shield out of the hole, Hiccup and all. One talon got right through under the shield and heaved it upwards. Kamikaze! screamed Hiccup as he felt himself being pulled upwards. Grab an electric sticky and throw it at the shield! The shield lifted farther, and Hiccup was staring into the repellent face of the rip-roarer. The stuff of nightmares, black, frothing slobber foaming at the mouth, red-veined eyes quivering, its hot, indescribably stinking and repellent breath scalding Hiccup's cheeks. Arrgh! screamed Hiccup as the final heave took him up into the gap and the mouth opened for the bite. And in the very splinter of time, splat! With a gorgeously squelchy, squishing noise, the electric sticky landed on the shield, stuck there, quivering, and the entire shield became electrified. The rip-roarer gave a horrified scream and jumped back, as if bitten simultaneously by a hive full of hornets. The shield clanged back into place, hiccup swinging violently from the leather straps as splat, splat, Kamikaze threw two more of the electric stickies onto the shield. She was wearing her burglary gloves, so they didn't give her an electric shock. And, of course, Kamikaze was expert at throwing pretty much anything. As Hiccup dropped to the ground, she grinned from ear to ear for the first time since they had been in the dungeon. Genius! she crowed. Now you really are a genius, Hiccup. You see? We're going to do it. It's a sign from fate that we're going to make it. Don't count your chickens, panted Hiccup, thoroughly rattled from his close-up with the rip-roarer. Kamikaze hadn't looked into its mad staring eyes and seen how close they had been to being torn to pieces. And don't forget that if we want to see daylight again, we have to go back up there and face them. They'll wait for us. Trust me, they'll wait for us. But the blonde pipsqueak is right, panted Flashburn. This is extraordinary. Twenty years I've searched these tunnels and I've never seen that hole before. This is a part of the maze that I've never been down. That was toothless who saw that crowed Toothless. Yes, Toothless, you're very, very clever, said Hiccup. Look, he exclaimed, excitedly pointing to the other side of the cave. The broken ticking thing was going a little crazy. It gave 25 frantic ticks in a row, played the hooligan national anthem backwards, and then popped a spring and fell silent. Poor thing. There, in that dead darkness, there was a golden glow of flickering life. A bright circle in the cave floor, which, as they approached nearer, was a golden mine, a pit of flames that licked the black walls in glorious, leaping rivers of fire. I don't believe it, gasped Flashburn, eyes goggling with amazement. I do not believe it. Twenty years of my brilliance and bravery, searching every inch of this dungeon at terrible risk to my precious self. And you ridiculous freak children have found the fire pit. How can this be possible? This must be an accident. There are no accidents, advised Fishlegs kindly. That was a supernatural sight. Right in the heart of the mountain, in the centre of the icy maze of tunnels, was the fire pit. Earth, water, stone and fire, all four elements guarding the precious lost crown of the Wilder West. Just at that glorious, triumphant moment, echoing down the tunnels, a wicked whisper came. It was the same sound that Hiccup had heard earlier on the angry face of Angry Mountain. But it was louder now. The words were in Dragonese, hissed in a furious, bitter tone, truly terrifying in its savagery. But if it had been scary out in the open, how much scarier still was it in the darkness, echoing hollowly down the tunnels, enough to turn the spine to water it was, and send each hair shivering upwards to attention. 
Make red your claws with human blood. Obliterate the human filth. Torch the humans like a wood. The rebellion is coming. What is that? asked Flashburn the hero. It's nothing. Nothing at all. It's just trying to scare us, said Hiccup, frantically stroking horror cow's back. And it's succeeding, gasped Fishlegs. Ignore it, whispered Hiccup. It may sound close, but trust me, it's still miles away. It won't be able to get through the electrified shield. Hiccup took off his rucksack. All three of their fire suits had a few holes in them, what with one thing and another. Kamikaze, could you lend me a fire glove, said Hiccup. And has anyone got a foot piece that hasn't got holes in it? Between the three of them, they put together a reasonably complete fire suit, and Hiccup put it on turning as he wriggled the helmet and mask bit over his head so that the other two wouldn't see his forehead. Now, hang on a minute, you little freaks. Poor Flashburn was practically crying now. I'm the hero here, and I've been looking for this fire pit for 20 years. It's my impossible quest. Surely you can't let the skinny weirdo go instead of me. Wordlessly, Kamikaze wound one chain off Flashburn, tied one end around a large stalagmite, and dangled the other down into the fire pit. It'll do, said Kamikaze, checking Hiccup all over for holes. Hiccup took hold of the chain. Climbing into fire is always scary, even when you are wearing a fire suit. He took a deep breath and thought of his father. Nobody said being a hero was going to be easy. He climbed down into the pit of fire. There were a few holes in that fire suit after all. As he climbed down, Hiccup could feel the burning through the holes, as if he were being pressed by hot coins on his thigh, on his arm, on the back of his calf. Inside the pit, he walked through the flames to find himself standing in the middle of a circle of fire, in a cave that no human had visited for at least one hundred years. And there, in the middle of the cavern, lay the golden crown of the Wilder West. Sitting there, quiet as you please, minding its own business, with no idea that it had caused Flashburn so much trouble, as if it had been waiting for Hiccup all this time. The crown was dazzlingly beautiful, a perfect circle of shining gold. Hiccup reached out a shaking hand to take it, and he froze like he had been stung and just stopped himself from crying out, for curled up inside the crown itself, the same colour as the rock, was a small, brown dragon. Oh, that Grimbeard the Ghastly. Of course there had to be some trick, some trap. And now he came to think of it, of course there had to be a dragon. The fire was burning off a black substance. This could have been peat or coal, but something must have set that black substance on fire, and that something was, of course, a dragon. He didn't recognise the species, but he would have bet his whole life on the guess that it was something deadly poisonous. There was nothing for it, though. He would have to take the crown without waking the dragon. All of his burglary skills would come in handy. Shaking slightly, he drew his sword. Holding his breath, he carefully, carefully, slowly, slowly reached and touched the crown. The dragon lay still a stone. Hiccup took a very delicate hold of the crown and gently pulled. And pulled. The crown did not budge. But the dragon lifted its head and opened its eyes. Twelve. The Lost Kingdom of the Wilder West. He was a very ancient dragon indeed, dried up and brown like an old prune, barely able to open his eyes, wrinkles so deep and folded he was like a crumpled map. Hiccup had never seen such an old dragon. For a split second, Hiccup was convinced the dragon was going to kill him. He had brought back his head like dragons do, like a rattlesnake about to strike. And Hiccup tried to move his sword, but it was as if his arm were turned to stone, Dragon eye met boy eye, the golden cat's eye meeting Hiccup's blue, there in the middle of that circle of fire. Hiccup's head began to spin. 
he closed his eyes. Who are you? asked the dragon, but he already knew the answer. I am Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III, and I want to take this crown. Please, said Hiccup politely. Who are you? Well, Hiccup the Third, I am the Woden's Fang, and I am supposed to kill whoever tries to take this crown. His voice was a barely there hiss, the far away whisper of a skeleton leaf. Please don't, said Hiccup, still with his eyes closed. There was a long silence. Because humans and dragons cannot live together, said the dragon. You sound like the dragon furious, said Hiccup, opening his eyes. I don't believe that that is true. Once I believed as you did, said the dragon, very, very wearily. But I have changed my mind. Of course they can live together, said Hiccup fiercely. Some of my best friends are dragons. It's just that things have gone wrong somehow. The dragons have become enslaved when they ought to be free. But you have to believe that people and dragons can be better. You have to believe in a better world. And is this what you would do, Hiccup the Third, if you were the king of the Wildy West? You would free all the dragons? asked the ancient dragon. You would work to make sure that humans and dragons live together in peace. Hiccup did not want to be the king of the Wilder West. But sometimes we all have to grow up. Yes, said Hiccup. I promise. The dragon sighed again. The problem is, said the dragon, I am an old, old dragon, and you are not the first to make me that promise. And history has a way of repeating itself. Maybe it doesn't have to, said Hiccup. Hear my story, said the dragon, and perhaps you will change your mind. I'm in a bit of a hurry, said Hiccup. The wooden's fang looked at him with his hypnotic eyes. There was a distinct edge to his ancient voice. We have all the time in the world, said the wooden's fang. We have all the time in the world, repeated Hiccup. Hiccup sat down, cross-legged, laid his sword on his knees and listened to the story. Inside the circle of fire, in the icy heart of Angry Mountain. You see, said the wooden's fang, you are not the first human to have the name of Hiccup. You are not the first human to carry that sword. Oh dear, oh dear, Hiccup was getting that black beetles on his scalp feeling again. The first human who made me that promise was called Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the First. Five or six centuries ago, said the dragon, when I was young, it was a very dark age, and the dragons and humans were at war. The leader of the dragon army, a great sea dragon known as Merciless, had looked into the future and seen that he would be killed by a human by the name of Hiccup. He had learnt that a human of this name was living on an island in the archipelago, and I was sent on a mission to kill all humans on this one particular island. Unfortunately, I flew so low over the little island that I became caught in the branches of a tree. I hung there for days, terribly wounded in my chest, and tangling myself round and round like a fish on a line, growing weaker and weaker. I was rescued by a small boy, about nine years old. Ironically, he was the very same boy I had been sent there to kill. The boy called Hiccup the First. Hiccup the First climbed the tree where I was captured and untangled me. You have to realise that was an extraordinary act of bravery, for in those days dragons and humans were mortal enemies. I had never even seen a human up close before, just killed them from a distance. I could have incinerated the child with one single breath of flame, taken him out with one slash of my dying talons. But the boy freed me, and then he nursed me back to health with his clever human fingers. He sewed up the wound in my chest, put on herbs that healed it. Look, you can see the scar even now. Hiccup looked. There it was, 
a scar over his wrinkled brown heart, a faint line, the tiny jagged marks of sewing hundreds of years old, a boy sewing, uneven and crooked, a scar in the exact same place that Toothless had a scar, and the dragon Furious had a scar, three dragons, each with a scar above their heart, three boys, all called Hiccup. Once I was well again, I flew away back to the north, but I kept returning. I taught the boy our language, Dragonese. He, in turn, taught me to understand Norse. Hiccup was the first human to ride upon a dragon's back. My back. And the more I got to know this Hiccup, the more I saw something special in the human race that we dragons did not have. Love. Imagination. Creativity. Communication through language. Foresight. All these things the humans could teach us if we allowed them to survive. But the humans had not yet developed modern weapons of war, and the dragons were hunting them to extinction. I had a dream. A foolish dream. A hope that perhaps human beings and dragons could coexist in the world. So I resolved to save the humans from destruction. Now, there was a certain jewel that Merciless was guarding. The dragon jewel was the only thing that Merciless was afraid of, a jewel in the form of a piece of amber that had the power to destroy dragons utterly and forever. The jewel was hidden long ago inside the secret compartment of a sword. Hiccup gave a gasp. You are right, said the dragon. It was the very sword that you have right in front of you. The dragon sword. The sword was guarded by a terrible dragon in a fire pit, a far more terrible dragon than I am. Hiccup gasped again. You are right again, said the dragon. It was the very fire pit that we are sitting in right now. History, you see, has a way of repeating itself. Long ago, I stole the dragon sword from the fire pit. I gave it to Hiccup the first. I showed him the jewel hidden within. I gave this jewel, terrible as it was, into the hands of a human. Tell me, was I right to trust a human in this way? Or was I betraying my own kind? You see, the boy promised me. He promised me that he would not use this gift for evil. He promised that he would make sure that dragons and humans lived in harmony. I don't know whether you were right, whispered Hiccup, white as coral. I really don't know. What happened next? Well, when Merciless flew to assassinate Hiccup the first, the boy stood, barefoot and defenceless in rags, outside his grass-topped hut, and held up the jewel. The dragon was young, but he was as large as a flying mountain. His wing tips were so wide that they seemed to stretch to either horizon. There was such a fire within that dragon it could have turned the whole island into dust and ashes with one single exhalation. But the amber, so small that it could fit hidden within one man's fist, that one tiny jewel made the mighty carnivore hold his breath. It was the one thing he was afraid of. Hiccup the First made the mighty Merciless promise to call off the Red Rage. He ordered him to disband the dragon army and to live again a loner. You must never return to the archipelago, said Hiccup the First, or the fate that fortune foretold will overcome you. So that was the end of the Red Rage in those times. Merciless flew to the north and to the open sea, he lived so long a loner that perhaps, over the centuries, he forgot his youth as leader of a dragon army and became quite an ordinary killer. Rumour was that several hundred years later he was known only as the Green Death, one of the many monsters that terrorised the deep sea. Did you say something? I killed him, whispered Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third. He returned to the archipelago, and I killed the Green Death. See How to Train Your Dragon, the first volume of Hiccup's memoirs. 
the wooden fang gave a dry laugh. Yes, that's right. He was killed by a hiccup in the end, after all. Isn't fate artistic? Meanwhile, Hiccup the First decided to use the dragon jewel further. I will use the jewel, said the boy, for a very particular purpose. He began to train more dragons. He trained them to farm, to hunt, to herd sheep and deer. He taught others on the islands all around to do the same. And with dragon's help, they could manage the deer herds twice as well as they could before. And they grew twice as fat, twice as strong. It worked for the dragons, too. The boy did not treat the dragons as the dragons are treated now. They were equals. They sat around the fire as equal partners. They were fed first at the hunt. The boy asked their opinion before attacks and talked with them as naturally as if they were human beings. The boy set up a new kingdom, a kingdom of peace and equality, in which all were equal and where dragons and humans worked together for the common good. And that was nearly the end of the story. Nearly the end. You see, said Hiccup, the boy kept his promise. The wooden fang sighed. He kept his promise while he lived. But we forgot how short human life is. To us dragons, a human life is as short as a butterfly's. The boy never betrayed me in life, but he could not keep his promise beyond his death. Quietness in the fire pit. The boy's descendants were not as trustworthy as the boy was. They used the power I had given them over the dragons for evil. They enslaved the dragons. The humans got worse and worse until they ended in... Grimbeard the Ghastly, said Hiccup. Grimbeard the Ghastly, repeated the Wardensfang. And you know how that story ended. So when Grimbeard came to me at the end of his dreadful life... A great hairy ruin with a wild look in his eye to ask me to guard the crown of the Wilder West so that no human should ever have the power that he had again. Of course, I agreed. Why should I permit you to take the crown? Why should I make the same mistake twice? Hiccup did not answer. It was a good question. The boy and the dragon sat looking down at the crown. It was a big responsibility, that circle of gold. The boy was thinking, there have been two hiccups before me, both far greater human beings than I am, who have tried to civilise this godforsaken part of the world, and they have failed, as completely as if they had never lived. Why should I even try to do something that is doomed to failure right from the start? The dragon was thinking much the same. Hiccup looked at the perfectly ordinary sword sitting on his knees. After a while, Hiccup said, When I first found this sword by accident, I did not know its name was the dragon sword. So I took it to my grandfather, Old Wrinkly, and asked him to name it for me. Old Wrinkly named it Endeavour. He said that the name was important because to endeavour means trying to do something even when you know you might be beaten before you even start. The old dragon lifted his eyes up to the boy's face, and then he said something that I have never forgotten, though it seemed a little strange to me at the time. He said, History is a set of repeating circles like the tides. The wind does blow through the ruins of tomorrow, but it is more a question of two steps forward, one step back. Humans and dragons make the same mistakes again and again, but things do get better over time. Maybe... And now Hiccup was struggling to find the right grown-up words. Maybe forgotten heroes like the first two Hiccups have made the world just a little better than it would have been if they had never lived. The Woodens Fang finished the sentence. And perhaps your grandfather was right. Over time, over thousands and thousands of years, those little betters become a large and greater good. There was a long Long pause. So, if I let you take this crown, 
Will you promise that you will use it to make sure that humans and dragons live together in peace? Will you promise that you won't let the crown fall into the wrong hands? Asked the Wardensfang. The wrong hands were out there, waiting. The witch and Alvin and Flashburn. Hiccup tried not to think of all the things he was going to have to do in order to become the king. He was going to have to get them all out of here alive. He was going to have to vanquish the witch at the well. He was going to have to defeat everybody else in the sword-fighting competition. Then he would have to persuade everyone to free all the dragons, and he knew how well that was going to go down. It was the impossible task to end all impossible tasks. I promise to try my hardest, said Hiccup. In which case, said the dragon, maybe that's good enough for me. Take the crown and live. Thank you, said Hiccup, picking up the crown to put it in his waistcoat. As he picked up the crown, the walls of the fire pit seemed to explode with sound. A terrible scream from the same voice he had heard earlier, but now it was shrieking so loud that his eardrums reverberated and the very flames seemed to flicker with the noise. Hunt them, everybody. There's four of them in here. Human scum! He's got it. He's got it. After him all. The wretched little human boy has got the crown. Rip roarers, slither fangs, breath quenchers all. Hunt him down, creatures of this darkness. Hunt him down. For Thor's sake, thought Hiccup, his hands over his ears. That sounds just like the dragon furious. But how is that possible? He's far too large to get down that well. The wooden's fang was quite unaffected by the noise. Maybe he was too old to be scared. There is another entrance to the dungeons, explained the Warden's Fang, responding as if he could read Hiccup's mind. A great cave in the gorge of the Thunderbolt of Thor, a cave perfectly large enough to admit a sea dragon, even of the size of the Dragon Furious. Quickly, but very carefully, Hiccup picked up the ancient dragon. He was once fat, but now he was lighter than air, poor old thing, like a little bony leaf or a scratchy scarab beetle, all bones and skin. Hiccup put him in his waistcoat with the crown. OK, said Hiccup, we've got to get out of here. My, my, said the warden's fang, admiringly, blinking up at him like a little brown papoose. I'd forgotten the blind optimism of youth. What a very great pleasure to meet it again after so many years. No problemo, said Hiccup, reassuringly. We can do this. Easier said than done. 13. Get your skates on. Out of the fire pit, Hiccup climbed. He had never climbed so fast before. Kamikaze hauled him up the last bit. Fish legs put out a small fire that had started on his back. They were white and shaking, petrified by that appalling noise. Even in the horror of the moment, Toothless noticed the brown dragon in his place in Hiccup's waistcoat. Who's that in turn? The toothless's plights, he hissed furiously. Never mind that now. Get your skates on, yelled Hiccup. We need to get back up there before they start the sword fighting competition. Stormfly, lead the way. But you've woken up all the cave dragons, you freak ignoramuses, shrieked Flashburn, hopping from foot to foot in terrified fury, still whispering as if that would make any difference when there was the most horrific cacophony going on. There's a reason why I only ever search these caves in the winter. Listen to that noise. We're going to be annihilated. The noise was truly ear-splitting, like 400 furies screaming all at once. He's got it! He's got it! After him all! The wretched little human boy has got the crown! Rip roarers! Breath quenchers! Brain pickers! All! Hunt him down! Creatures of this darkness, hunt him down! Screamed the voice of the Red Rage in a ghastly echo that trembled down the tunnels and echoed back to itself. And the voice was answered by the most spine-chilling, blood-curdling howling of rip-roarers and breath-quenchers and Thor knows what else, as every dragon in the entire cave tunnel warren appeared to be waking up. We have no choice, said Hiccup grimly, and we'll be all right. Something will turn up. Draw your swords, everybody. Something will turn up, shrieked the enraged Flashburn. Something will turn up. What do you mean, something will turn up? Why are you listening to this bozo? Ow! This was as he was practically yanked off his feet by Kamikaze, who had already set off and was pulling on his chain. They skated like fury through the tunnels, through the darkness. 
There were no sign of any dragons yet. They must all have been on the other side of the electrified shield. Have you got the crown? panted Fishlegs. Yup, said Hiccup, pointing to his waistcoat. I don't believe it, gasped Flashburn, and the only word for how he felt at that moment is a word in Dragonese, and the word is boggle smashed. Twenty years of looking, twenty years, and the crown is found by a couple of weirdos and a limping pipsqueak. This limping pipsqueak is skating faster than you are, yelled Kamikaze. Keep up, why don't you? Back they skated to the tunnel where the electric sticky still clung, glowing to Hiccup's Roman shield. Above the shield were the most horrific noises of howling and scuffling and talons being sharpened. Push up the shield with your sword, Kamikaze, said Hiccup. What in Thor's name are you doing? panted Flashburn. They're up there. They're all up there. Do it, Kamikaze, said Hiccup. And then Hiccup gave a shriek of his own at the top of his voice in Dragonese. Ah! We're being attacked by brain pickers! There was a sudden uneasy silence from above the shield. Kamikaze poked the shield with her sword and it lifted up as easily as a trapdoor. A rip-roarer thrust its revolting head tentatively through the opening, weird taloned whiskers quivering. Hiccup pointed at fish legs, standing there with horror cow attached to his head. Ah! shrieked Hiccup. Brain pickers! Ah! shrieked the rip-roarer, abruptly disappearing. Brain pickers! Brain pickers! Brain pickers! Brain pickers! The tunnel above erupted with the sound of panicking dragons, screaming and running away. Everything, you see, is frightened of something, and brain pickers are one of the most feared dragons in the archipelago because nobody likes the idea of having their brain sucked out through their ears. A couple more dragons poked their heads through, took one look at fish legs, shrieked and disappeared again. Fish legs twigged what was going on, climbed up and thrust his entire head with horror cow attached through the trapdoor. There was a final stampede in the tunnel above, dragons screaming, trampling over each other, forked tails disappearing into the darkness. And then silence. They've gone, Fishlegs announced. They've gone? gasped a flabbergasted Flashburn. What do you mean, they've gone? Hiccup climbed up after Fishlegs, and Kamikaze tore the electric stickies from the shield with her gloved hands and handed the shield wordlessly to Hiccup, before scrambling up herself and giving Flashburn a couple of strong yanks on the chain. Are you coming, Flashy boy, or are you just going to stand there with your mouth open? demanded Kamikaze. We've got to be quick before those dragons realise it's a trick. They had to help him up because his arms were still tied. Through the tunnels those young Vikings fled. There was no sign of any dragons, and the dragon Furious' rage seemed to have quietened now that they were higher up the tunnel, Warren. They rounded the final corner. There was the cauldron, lying on one side. What are you going to do about the witch? panted Fishlegs as they came to a screeching halt beside it. I'll think of something, said Hiccup, and he and Fishlegs and Kamikaze all got into the cauldron. You mean, shrieked Flashburn, the witch is still up there? That's right, said Hiccup. All we have to do is defeat the witch, and then we're home free. Get in! But Flashburn refused. He had spent the last three weeks in the darkness eating little cave dragons raw, which is depressing for starters. Then he had resigned himself to death at the ghastly maw of a sticky worm, which would have been a yucky way to go, but at least there would have been a kind of glory to it, a hero dying in the course of his quest and all that sort of thing. But then these little weirdos had turned up. For Flashburn's entire life he had been the one making the clever remarks, showing off, leading from the front. Now... Here he was, sticky all over, wrapped in chains, looking perfectly ridiculous. Flashburn had never failed at anything before. Sure, the quest for the crown had been frustrating, but he had consoled himself with the thought that it was impossible. And again, there was a kind of glory to endlessly pursuing an impossible quest. But now, in less than two hours, the little weirdos had found the fire pit he had been seeking for twenty years, taken the crown, defeated the terrifying cave dragons he and his warriors had been avoiding all this time, and now they were proposing to face that horrible witch and her horrible fingernails. Even the truly odd-looking one with the dragon on his head seemed to be some kind of superhero with the power to terrify dragons just by looking at them. Flashburn's ego had fallen. The hero had lost his mojo, and when an ego the size of Flashburn starts falling, it has a long way to go. He lay down on the cave floor beside the cauldron. No, said Flashburn. I won't get in. Oh, come on, cajoled Kamikaze. Remember what you said at the cliff? Are you the stuff that heroes are made of? Or are you a jellyfish in a skirt? I'm a jellyfish, 
said Flashburn. I can't face that witch. You leave me here and go on up without me. Hiccup looked at Kamikaze and Fishlegs. I'll deal with this on my own, and you can come up after I've defeated the witch, said Hiccup. She'll only be strong enough to pull one of us up at a time anyway. Toothless will come with you, said Toothless, bristling with jealousy. Even though uh, someone else is in Toothless's place, because Toothless is Hiccup's dragon, Hiccup's very uh, special dragon. Hiccup needs Toothless to help him. Kamikaze and Fishlegs got out. We can't leave you here. Kamikaze explained to Flashburn, because you may be a jellyfish in a skirt, but you're our jellyfish, and that's the way things work with us. Kamikaze began to unwrap him from his chains. Pull me up, Hiccup shouted up the well. The face of the witch appeared far away, a tiny circle of light at the top. Throw up the crown first, the answer came echoing back. Do you think I'm stupid, Hiccup called back. A pause. Creak, squeal, creak, squeal, creak, squeal, creak, squeal, complained the chains on the well as the witch turned the handle quicker and quicker in her greed to get hold of the crown, whispering under her breath, He's got it, he's got it, the lucky little rat has got it. And up, 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 Hiccup rose to face the wicked witch of the Wilder West. Things are going well. Hiccup now has nine of the king's lost things. These are the things that Grimbeard the Ghastly scattered and hid across the archipelago so that only a hero of truly extraordinary ability could gather them together and become the next king of the Wilder West. Surely this means that Hiccup is that hero. Carry on, dear listener, and we shall see. 14. The Wicked Witch of the Wilder West Oh dear, she looks nasty, whispered the Woden's Fang as they came out of the darkness and into the light, and the cauldron hit the top of the well with a clunk. Give me the crown, hissed the witch, eyes agleam, fingers pointing warningly towards Hiccup like knives. She was a sight to make a man faint, she was, faint with fear on the spot. Toothless was so terrified that he forgot he was supposed to be being helpful. He tried to do his normal dive down the front of Hiccup's waistcoat, remembered at the last minute that it was currently occupied by the Woden's Fang, so lifted up Hiccup's helmet instead and crawled under there to hide. Give me my father first, said Hiccup, horrendous Haddock the Third. The witch smiled, and what a nasty smile it was. She twirled her fingernails, each pointed nail gleaming with death. Now, Hiccup, cooed the witch, you are an intelligent boy. You know that it isn't wise to trust the word of a treacherous. The clue is in the name, really. You will give me that crown and you will hand over the king's things or else I shall scratch you to death, grinned the witch, for it is better for you to be a living nothing than a dead hero. In which case, said Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third, walking towards the cupboard, I choose not to give you anything at all, for I am not afraid of you. You should be, shrieked the witch. You should be. The witch wrestled him for a second, hand to hand, so that Hiccup's palms were dyed purple with the poison, and then she scratched him as he walked, and the fingernails pierced the fire suit. Hiccup carried on walking. She pierced him again. Nothing. Hiccup carried on walking. Again and again she scratched him, raked him with those poisoned talons, scraping deep into his skin, dripping poison on his hands. But still he walked calmly towards the cupboard. This had never happened to the witch before. First she was bewildered, and then she became scared herself. Who are you? she asked querulously. Why are you not scared? she screeched, suddenly small and frightened. You know that these fingernails are poisoned with the most deadly poison known to man. Death is scary. How can you not be scared of death itself? Hiccup smiled. He looked the witch in the eyes. I am not scared because I know something that you do not know. The most deadly poison known to man is vorpent poison, and I am immune to the poison of the venomous vorpent. Ask your son to tell you the story. It was all his fault, really. The witch screamed as if someone had thrown a bucket of boiling water over her. 
One second she was this swooping, vengeful fury. The next she crumpled in on herself like a collapsing deck of cards. Hiccup carried on walking to the cupboard. He took out the key that opens all locks with trembling hands. Please, Thor, let him be in here. He must be in here. Hiccup opened the door with the key. There, in the cupboard, were the two heads of Stoic the Vast and Ugg the Ugly Thug. For one dreadful moment, Hiccup thought that that was all there was, for he had heard a horrible fairy tale once about a witch who kept heads in cupboards. But thankfully, the heads were attached to the rest of their bodies. Thank Thor and Freya and Woden and everyone else. Giddy with relief, Hiccup cut the ropes and gags that bound Stoic and Ugg, and they staggered out of the cupboard. Father, cried Hiccup, and Hiccup, cried Stoic, and it is difficult to know who was happier as they enveloped each other in a joyful embrace. Ugg staggered out of that cupboard like a deflated balloon. He had had a particularly dreadful time with the witch, who had kept on taking him out of the cupboard and beating him at chess before putting him back in again and saying she might kill him tomorrow. The experience had been a humbling one. The witch may have wanted to pay Ugg back for imprisoning her for twenty years in a tree trunk. Please see how to break a dragon's heart. Hop in, said Hiccup genially to the witch, pointing his sword endeavour at her and opening wide the cupboard door. Well, what could the witch do? Her venom had no bite any more. She was like a rattlesnake with no rattle, a puff adder with no puff, a hero with no mojo. Her scary fingernails drooped. Quick, quick, said Hiccup. The witch got in the cupboard. Hiccup reached out with the sword endeavour and cut the key from around her neck. He locked the door of the cupboard twice with both keys just to make sure. By the way, he shouted through the keyhole, you're very good at the wicked stuff, but you're terrible at chess. He walked to the chess table and moved a paw in one space. Checkmate, said Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third. Stoic and Ugg the Ugly Thug stared at him open-mouthed. We've got to get the others up now, said Hiccup briskly. Get that handle moving. Quick, quick! With the bulging muscles of Stoic the Vast and Ugg the Ugly Thug working the handle, well, that cauldron came up lickety-split, even with fish legs, kamikaze and flashburn sitting in it. Toothless's little snout came peeping out from under Hiccup's helmet. Has she gone? he said wearily. She's in the cupboard, replied Hiccup, carefully removing him from under the helmet, and Toothless puffed out his little chest and flew over to show off in front of Stormfly and shout insults through the keyhole. Stormfly wasn't concentrating. She was too busy wolfing down fortune cookies, and everyone else joined in, for they realised they had missed breakfast, and skating down ice tunnels being chased by rip-roarers and who knows what is hungry work. Hiccup listened down the well. All was eerily quiet down there, so quiet that if it were not for the fact that Hiccup's eardrums were still ringing from the sound, it could almost be that the whole Red Rage incident had all been just a nightmare. What had happened to the Dragon Furious? Had he turned back because the tunnels got too small for him? Would he make his way back to the gorge of the Thunderbolt of Thor and then return with a dreadful army, many times larger than the one that Hiccup had defeated at the clifftop? The smashed ticking thing had begun to tick again, a little erratically. Tick-tock, tick-tock. It reminded Hiccup that time was running out. Right, said Hiccup. Now we're going to have to hurry if we're going to be in time for the sword fighting competition but it was all too much for Flashburn, the hero, who had lost his mojo. Run for your lives! shouted Flashburn, and he shot out the door. Ugg the Ugly Thug hopped from foot to foot. He had a squashed cigar clamped between his teeth. The witch had drawn his venom too, and seeing one of the greatest heroes in the archipelago running from the room was enough to tip him over the edge. Without saying a thing, he followed Flashburn. Fifteen. Things go surprisingly well in the sword fighting competition. Outside in the battle arena, the competition could wait no longer. The eldest elder had already read out the competitors for the first heats and the rules. The winner of each sword fight would go on to fight another winner and so on until eventually there were only two competitors left. The aim of the sword fight was to disarm rather than maim or kill the opponent, although accidents do, of course, happen. The tribes were getting restless and began to sit down cross-legged and sing, Why are we waiting? 
The eldest elder was getting jumpy. They were already three minutes late, and although that witch seemed to have disappeared, thank Thor, she might pop out at any moment like a malevolent jack-in-a-box and start complaining. I'm afraid, said the eldest elder at last, we can wait no longer. We shall have to start the competition. It is a sad day for all of us, and I'm sorry for the hooligans, for they shall have neither their chief nor their stand-in chief to fight for them, but rules are rules, I'm afraid, and promises are promises. <sighs> oh, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, the sword-fighting competition to find the next king of the wilder west is about to begin. Bugler, sound the bugle. The bugler was just putting the bugle to his lips to signal the start of the competition when the door of the fortune-telling hut flew open and out ran a grimy, sticky flashburn, running at full tilt through the door, closely followed by Ugg the Ugly Thug, though not at quite the pace of the hero with a healthy sense of self-respect, because he had a belly as big as a battleship and a considerable cigar habit, but still at an impressive lick for one of his circumference. Why, bless my soul, could that be Flashburn and Ugg? cried the eldest elder in astonishment. What were you doing in there? And where have you... But neither the hero nor the ugly thug chieftain slowed their pace for one second. They just ran straight past the eldest elder, across the battle arena, past the eyes of a wandering eighteen tribes, and right towards the great entrance to the castle. Open the door! yelled Flashburn the hero, and the astonished sentries hurriedly opened the great doors, and out the hero ran, without stopping, followed by the mainland chieftain. The tribesmen watched them go, open-mouthed, running down the easy way of Angry Mountain as fast as they could run, and somersault, actually, because you can't run far down the easy way without it turning into a somersault. So that was the end of those two villains' ambitions, all their dreams roly-polying their way out of the competition, and out of the story entirely. The tribes had only just got over this surprise when, from out the very same hut, as if it were a magician's hat, hurried Stoic the Vast, Hiccup the Third, Kamikaze of the Bog Burglars, and that weird little boy with the face that looked like a haddock who still had a dragon attached to his head. The Windwalker pranced into the air and flew joyous circles around them, so relieved and delighted was he. Even gloomy old One-Eye managed a couple of happy bounces. My baby! roared big boobied Bertha, throwing wide her arms. Yes, mother, another time, said Kamikaze, impatiently turning to the eldest elder. What are we waiting for? We have to start this competition right now. Well, we have been waiting for you, said the eldest elder, a little flustered. What happened to you? And Stoic? And Flashburn? And what was Ugg doing in there? Kamikaze could be very commanding for one so small, and she could have delivered an entire lecture series on the subject of cheek. We'll explain later. Now we're in a hurry. Rules are rules. Promises are promises, after all. This competition was supposed to start at twelve o'clock sharp on the first day of the new year. She picked up Hiccup's smash ticking thing hanging from his pocket and checked it, tutting. You're, oh, eight minutes late, naughty you. Sound the bugle. Porp! The bugle finally sounded for the start of the sword-fighting competition to find the next king of the Wilder West. Good to see you, Stoic, bellowed Baggy Bum the beer belly, bashing his brother on the back in a relieved fashion, and he really meant it, for he loved his brother, despite all the arguing. But immediately after that touching moment, he turned to the eldest elder and said, But they're too late for the competition, aren't they, eldest elder? Younger brothers have not changed much, even since the Dark Ages. Luckily, the eldest elder was a good sport, and he had had a soft spot for Hiccup and Kamikaze and Fishlegs ever since he was chief judge in the swimming race a year or so ago. How to ride a dragon storm. You must read these memoirs, otherwise you're missing out. Good to see you, Stoic. We were worried about you there. <sighs> you four are just in time for the competition. Hiccup, you can fight Masher here. <sighs> Fish boy, you're against Doolally. <sighs> and Cammy what's it can take Helly thick on. <sighs> As for you, Stoic, well, <sighs> I'm giving you a toughie for your first match. <sighs> it's the Goggler twins for you, I'm afraid. Identical twins in the barbaric archipelago only counted as one person, so they had a massive advantage in sword-fighting competitions. 
It says a lot for Stoic that he hadn't let his own encounter with the witch depress him too much. I suppose he had only been trapped for a day or so, whereas Ugg the Ugly Thug and Flashburn had had much longer imprisonment. All Stoic had was a slight cramp in his sword-fighting arm, which he gave a hopeful stretch with right now, and a slight hole in his belly from when he'd missed a meal or two. And there was nothing Stoic loved more than a good fight. Stoic turned to his son and laid an arm on his shoulder. Son, he said proudly, thank you. And then, ah, breathed Stoic the Vast, his chest puffed out, slapping his great hands together. Bring on those gully goggler twins and watch me tear their horns off. Bullheart! Stoic gave a whistle through his usefully broken front teeth. Here, boy, here, let's show these gogglers what the hooligans are made of! With a happy snort, Bullhart launched himself from the topmost tower and swooped down to the battle arena. He didn't even have to land. Stoic just ran alongside him for a couple of paces as he swooped six feet above the ground, timed his moment, leaped into the saddle and... cried Stoic the Vast as the dragon soared upward. Stoic the Vast was back in the saddle again. Back in the saddle again! He's back in the saddle again! cheered the happy chorus of applauding hooligans watching their chieftain soar. Pop! went the bugle, and the competition was underway. Hiccup took off his waistcoat and settled the warden's fang in a good place at the edge of the battle arena so he'd get a good view, with the crown well hidden underneath him. Oh, look at the colours! blinked the warden's fang in wonder, looking dreamily up at the sky. I'd forgotten that the earth was this beautiful. Guard this dragon, Toothless, ordered Hiccup. He's very important. Not as important as Toothless, grumbled Toothless. Toothless, very important. Who is this dragon, anyway? Hiccup was still aching from the flight through the ice tunnels when the masher made his first charge. So he nearly lost his balance, and his duck was so awkward that it was nearly the end of the day for him right then and there. But the masher was over-eager. The sword whistled over Hiccup's head by a whisker and the masher slipped on a piece of sticky worm slime that Flashburn had dropped on the arena as he ran over it. The masher staggered and Hiccup had time to recover. Windwalker! called Hiccup. The windwalker swooped down and Hiccup climbed on top of him and they carried on the fight on Dragonback for a while which gave Hiccup the chance to catch his breath. The rules of the sword fighting competition stated that you could fight on Dragonback for five minutes only during the contest. It shouldn't have been an equal fight. The masher was half a head taller than Hiccup and twice the size. However, the masher's brain was barely in connection with his arms and he moved like a gorilla with a hangover. Hiccup danced around him, letting him spend all his strength flailing forwards, making wild, rushing, bull-like charges. Stand still, little red-haired boy! yelled the infuriated masher red in the face. Within five minutes, it was all over. Exhausted, the masher made an unwise thrust to the head, which, if it had connected, would have been the end of Hiccup. Hiccup neatly sidestepped and parried the thrust with a sharp flick of the wrist that sent the masher's sword spiralling out of the masher's hand and sailing through the air. The crowd gave a roar of delighted surprise and upset. Stoic's weird little son had beaten the masher. As the loser of the fight, the masher had to give his sword to Hiccup. Carefully, Hiccup placed the masher's sword beside his waistcoat and the wooden's fang. Hiccup surprised the crowd many more times that afternoon. He won sword fight after sword fight, against men twice his age and practically twice his height. By two o'clock that afternoon, there were six swords lying beside the wooden's fang on the edge of the battle arena. Six swords, all won by Hiccup. Sword fighting was the only thing Hiccup had ever been any good at, and this really was Hiccup's day. Have you ever had a moment where everything comes together? It happened for Hiccup that afternoon. He fought as if he were out of his skin, as if he were Flashburn himself, as if he were one of the heroes of old that he had read about in the Meathead Public Library. He had to win. He knew it. He had made the Woden's Fang a promise that the crown would not fall into the wrong hands. The future of the archipelago, even of the dragons themselves, depended upon it. Even if the Dragon Furious did not reappear, and Hiccup had a horrible feeling that he would, if anyone else won, they were never going to set free the dragons. And freeing the dragons was the only thing that was going to stop this dragon rebellion in its tracks. So Hiccup fought as he had never fought before. 
He was concentrating so hard that he did not even notice everyone around him falling out of the competition. Fishlegs, of course, was disqualified in the first round, heavily hampered by Horror Cow and Mr Pointy's blade falling out at vital moments, so he was still a green belt. But Snotlout did quite well, lasted till the fifth round, where he was beaten by a giant Vizzy Thug, who cheated, actually. But that meant Snotlout had to be satisfied with just a red belt, and he was very disappointed with that. Kamikaze made it to the quarter-finals, but finally her limp got the best of her, and she was beaten by an out-of-control Mad Guts the murderous. However, she was still pretty happy with her bronze belt, for it meant she was the youngest person ever to make Flashmaster. But Hiccup noticed none of this. His world had shrunk to the wooden boards of the fighting area, his opponent's sword arm, the flick and thrust of his opponent's sword. Nothing else existed. It was almost as if he had gone into a trance. He barely even noticed the shouting of the audience, the clash of swords, the thumping of feet on boards, the screech of watching dragons that filled the air for three long hours. He did notice, with anxiety, that way over on his left-hand side, Alvin the Treacherous seemed to be doing well. Alvin's one-on-one sword-fighting lessons with Flashburn had stood him in good stead. He had won fight after fight after fight. Both Hiccup and Alvin made it through to the semi-finals. Alvin's semi-final was a terrible hard-fought match in which Alvin nearly killed his opponent on three occasions. The booing and hissing of the crowd told Hiccup that Alvin must be winning. His heart sank. Alvin, as king of the Wilder West, would be the ruin of everything. But to Hiccup's joyful astonishment, there was a sudden astounded silence. And then the crowd around Alvin danced about and cheered wildly as Alvin was beaten in the dying seconds of the match. This is too good to be true, thought Hiccup exultantly. I can't believe this. Everything is going so well. And, oh, the witch would be cross if she wasn't in her cupboard and she saw Alvin losing. Hiccup did not notice who the opponent was who had beaten Alvin the treacherous, though. He was too busy fighting his own match and he did not notice that his own fight against Mad Guts the Murderous was now being watched by the entire crowd. He did not notice the hum of chatter. I always thought that boy was special, ever since he fought that fire dragon long ago. The Vikings chattered excitedly to each other. His concentration barely wavered when he disarmed the great murderess with one of Flashburn's favourite moves, a flash thrust with twist thingamy, and the crowd erupted into applause so wild that the towers around the arena seemed to shake with the noise. And the eldest elder declared solemnly, The match is won by... <sighs> Hiccup Perendus Haddock Third. Kamikaze shrieked, He's in the final! Ooh! <gasps> squealed the warden's fang. That's our guy, isn't it? That's Toothless's guy, said Toothless grumpily. Not our guy. Toothless is master. How many times does Toothless have to tell you? Hiccup not need another hunting dragon. He's already got one. Me. For Hiccup, it was like a dream. But beyond the most hopeful kind of dream that Hiccup could have dared have. The boys won! The boys won! shouted the Vikings. The eldest elder fastened the Flashmaster gold belt around his waist and up he was hoisted onto great shoulders, crowds cheering round him and reaching up to pat him on the back as he was carried to the final match. The final! The last round! Hiccup was in a daze of delight, almost drunk with excitement. But he came to earth with an abrupt jolt as the cheering crowd set him down in front of his last opponent. His father. 16. Things start to go wrong already. You see, that didn't last long. Only one chapter. Things had already started to go wrong, unbeknownst to Hiccup. He should not have locked that witch in the cupboard. Hiccup was young, you see, and prone to mistakes. When he was an older, more experienced hero, he would never have done that. He would have put the witch back in the cauldron instead, where she started, so that would have been poetic, and wound her down the well again and thrown the rope after her. If he had done that, then all would have been well, excuse the pun. Because even witches cannot get out of wells, for they have no wings. But the most amateur of witches can get out of a cupboard, even when they have no key and the cupboard is locked from the outside. I don't know how, but they can. So the witch made her way out of the cupboard, and she was hopping mad. 
Checkmate! She hissed. Checkmate! She screeched. Me? That wretched, creeping, lucky, burglaring, lying little accident. I'll learn him, she yelled. Which is grammar isn't all that good. I'll learn him, she screamed. And she picked the hiccup pawn from the chessboard that was the cause of all the trouble. And she threw it into the fire so it melted. And then she chucked the chessboard on the floor and she poured poison on it so it sizzled, all green and decaying and satisfying. A bit of a waste of time, really, but it was a relief to her feelings. Checkmate, she whispered, calmer now. I think not, hiccup horrendous haddock the third. The game is not over yet, for I have yet a hand to play. And then she dropped on all fours and scuttled out the open door, nobody taking any more notice of her than a beetle, for the battle was in full flow. So in fact, Hiccup was wrong. The witch had seen Alvin being beaten in battle by Stoic, and she scurried over like a great white crab, her long hair trailing on the boards behind her to offer her motherly sympathy and consolation. Loser! screeched the witch. Loser! Alvin jumped as if he had been bitten, looked down, and there she was. I beat Madgots on points, so I came third, he said defensively. You're never satisfied. That's pretty good, actually. And you, he said savagely, you were supposed to have got rid of Stoic and that revolting boy nemesis of mine. I never promised I could defeat the boy nemesis, did I? But you said I'll deal with him. You said I have a way with clever little boys. You said he'll regret the day he ever was born. What happened? He's standing there in the final, more born than ever. He's immune to vorpin poison, screamed the witch. Why didn't you tell me? I said to tell me everything. How can I do my work unless you tell me everything? Being immune to vorpin poison is a very important detail. I didn't know, replied Alban the Treacherous, gloomily wiping some blood off his hand with the back of his sleeve. But it doesn't surprise me. I've been trying to kill him for years, but he's so tricksy. See Hiccup's previous memoirs. How many times must I tell you? Third, screamed the witch, back on that one again. I've got news for you, loser boy. You don't get to be king of the Wilder West if you come third. A wicked thought came to her mid-rant. Actually, said the witch, smiling evilly. She closed her eyes and remembered something. The witch's eyesight had improved, you see, in the months since she'd left the tree prison, and she thought she had seen something in that hut that might prove a useful weapon. Actually, maybe you do. <laughs> What's out, Mr. Accident? The game isn't over yet. And she scuttled off to see someone. You see, things had taken a turn for the worse, all because Hiccup put a witch in a cupboard and knocked down a well. One little mistake is all that it takes. <laughs> 17. Still going wrong. Hiccup hadn't been the only one who had fought out of his skin. Stoic the Vast was once one of the finest sword fighters in the archipelago, feared from east to west for his extraordinary skill with the sword. He was a bit past it, of course, but now, being released from the witch's cupboard, had given Stoic a rush of blood to the head, and he fought as if he were young again. The old stag has still got it, eh, Gobba? yelled Stoic, with the joyous light of battle in his eye, swishing his sword exultantly as he swooped down on Bullhart to high-five the hand of his old battle companion after another incredible victory. Ha! <laughs> Stoic the unbeatable! Stoic the invincible! These up-and-coming young shrimps can't beat the experience of an old war walrus like me! So, red in the face, swelled up with pride at his victories. A close-run thing with that Alvin guy. What a cheat the fellow is! Stoic stood before Hiccup. When his very own son was set before him, Stoic's eyes had filled with tears. This was too much. He had dreamt of this moment, oh, so many times. Stoic bellowed out the hooligan hurrah, echoed by all the hooligans in the stadium. Reluctantly, the other tribes joined in. They had to admit it. It was the hooligan's moment. Back in the saddle again! He's back in the saddle again! King of the Wilder West. Stoic could not believe it. He, Stoic the Vast, was going to be King of the Wilder West. 
Hiccup stood there, quietly looking up at his father. He thought of one of old Wrinkly's sayings, Sometimes you have to stand up for what you believe in, even against those you love, and that can be harder than you think. He had never dreamed it would be this hard. Father, said Hiccup wistfully, if you are king, will you free the dragons? There was such a hubbub of noise going on that at first Stoic did not hear the question, so Hiccup had to repeat it. Stoic still had a half-smile on his face. Son, he said kindly, the dragons can never be freed. We need them to hunt for us, to carry us into battle. The rebellion must be put down strongly and firmly. The rogue dragons must be taught a lesson they can never forget. It is too dangerous to free the dragons. You will understand this when you're older. No, I won't, thought Hiccup. I am older, and I still don't understand. That wasn't all. Stoic didn't allow human slaves on Berk, but he didn't stand up to the ugly thugs or the murderous or those tribes that did practice slavery. He just stood by and let it happen, and nothing that Hiccup said was ever going to change that. Prepare for battle, screeched the eldest elder. Make your salute to Thor. Hiccup and Stoic held up their swords and pledged loyalty to the great god, and the battle began. Most Viking fathers and sons would have practised fighting each other on many previous occasions. But Stoic was the chief of his tribe and a busy man. He had never fought his son before. So he began the fight puffed up with pride at his son's achievement in getting this far, but absolutely certain that he, Stoic, was going to win. Why wouldn't he be certain? His son Hiccup was only thirteen years old. In fact, Hiccup had been born on the 29th of February of a leap year, so strictly speaking, he was still only three and a quarter. He had shot up in height recently, but he was still kind of on the stringy side. He wasn't particularly bloodthirsty or competitive. And why would he want to beat his own father, whom he loved and respected? Of course, Stoic thought he was going to win. It had never occurred to Stoic that the reason that Hiccup was standing in front of him in the first place was that quietly, patiently, methodically, his gangly, weird little son had become outstandingly good at sword fighting. Sword fighting was the only thing on the pirate training programme that Hiccup had ever been any good at. Hiccup was the kind of kid who practised, so for hours and hours he had practised, quietly watching others fight, taking tips from heroes like Humongous Hotshot and fighting against Kamikaze. He had read up about it. He knew Flashburn's sword fighting manual back to front and inside out. He was highly intelligent, so he could work out his opponent's weaknesses, and he didn't lose his head to temper or showing off. And those vital inches that he had shot up recently meant that he finally had the reach in his sword arm to fight and beat fully grown adults. Hiccup himself hadn't realised this until this very moment. Growing up happens so quick sometimes that it catches us by surprise. So five minutes into the fight, Stoic was very surprised indeed. To start off with, it was a pleased surprise. Stoic was a show-offy kind of fighter and he was in a wildly confident mood. He was fighting with the Stormblade too, for he had won that off Alvin, and the Stormblade put heart into all who wielded it. So he threw his most extravagant fancy lunges to the roaring approval of the crowd. And then it was a more puzzled surprise, as Hiccup parried every one of those lunges, and threw in a few of his own, one of which nearly got through Stoic's amazed guard. And then amazement turned to growing fury. Stoic was a warrior, one of the finest of his age, and a Viking gets angry when he is being matched in a fight. He forgot he fought his son. The blood rage descended. His face turned unrecognisable with the red frenzy of battle. All thought deserted him as, yelling like a thwarted bear, he laid great swinging blows of tremendous ferocity and power about him to the left and right, back and forth. There are many phases in a battle. Even though the stakes were high, this had started lightly almost like a play fight, for one of the fighters was certain he would triumph and the other was unwilling to believe that he could ever win. But now the battle was in earnest, like a fire that suddenly caught, blazed higher than the treetops and destroyed all before it. Accidents can happen when the blood rage descends. In that long-lost world where knives and swords were toys and playthings, accidents could happen. Friends can destroy friends. Relatives can hurt relatives in the furious heat of the temper-rash moment. The witch had slithered up behind fish legs. 
He turned and saw her standing not a few feet away, eyes alight with greedy malevolence. History repeats itself, hissed the witch. Father against son, son against father, just like it was before. The game is not over, I shall win in the end. Hiccup the third, I saw his death in the mice guts, and death it shall be, as sure as I'm excelling all, and excelling all is me. Of course, Stoic was not the dread lord that Grimbeard had ever been, and Stoic would never intentionally harm a hair on his son's head, but accidents can happen when the blood rage descends. Stoic raged around Hiccup like an almighty, unstoppable storm. Hiccup was the still point, moving only to deflect each blow, letting the storm rage around him and absorbing Stoic's energy like a cliff absorbs the sea. It took some time again for Stoic's puzzlement to turn to uneasiness, and uneasiness to give way to the beginnings of anxiety. He redoubled his efforts, shot forward with a hangman's pass, followed by the glancing flick, charging bull-like with the plunge for glory. All were met by the bright, clean blade of Hiccup's sword. Was it Stoic's imagination, or was his timing just a second or so slower, his reflexes very slightly dulled, his strength fading fast in the dying afternoon? A battle has many phases. Ten matches in a row is a lot, even for a great hero, especially one who has spent the last 24 hours folded up inside a cupboard. Stoic tried not to feel the creeping exhaustion, turning his sword arm numb and quivering. He tried to ignore the sweat in his eyes, the protest in his ageing legs as the old bones slammed down, jarring on the wooden platform, the magnificent belly that had perhaps taken on a few too many beers and boar's heads in its time to keep it in the peak of physical fitness, groaning with the bruising strain and fierceness of the fight. Stoic had always put a lot of effort into his fighting, and he was feeling it now, his shirt so drenched in sweat that it was as if he had bathed under water, his lungs bursting, gasping, heaving for breath, his shoulders scrunched and torn in pain. His son was barely out of breath, his face expressionless. A hero never surrenders, thought Stoic, fighting through the pain and... Oh! Stoic gasped as he pressed forward with another bruising, blustering attack and a rip of agony in his knee sent him staggering like a toppling tree. The old stag, you see, has old war wounds. Long, long ago, when Stoic was performing the quest to win Valhalla Rama's hand, he had injured his knee in a sword fight with a lava lout. You cannot fight time itself. Slay the minutes and the hours with your blade. Wipe the bleeding seconds on your shirt. Time cannot be fought. Stoic tried to lunge again, but his leg would not support him. He listed to the left like a ship with a broken mast. End it, Hiccup, end it, pleaded Stoic. Hiccup ended it. He stepped forward and quietly took the sword from his father's hand. There was absolute silence in the stadium. Apart from Lard Tommy Lowwatt, who was so stupid that he did not realise what was going on and was still singing, Back in the saddle again! He's back in the saddle again! All on his own, until someone dug him in the ribs and got him to stop. Most Vikings looked away. There was nothing more painful than watching an old lion lose a fight, particularly to his own son. Hiccup's face was pure, sickly white. I'm sorry, father, whispered Hiccup. I'm sorry. A few of the warriors hurried forward and swept him up to set him in front of the eldest elder. The winner of the sword fighting competition. Yeah. The champion of champions is. Yeah. Hiccup Parendus Haddock the Third. Yelled the eldest elder. There was still silence in the stadium. The crowd was finding this difficult to absorb. The rules had been followed. The gods had spoken, and this was who they had chosen to lead the tribes as king. This skinny thirteen-year-old was to head the crushing of the Dragon Rebellion. And wasn't it all his fault in the first place? What could possibly be going on? A grimbod yelled out the question that so many were thinking. There must be some mistake! He cannot be our new king! Angry mumblings and mutterings. The crowd were already beginning to draw their swords. 
None of the tribes really wanted a king anyway, but a weak king, a weak king was never going to hold them together. It was a perilous moment. But Kamikaze had climbed one of the broken columns so she could be heard. Sometimes it is helpful to have a very loud friend. Of course he's the king, shouted out Kamikaze. He has everything the king needs. Show them the crown, Hiccup. Hiccup thrust the storm blade through the loop of his belt and the endeavour into his scabbard, went over to where the Woden's Fang was sitting on his rucksack. Well done, whispered the Woden's Fang, drew out the crown of the Wilder West and held it up so they all could see it. Wow! That made them think. And he's got everything else too, bellowed Kamikaze. Look, the Roman shield, the key that opens all locks, the arrow from the land that does not exist, Grimbeard's second best sword. What else do you want? A big arrow hovering over his head saying, this is the heir to Grimbeard the ghastly. Woe and double woe. Added all together, they suddenly began to look pretty impressive. Maybe there was more to this kid than met the eye, and he was an awesome sword fighter, particularly for his age. You had to give respect to that. The eldest elder addressed the crowd. A promise is a promise, if it is made in blood, he reminded them. Your chieftains made their pledge that you would take the winner of the sword fighting competition as your king, and now you must hear him speak. Hiccup cleared his throat. And now, for the hard part. Eighteen. Freeing the dragons. This was one of the most important speeches of his life. He knew it. Friends and fellow Vikings, said Hiccup. I know that I am probably not quite the king that you expected, but destiny has decreed that I should become your king in troubled times, facing a dragon rebellion. If we allow ourselves to be drawn into a war with the dragons, disaster will follow. Do we want this war? I say no. The Vikings murmured to each other. They did not really want an all-out war with the dragons. Why would they? They had grown up with dragons. Their dragons slept at their firesides. They hunted fish for them. They fought by their sides in battle. I do not want a war with the dragons. In fact, I will do everything in my power to prevent it. I speak Dragonese. I will go to the Dragon Furious myself, alone, and speak to him to stop this rebellion. War is not necessary. Dragons and humans can live together. I know it. But in order for us to stop this war... We have to change some things about the way we live, continued Hiccup. He took a deep breath. The dragons need to be freed. Uproar in the castle. Cries of, that's just ridiculous, and we depend on dragons for our livelihoods. Hiccup shouted above the hubbub. But if the war goes ahead, we will have no livelihoods left. We may not even have our lives. The tribes quieted again although there were still furious mutterings and whisperings. Think carefully, pleaded Hiccup. We are proud, independent island peoples. Would we want to be chained and enslaved, forced to bow down to others as our masters? Slavery should be banned in all its forms, for both dragons and humans. The Vikings were silent. We do not have to depend on slave and dragon labour. We are Vikings. We can stand on our own two feet. We don't have to stand by and let history just happen to us. We can take charge of our own fortune. We can improve our own futures and stop this war before it starts. Free the dragons! All around the battle arena, the hunting dragons were still as statues. Ears back, cat's eyes watchful. Those that understood Norse were whispering in dragonese to those that did not. One eye... The revolutionary saber-toothed driver dragon looked cynically down from the second to the left tower. Ha! Nice try, Hiccup, my boy, but trust me, humans are incapable of change. There were pigs with whips in the past, and there'll be pigs with whips forever. All around the edges of the castle, the outcasts were prowling like a pack of hungry wolves, ready to prove that one eye the saber-tooth was right. 
but maybe one eye was wrong. For some reason, Hiccup's speech was striking a chord with the exhausted, battle-weary Vikings. Maybe it was the long months of poor harvests and food. Maybe they were impressed by Hiccup seeming to have the will of the gods behind him. Maybe it was the thought of more fighting, and they hadn't got the heart for it. Or maybe, just maybe, they saw that he had a point. Who knows? A miracle happened that day on the mountain top. A small miracle, perhaps just the beginning of one. Slowly, around the arena, people began to clap. Kamikaze and fish legs began the applause, closely followed by the whole of the bog burglar and meathead tribes, for Hiccup had done them favours in the past, and then the hooligans, for he was one of them, and the nicer tribes such as the Grimbods and the Bashamoiks and the Glums, and suddenly you realise that the nicer tribes outweighed the not-so-nice. Not the outcasts, of course. They didn't clap. Nor the Visithugs or the murderous. They still stood with folded arms, sullen, silent, although, wonder of wonders, little oily Gumboil got carried away with the moment and put his black-gloved hands together, his mother was a wanderer, until Mad Guts the murderous brought him to his senses with a cuff around the ear. Well, shiver my wings and bless my one good eye, wondered one eye, the old saber-tooth. What a wonder to be wrong. Two hundred years I've served these humans, two hundred years, and I never thought they'd surprise me. Close by, Stoic lifted his drooping head. I knew it, whispered Kamikaze, eyes shining. He is the king after all. I knew it. The End Nineteen, turning their backs. It would have been good if this was the end. But unfortunately, this is a hiccup story. And if I have said it once, I have said it a hundred times. This is the story of becoming a hero the hard way. We've become so caught up in listening to Hiccup's speech that we've forgotten about the witch. All the while that Hiccup was talking and the Vikings were listening, the witch had been busy, scuttling and slaloming through the hairy legs of the watching crowd like a bony white dog, searching, searching, looking for someone. And she found him. Whisper, whisper, whisper in Snotlout's ear. It's all about timing, you see. That's what the witch had learnt from her twenty years in the tree trunk, and on this occasion her timing was impeccable. Just at that moment, when it was all in the balance, when it looked like, against all odds, that everything might just go right in the end after all, someone threw a stone. Snotlout threw the stone, and Snotlout was an exceptionally good shot. The stone connected with Hiccup's helmet with a bright, clear ring and it fell to the ground. Hiccup gave an appalled gasp and tried to put his hand to his forehead. Too late. The eldest elder's quick old eyes saw something there, and his knobbly old arm reached out, and slowly, sternly, he brought down Hiccup's hand to reveal the slave mark. You see, that was what the witch had seen earlier, in the hut. Hiccup had done a wonderful job of keeping the slave mark secret over the years, to find out how Hiccup got the slave mark, read How to Ride a Dragon's Storm. But when Toothless crept under Hiccup's helmet, in that moment that he lifted it up from Hiccup's forehead before letting it fall again, the witch had seen the mark that was hiding underneath. The slave mark was the ultimate mark of shame in the archipelago. It meant instant banishment from your tribe and a life lived forever in slavery. The crowd let out a cry of horror. The boy is a slave, yelled a murderess. No wonder he wanted us to free the dragons and the human slaves as well. He's a slave himself. We have been tricked, called out a busy thug. Roars of indignation and shaken fists. Silence, 
cried the eldest elder, his white beard all a-quiver, and he turned to Stoic, aghast. How is it that your son is the slave, Mark? Surely you're not trying to foist upon us a leader who is a slave? Stoic was barely able to take this in. But, but, this isn't possible. Hiccup, how could this be? This is some mistake, surely. Hiccup had put his hand up to his forehead again, almost as if he was hoping that the mark wasn't really there. I was given the mark by the wanderers long ago on the slave ship when I went to America, explained Hiccup. He brought his hand down again. It was an accident, but there is no shame in this, father. He had lost the goodwill of the crowd, however. It was all a question of timing. In that time, in that place, a person with a slave mark could never be a chief, let alone a king. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, sighed the eldest elder. This was all very confusing. Hiccup cannot be the king, ruled the eldest elder. He is disqualified because he has the slave mark. <sighs> you then shall be the next king of the Wilder West, Stoic, for you were the runner-up in the sword-fighting competition. Stoic should be banished too, came a hissing voice, and the witch Excelinor rose, almost as if she were floating onto the platform. She held up her iron-tipped fingernails. These are surgeon's fingers, hissed the witch. What do we do when we make a cancer, a tumour or a canker in our bodies? She screamed. We rip it out. We tear it from our flesh so that the rest of the body may have a chance to live. So it is, sneered the witch, and she snuffled a little like a dog. So it is with runts. What is the motto of the hooligan? tribe, Stoic. Only the strong can belong, said Stoic, who had turned very white. None of you idiots know your history, do you? purred the witch. Hiccup is the name given to runts in the horrendous Haddock family, isn't it, Stoic? Your son, the witch spat out the words as if they were an exceptionally nasty taste in her mouth. Your nasty, puny, Odd little son was pronounced a runt by the naming dame, wasn't he, Stoic? You should have set him out to sea, according to the law, shouldn't you? But you did not deny it if you can, Stoic the vast. Stoic could not. Thirteen years before, the naming dame had indeed pronounced Hiccup a runt. It was a private ceremony, so only he and Valhalarama knew this secret, but he and Valhalarama had wanted a child so very, very badly. They had argued to themselves that the naming day must have been wrong. They kept their baby, and in doing so, they broke one of the most sacred laws of the archipelago. The hooligans had watched Hiccup growing up, watched and wondered why he was so skinny and ordinary-looking, but never had they suspected that their own most respected chief could have broken the law in this way. Many among them had painfully said goodbye to their own infants, suppressed their personal feelings for the good of the tribe. Was it possible that Stoic, their great leader, had not done the same? And all around the amphitheatre, the sky seemed to darken. The dragons were skulking now, still as statues. They sensed that something bad was about to happen. The witch gave a shrieking cackle like a swooping bird of prey. She had won. She had won. She knew she had won. You see, she triumphed, the gods have marked him out despite his father's treachery and weakness. The gods have marked him out by giving him the slave mark. Turn your back, so ye tribes of the archipelago, screamed the witch. Turn your backs on this wickedly weak chieftain and his spawn of oddity. Turn your backs forever, and all may yet be well. You see how close the line is between triumph and disaster. The tribes had no choice, really. One by one, they turned their backs on Stoic and his son, some slower than others, but they all turned, even Baggy Bum the Beer Belly and Bertha of the Bog Bugglers, and last of all, Stoic's warrior companion, who had fought a hundred battles by his side, Gobber the Belch. He had tears in his eyes and a heart as heavy as a stone. 
but he turned nonetheless. Even Kamikaze, though she did not turn, stood frozen as a statue, paralysed with horror at her idle hiccup, shattered. The slave mark. How could he have the slave mark? He wasn't the perfect hero either, any more than Flashburn. Only one person spoke up. That person was Fishlegs. Horror cow, whispered Fishlegs, very dignified in his dragon's ear. We're safe now. Please release me. I don't want people to laugh. The vegetarian dragon swallowed hard. She was still frightened, but for the first time in three weeks she untangled her talons from Fishlegs' shoulders, crept down to his feet, and let him go. Fishlegs got to his feet on trembling legs. I do not turn, he said, though his voice was shaking. I do not turn. And who are you? scoffed the witch. You're just a runt like the hiccup himself. I may be a runt, said Fishlegs, but I am a runt saved by fate and the gods, so I have my say nonetheless. And hiccup is still my king, slave mark or no slave mark. Fishlegs walked towards Hiccup. Fishlegs reached around his neck and took from it his most prized possession. It was the lobster claw necklace that had been found beside the baby Fishlegs in the basket that was washed up on the long beach fourteen long years before. It wasn't exactly gold and jewels, just an old lobster claw, but Hiccup knew what it meant. You can't give me this, Fishlegs, said Hiccup, it's the only thing you own that came from your parents. Fishleg spoke very formally, as if he were a grown-up. Goodbyes are solemn things. Once I wanted to look for my family, said Fishlegs. I dreamed I'd show them this, and they would know that I was theirs. But now I'm grown, I know the hooligan tribe is my family. You have been like a mother and a father to me, Hiccup. Time after time you have put my life before your own, and so I give you this, the greatest gift I have to give. I give it to you, said Fishlegs, putting it round Hiccup's neck so grandly that it was like he was a hero anointing his king. As a sign of my loyalty and my faith in you, and in the hope that it will bring you the luck that it once brought me, when I was saved from the waves by the will of the gods, and Fishlegs bowed low, like he was bowing to his lord, and backed away, as one must when one is in the royal presence. Sweet, purred the witch, very sweet, stop, my eyes are tearing up. And she took the eldest elder's stick and jabbed the backing Fishlegs with it, so that he fell over. Back, back, you fish-legged freak boy, you cannot go where he must go now, lucky for you. Hiccup felt the lobster claw around his neck. Fishlegs' faith in him had given him strength. No, he shouted, you are wrong. Our fate is not what we look like. It is not written down in the stars. It is not the mark upon us. Our fate is who we are. We shall see, hissed the witch. We shall see. Now, your fate shall be decided by your new king. Who could that be? Now, if the runt is disqualified, and the runt's father too, why, bless my very eyes and whiskers, the one who came third must be king. The new king must be... All her life the witch had waited for this moment, planned for it, schemed for it, killed for it, plotting and spinning her webs in the darkness, and now, at last, here it was. Fate was her friend after all these years. The witch spread wide her arms like the wings of a bat and screamed up to the heavens. The new king is Alvin the Treacherous, blood of my blood and bone of my bone. And then she turned to Hiccup. Checkmate, I think you'll find. Hiccup, horrendous, Haddock the Third. Twenty, the triumph of the treacherous.
Dear, oh dear, oh dear, whispered the wooden fang, talking to himself. Oh, that didn't take long, did it? The crown has fallen into the wrong hands even quicker than last time. The wooden fang didn't seem as downcast as he should have been. But Hiccup is the heir. I know that now. There is no doubt about it. The sky was very dark now, deep with thunder clouds so close above their heads it felt like you could reach out and touch them. Everyone felt in a bewildered way that the world had turned upside down. They had just banished Stoic the Vast, who most people agreed was a thoroughly nice chap, an old burglar, of course, but generally thought to be a good Viking and one of them. And now the chief of the outcasts was about to be made their king. What was going on? They had been tricked, but they couldn't quite put their hairy fingers on how it had happened. The dragons were tense, their cat's eyes gleaming in the darkness, down on their haunches, muscles poised for flight. Only minutes ago, they were in touching distance of freedom. But a minute can be a long time. A new lord for the Vikings meant a new lord for themselves, too. What would it mean? Who was this treacherous human, and what did he stand for? Alvin threw back his cloak and strode to the centre of the battle arena, swelling with triumph. He had been a handsome man once, and you could still see that in the ruins of his face, scarred like a fallen angel. You could still see that in the grace and elegance of the ironic bow he made to Hiccup. I am only sorry, he smiled, as charming as if he were at an evening feast, that we did not meet in battle one last time, Hiccup Perendus Haddock the Third. But I am sure you are not a poor loser. His voice turned to iron. Hand over the storm blade and the king's things. One by one, Hiccup handed them over. The storm blade, the Roman shield, the ticking thing, the key that opens all locks, the arrow from the land that does not exist, the bracelet with the ruby heart stone, the crown, and last of all, the sword, Hiccup, hand over the sword. The dragon jewel was hers. She knew it, for the sword would point the way. Oh, yes, it is the triumph of the treacherous at last for you, Alvin. You are king. And with that, the witch went down upon her knees and knelt before her son, the new king. Graciously, Alvin allowed her to kiss his hand. You see how sometimes it is not clear what story we are telling from the outset. For the story we have been a part of, it turns out, has not just been about the making of a hero, but also about the making of a villain. The Alvin that we first met, many books and years ago, was not the same terrible man who was now about to be crowned upon the castle that once was Flashburns. When first we met him, he was a charming, sneaking, elegant sort of fellow, barely able to hold his own in a sword fight. Since then, dreadful things have happened to Alvin, all his own fault, of course, but he has suffered nonetheless. Suffering can, of course, make a man a better person, but with Alvin it went the other way, and it had made him far, far worse. With every ghastly experience, he lost a little more of his humanity, along with his hair, his leg, his nose, his eye. And now he stands, muscled, hardened, brutal and merciless, a truly awful man indeed to wield the power he would hold from now on. Alvin took the crown, put it on his head and turned to face the still silent crowd. The witch gave a sigh of the purest satisfaction. And now, Alvin said silkily and almost casually gesturing to Hiccup, Put this slave boy and his father into chains and throw them to the ugly thong slave lands, never to return. Put the mark upon the father, too, as a sign of how he betrayed his own people. Friends, barbarians and Vikings, he yelled. He thrust the endeavour in the air. Let me tell you what kind of king I am going to be. I am not come to set your dragons free sneered Alvin the Treacherous. Are we to just sit back and let them destroy our world? I say no, and again no. From now on, 
I declare war of the most dreadful and bloody kind on all wild dragons. All wild dragons must be killed on sight, with our north bows and our axes, and the most fanciful instruments of human ingenuity. We shall seek out their nests, set fire to their habitats, destroy their eggs and their hibernating young. Alvin was drunk on power now, and as for the domestic dragons, he purred gloatingly. Alvin had never liked dragons of any kind, and here was his chance for revenge. Dangerous times call for drastic measures. All domestic dragons shall be chained at all times, unless they are doing a job for a human. They shall spend their nights in cages. Any hint of rebellion, and they will be killed on the spot. There was a silence as these words sank in. This was too much, even for the meaner tribes, the murderers and the busy thugs. One person clapped. The witch. He cannot rule over us, cried Kamikaze. Oh, I'm sorry, purred the witch. Don't you remember? A promise is a promise if it is made in blood. No, shouted Hiccup. No, you mustn't do this. You'll anger our dragons into joining the rebellion. They'll turn against us. Coward, sneered Alvin the Treacherous. Keep calm, cried Hiccup to the dragons in Dragonese, as all around him he could hear the dragons beginning to scream and snarl. Not even the tough tribes agree with him. They just need a bit of time to see sense. Don't do anything stupid. Nobody do anything stupid. But it was too late. One eye, the saber-toothed driver dragon, leapt through the crowd like a great white lion, scattering Vikings to all sides. He threw back his head and roared, How dare you, human worm? Us dragons were not born for chains. I, for one, am joining the rebellion, and you shall be my first victim. He opened his mouth to bite Alvin in half. Seize him! screeched Alvin, and ten or twenty burly Vikings tackled the great dragon and pinned him to the ground. Alvin drew the storm blade. You, you great white elephant, smiled Alvin, his own mean one eye smiling into the furious struggling dragon's one eye, shall be the first to die. I shall christen this battle arena with your foul dragon blood, and thus the war begins. But first, I will make you blind. No, wept Hiccup, unable to bear it. No, no, no. Alvin raised his sword to bring it down on the helpless dragon's head. But just as he was about to bring it down, the ground beneath Alvin's feet seemed to buckle and tremble. And behind Alvin's head, the witch's fortune-telling hut, that little sinister dwelling, exploded in front of the Viking's eyes, sending bits of brick and cobwebs and destiny charts and birds' bones and the whole messy morass of the witch's room showering all over the crowd. By complete coincidence, the entire gunky, stinking contents of one of the witch's cauldrons landed on her head, along with the sign saying, Fortunes told, futures improved and a great gush of fire shot through the hole where the hut once was, two hundred feet up into the air, as if someone had struck fire instead of oil, like a great geezer of flame. Twenty-one. The Collapse of the Castle It was the Dragon Furious. This was his fire exploding the witch's well, his fury that was shaking the castle to its very foundations, his shoulders that were squeezing their way upwards, breaking the stone around them, his shrieking anger that was making its way to the surface. The shock of the hut exploding distracted Alvin's attention for a moment and one eye broke free. And as the fury grew and grew, the Vikings' towers did tremble. The solid stone moved beneath their feet as if it had turned to ocean. Great cracks appeared in the ancient castle, like the splitting and breaking of an iceberg, lumps of stone raining down from the shaking battlements. The edges of the hole where the hut had stood just moments before fell in on themselves as the dragon furious burrowed upwards with his powerful claws. His great fountain of fire and smoke went shooting up hundreds of feet into the air, sending dragons and humans scurrying and fleeing in all directions. 
the gigantic creature's shoulders shook aside the stone as if it were water. His head burst through the gaping hole in the floor and up, 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 he rose like a living earthquake, splaying one claw on the edge of the hole and heaving his body slowly upwards. With a last shrugging scream, he leapt free of the stone and earth and into the air, his spreading wings bursting a trembling tower into pieces, his mighty wingspan darkening the sun like an enormous cloud. Petrified, the Vikings stared upwards at their terrifying enemy. And for the first time, they realised, too late, that while they were absorbed in their own human drama, and even the sentries at the castle were watching the battle for the crown of the Wilder West, Dragons had been creeping across the sky towards the castle. Hostile dragons, rogue and red rage dragons. And now the sky above was dark with dragons. The dragon furious shot his flame to left and right in a screaming fiery river. Join the red rage and rebel, brother dragons, rebel! Now, if Hiccup had still been king of the Wilder West, the domestic dragons would have replied to the dragon furious that they were already free, thank you very much, and the great dragon rebellion might have been stopped before it started. You cannot rebel if you are already free. You see how near Hiccup was to triumph? So near, and yet so far. As it was, all around the castle, the dragons that had been quiet as cats became a nest of hissing serpents. Out sprang their claws, their teeth like knives, the hot fire flamed. Rebel, brother dragons, rebel, came the trumpeting tones of one eye. The humans are our mortal enemies now. Join us, oh my brothers, in the red rage and rebel. All around the stadium, the echo came. Rebel. Quiet at first, the whisper went, then louder still, and louder. Rebel, they spat. Rebel, they hissed. Rebel, rebel, rebel! And with one accord, like a dragon cloud, they turned upon their masters. With surprised yells, the Vikings drew their weapons to defend themselves as dragons leaped upon their backs, lion claws raking, and the hot fire burnt their unprotected skin. All around Hiccup, the battle raged, dragon against human. The air was filled with the screams of the attacking dragons, the Vikings barely able to believe that they were being fought by the very same creatures who had fed from their hands and slept at their firesides. It was as if some alien wild spirit had got into them, as if they had been cornered by a previously unsuspected enemy. Stoic, abandoned by his captors but still unarmed, was faced by his own dragon, Bullhart, crouched down low like a tiger about to spring, growling deep in his throat, the anger glands thick about his neck. Down, Bullhart, down, commanded Stoic. But Bullhart did not appear to hear him. He kept his steady cat's eyes on Stoic as he crept slowly forward. He seemed to be growling, but if Stoic could speak Dragonese, he would have recognised the following words. Join the red rage and rebel. Make red your claws with human blood. Obliterate the human filth. Torch the humans like a wood. The rebellion is coming. Stoic swallowed. Down, Bullhart, he said. Bellowing did not seem to be doing its usual magic, for the dragon crept on regardless. Slake your thirst with human tears. Do not spare the human child. Incinerate the human pest. The dragon time is coming. Down! bellowed Stoic desperately. As with a mighty roar, his old war horse of a dragon leapt towards him, mouth agape, talons pointed, nostrils flaring, throat working to release the deadly fire. And all would not have gone well for Stoic if Viking arrows were not already flying through the air as the humans defended themselves, and if one of these arrows had not pierced the leg of the charging bullheart, felling him to the ground with a yowl of pain and fury. The castle was falling fast now. Three of the towers were down, a fourth was tottering, and the dragons were attacking with such force and savagery, and the Vikings were so unprepared for the sudden onslaught on the castle that their defeat seemed inevitable. 
Here, the flames scorching and wrecking, warriors fleeing with screams, firing their arrows over their shoulders. There, the dragon furious, breathtaking in his enormity, tearing up the armoury where some unfortunate Vikings had fled for shelter, or blasting the warriors into the next world with a river of flame. All around, the roar of dragon and the sickening thud of axe blade or sword sinking into flesh. There was a constant rain of arrows, a steady drift of spears, and swords melted and twisted by the hail of fire. The Vikings had got hold of the catapults and were using these against the dragons, causing terrible injuries. But the Vikings were not winning. Hiccup could see this, even as he squinted through the choking clouds of smoke, panting, desperate. They were losing. I can't let this happen, whispered Hiccup. I can't let this happen. But what could he do? His hands were bound with rope. The castle was falling down. The dragons were killing the humans all around. What could he do? Toothless! shouted Hiccup into the uncaring air. Toothless! Please come here! I need you! Toothless! Twenty-two. Red Rage. Toothless was closer than Hiccup realised. The red rage had entirely overtaken him, like a powerful drug takes hold of a feeble mind. The ancient primeval anger of the wild world took him over so crazily that he lost his sight in the dizzying force of it, and it numbed the sensible parts of his brain. Drunk with power and fury, he attacked the discarded shoe of a fleeing Viking under the misguided belief that it was a real human child. Red rage! he squeaked, ripping out the shoelaces. Red rage! he screamed, shredding the leather into tangled rags of ribbons. Hunt the human and throw him to the fire! he screeched as he tore out the soul and blasted it with flames. What was it about Hiccup's voice that cut through the fog of fury and made Toothless turn and stare? his mouth full of smoking shoe leather. The mist of the red rage that had descended on the little dragon lifted as if by magic. Toothless turned. He dropped the shoe. He flew to where Hiccup was standing, bound with ropes. Toothless! exclaimed Hiccup. Quick, bite my ropes and find the windwalker. Do this, do do, do that, grumbled the little dragon. Toothless, not your servant! But he bit through the ropes with one quick snap of his sharp little jaws and he flew to find the windwalker with none of his usual laziness. The windwalker was flying around in confused circles some distance away, searching for Hiccup. The red rage had not taken him over, but it had thoroughly disorientated him, interrupting his radar, and what with that and the smoke and dodging the arrows and spears, he was looping the loop and bumping into other dragons and accidentally chasing his own tail. Hiccup needs us, squeaked Toothless, forgetting to be cool, and the windwalker followed the little dragon, weaving expertly through the aerial battlefield, and crash-landed beside Hiccup in an untidy scramble. Hiccup leapt onto the windwalker's back in the nick of time, for a tongue twister was lunging his way, and the windwalker climbed up, up, up into the air. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Hiccup guided the windwalker down for a moment to the edge of the battle arena, and leant over to pick up the warden's fang and his waistcoat. What are you bothering with him for? complained Toothless. We don't need him. I knew I wasn't wrong about you, exclaimed the warden's fang in delight. You are the heir after all. But Hiccup's view from the windwalker's back as the black dragon swam higher and higher through the air gave him a full view of the desperate tragedy of the situation. The castle was collapsing even further now, caving in on itself, crumbling into the great hole in the centre caused by the eruption of the dragon furious. The great dragon himself was right in the centre, breathing out flame almost continuously. Practically all the warriors in the archipelago had gathered at the castle, don't forget, so they were a mighty army indeed, and they were fighting back the dragons with enormous bravery. To the left, he could see Snotlout, admittedly fighting with terrific skill and valour, urging on the hooligans as if he were chief already. In the centre was the fiercest fighting, for there was Alvin the Treacherous, and the majority of dragons were trying to get the sword endeavour. Alvin was surrounded by a ring of tribesmen, fighting to defend their new king, and he was giving a good account of himself, the storm blade fixed into his attachment, the endeavour in the other hand. To the right, the bog burglars had got hold of a catapult and were constantly reloading, blasting great holes in the dragon attack. Things were looking dreadful nonetheless. The casualties on both sides were horrific in number, and the Vikings were losing. Hiccup could see that, 
for they were unprepared and they had no means of joining in the aerial combat now their own dragons had deserted them. The red rage was terrifyingly loud now, a dreadful drumming sound that no human being should ever have to hear, a jungle noise that chilled the blood and choked the heart and sent the hairs on the scalp tingling with electric horror. They're going to destroy each other, thought Hiccup. But what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? I'm just one person. What can I do? Into Hiccup's frazzled brain there floated old Wrinkly's words. And then the world will need a hero, and it might as well be you. Windwalker! Hiccup whispered into his riding dragon's ear. Windwalker, head towards that patch of light over there. There was a small clearing in the clouds, and narrowly missing a couple of arrows, Windwalker flew right into it. All around was blackness and smoke, but in that tiny patch of bright blue sky, the sun glinted dazzlingly off Windwalker's shining wings and Hiccup's dragonskin fire suit, so that they were clearly visible from down below. A ray blinked down into Kamikaze's eye, and Kamikaze saw him. Though she was fighting hard, and despite the fact you could only see the outline of a human mounted on a dragon's back, she knew that it was him. Hiccup, she whispered with passionate relief, forgetting that he had the slave mark and just gratefully was there. Hiccup, he's going to save us. I know he will. He'll have some clever plan. To tell the truth, Hiccup had absolutely no plan at all. But as he hung there in the crack of light, the only piece of hope in a dark and dreadful world, a glimmer of an idea popped into his head. Dragons! yelled Hiccup. Dragons! Forget about the sword, for I have the jewel already in my hand! He held up his clenched fist way over his head. Dragon's hearing is so acute they can hear the nano-dragons laughing to one another in the grasses. They heard this all right. Slowly, the dragon furious turned its mighty head towards the boy as if he were an annoying insect buzzing above his head. The dragon's jaws were already dipped scarlet with human blood. His eyes narrowed. Truth or lies? It's not true, he hissed. Not true. The boy lies. I know it by my own forked tongue. He narrowed his eyes further, squinting beyond the light, beyond the boy seeking, seeking into the future, his mind processing the possibilities like an endless game of chess. Something that he saw there made him hiss, and yet, and yet. Catch the boy, screamed the dragon furious. Chase him, hunt him, tear him from the sky. Whatever you do, don't let him get away. A thousand dragons paused and held their fire. A thousand dragons turned their heads and their narrowing yellow, green and blue cat's eyes and focused them on the boy like they were arrows and he was the target. Toothless, hovering some considerable distance above Hiccup's head, gave a yelp of horror, put his little claws together as if he were praying, folded back his wings and dived ten feet downwards into the front of Hiccup's shirt, joining the warden's fang down there. Fly, Windwalker, Hiccup whispered into the Windwalker's ear. Fly, Windwalker, fly! Fly like you've never flown before! 23. Fly, Windwalker, fly! One second, the Vikings were fighting a losing battle. The next... Thousands and thousands of dragons let out a simultaneous scream. The entire dragon army, the dragon furious himself, and dragons in their thousands flew in screaming bloodlust pursuit after the boy on the dragon. The windwalker let out a petrified scream like that of a trapped fox. He buzzed around in crazy circles in the patch of light, looping the loop as if that was helpful. Fly, Windwalker, fly, whispered Stoic from down below, forgetting for a moment that he was a slave and willing his son on. Fly, or they'll tear him to pieces. With a dreadful whinnying snort, the Windwalker came to his senses and shot off in a random direction. Panting, shocked, blackened, the Vikings found their enemy had deserted them as suddenly as they had attacked. 
craning their necks upwards. They could see the entire dragon army up there in the firmament, swarming from horizon to horizon, from sky tip to sky tip, like a swarm of angry hornets chasing a tiny little gnat. The gnat that was Hiccup dashed this way and that, up, down, zigzagging, looping with the entire murderous swarm zooming after him, breaking up as they doubled back on themselves, reforming, closing in, droning the chilling red rage as they flew. He's going to tire, whispered Kamikaze, hopping from foot to foot in anxiety. They'll catch him when he tires. What an unpleasant smile was on the face of Alvin the Treacherous as he stared upwards into the sky. And that, he drawled, that is the end of Hiccup Horrendous Haddock the Third. By the ghost of my good right hand it is. Alvin turned and faced his new subject. Back straight, face stern, every inch a king. Vikings, we are now at war. War outright bloody and terrible. Shall our brother comrades lying dead about us, ripped and scorched to death by the talons and the fire of these vermin, shall they all have died in vain? Cries of no from the furious, devastated Vikings. We shall not sleep, brother Vikings. We shall not close our eyes. We shall return to our islands and build weapons of war, so gruesome and so murderous that these dragons could not even dream of them. We shall not rest till every forked tongued crocodile lies dead and wingless at our feet. Extinction, brother Vikings! We are aiming for extinction! You must not blame the Vikings' reaction here, readers. Remember that all around them were the sad bodies of their fallen comrades. Remember the shock of their domestic dragons rebelling against them. They were grieved and shocked out of their normal senses. From now on, yelled Alvin, you must kill every dragon on sight. No questions asked. Swear to me that you will. The Vikings swore that terrible oath. This is the way that wars begin. And that was how the last great war between humans and dragons finally came about, and how Alvin, loathed by many, became the leader of the human army. Wars make strange and terrible leaders. To the boats, yelled Alvin, before the dragons return. And then, in an aside to Bellicose, the leader of the Bashamoiks, Take this stoic to the ugly thug slave lands. Be sure to put the mark upon him like that traitor his son. And to the hooligans, I declare the next chief of the hooligan tribe shall be this snot-faced thought-lout in honour of his noble act exposing the treachery of stoic and his son. Here I say, protested Baggy Bum the beer belly, outraged to be overlooked, even though Snotlout was his own son. I'm the next in line to the chieftain. Alvin smiled his horrid smile. What this day has shown is that you old fat men are past it. Snotlout is the chief, and anyone who objects will follow stoic to the slave lands. So Snotlout had what he had desired all along the chiefdom of the hooligan tribe. His chest swelled up like a cockerel's. I knew it, he thought to himself exultantly. I knew it had to be me. I knew I couldn't be this brilliant for nothing. He couldn't repress a smile of infinite smugness, one that lit up his pimply face as he twirled the flash cut in one hand. His first act as chief showed off Snotlout's character in its most unpleasant light. Move along there, baggy bum, he ordered his father self-importantly. Don't dawdle. You heard the king. To the boats. So that was a sad procession of Vikings, scrambling over the devastated edges of their once impregnable castle, down the mighty cliffs to their half-broken ships. They carried their dead and injured on makeshift stretchers as they retreated back to their homelands, ready to make war on the entire dragon race. Kamikaze, hurrying along with the bog burglars, stopped a moment beside Fishlegs, standing still as a stone, tears pouring down his face, looking down at Hiccup's helmet lying at his feet on top of the rubble. 
Why are you crying? asked Kamikaze in surprise. Hiccup is dead, whispered Fishlegs. No, he's not, said Kamikaze briskly. You gave him your lucky lobster claw, didn't you? What use is a lucky lobster claw? He was being hunted by the entire Dragon Rebellion, said Fishlegs. He'll think of something, said Kamikaze. He always does. Listen, Fishlegs. Kamikaze put a hand on Fishlegs' shoulder. You can't despair now. I was wrong to turn my back on Hiccup with the others. You stood by him, so you can't give up on him now. Now we have to hope for the best and trust that Hiccup will save us from the dragons. How can he possibly save us? asked Fishlegs. Even if he survives, from now on he's an outcast, an exile. There are some people who really come into their own in a crisis, and Kamikaze was one of them. The joyous light of battle was in her eyes. She whistled breezily through her front teeth. Suddenly, she looked much older, too. Yep, everything is upside down, isn't it? said Kamikaze. But Hiccup has already saved us, hasn't he? If he hadn't drawn off the dragons, we'd have been massacred. Be strong, Fishlegs. Be strong and hope for the best. Kamikaze hurried off to join her own tribe. Fishlegs took off his broken glasses, polished them and jammed them firmly back on his blackened nose. He picked up Hiccup's helmet, put it on his head instead of his own, and squared his shoulders. He knew that he was in for a bad time now that Snotlout was chief of the hooligan tribe, but he straightened his back nonetheless. However bad his own situation, Hiccup's would be infinitely worse. He would be strong. He would hope for the best. 24. The Boy Hunt Kamikaze was right. Hiccup needed all the hope and courage that he could get. Being pursued by the entire dragon army was the most terrifying thing that had happened to him in his whole life, and Hiccup had had some terrifying experiences. Screaming through the sky, crouched flat on the windwalker's back, his arms around the dragon's neck, he felt his end was coming. He couldn't get his feet in the stirrups, so he was clinging on with his arms so cold they were practically statues. Behind him, the stupefyingly scary sound of thousands and thousands of dragons in pursuit. The red rage sound in itself had to be fought, for it numbed the brain into defeat and despair. Hunt the human from the sky. Burn him up and let him die. Hunt the human. Hunt the human. Don't listen, sobbed Hiccup. Don't listen, Windwalker. Don't listen. He made the mistake of glancing over his shoulder once and the sight was so terrifying it made his stomach turn to water. Thousands and thousands of dragons, murder in their eyes, the flames so close they were nearly touching him, a flying pack of ravenous and angry wolves, they'd tear him to pieces when they caught him. The red rage was getting closer, Hiccup could hear it, louder, louder, always louder. Give up, the red rage was telling him, and Hiccup tried to close his brain, but the noise seeped in anyway. You've lost already. Death is sweet. Embrace it, the triumphant voice of the dragon furious. We've got him. We've got him. The extraordinary, crazy rock formations in the gorge of the Thunderbolt of Thor turned it into a gigantic slalom course. One second's lack of concentration, and they would crash straight into a pillar of stone and knock themselves out of this world and into the next. On top of this, the gorge itself was shaped, as its name suggests, like a lightning bolt, and the cliffs twisted and turned around corners in a wildly contorted fashion. Whoa! This needed advanced flying skills of the most extreme kind, super extreme advanced, in fact. And if Gobber could have seen Hiccup picking his way through that gorge like threading a needle at supersonic speed, he would have been a very proud six-and-a-half-foot lunatic. Very proud indeed. Toothless feels her uh, sick, slow down. The little dragon popped his head out of Hiccup's shirt, screamed at the sight of an upcoming wall of stone that Hiccup steered the windwalker wildly away from right at the last minute, and dived down the shirt beside the wooden's fang again, putting his wings over his eyes for good measure. Okay, they weren't going to be able to outrun the pursuing dragons this way, so he'd have to go up instead. Up, windwalker, up. The boy and the dragon shot up out of the gorge like a firework, the swarm of dragons even closer now. Hiccup urged the windwalker higher and higher. If we get high enough, a lot of them won't be able to follow, thought Hiccup. You see, 
Hiccup's short life spent studying dragons meant that he knew so much about them. Most dragons much prefer operating in what they call shallow air, the air close to the land, just out of reach of the treetops, is their environment and their playground. Very few dragons are deep air dragons. They don't like the higher air above the clouds with its sudden winds and lighter atmosphere. They don't like that at all. Toothless's ears are pur- pur- popping, wailed Toothless's muffled voice from deep in Hiccup's shirt. And he's squashed. Higher, Windwalker, higher, Hiccup whispered to the Windwalker. He couldn't really breathe now. He tried not to think about what might happen if he passed out, because he wasn't tied on. Just a little higher. The Windwalker's wings swam ever upwards, up, up, up. Hiccup's ears were popping too. But as he looked down, the dragons following them were fading in their pursuit. The Windwalker's wings were taking them further than they could follow. The beautiful black dragon sailed on and on through the clouds, higher and higher, further and further. The air was cold now. They were so high, leaving all of Hiccup's problems behind. Hiccup was extremely tired. He laid his face down on the Windwalker's back and he slept. He woke up in a cave he did not recognise. What could he do now? Even his helmet was lost. It was a small thing, but it made him feel so naked. Hiccup's hair stood up like a hedgehog's, caked with dirt, the ends singed with flame. Without the helmet to cover it, the slave mark blazed a scar of shame on his forehead, his face grey with ash and streaked with tears. I am alone, said Hiccup aloud, and far away. You are not alone, replied the wooden's fang gravely, sitting like a little statue guarding him a couple of feet away. You have these two dragons, and you have me. The windwalker was sleeping in that alien cave, his long untidy body stretched out as peacefully as if he was snoozing on the cliff face as he snored. Oh, sure dreaming once again of butterflies. Toothless was awake and scratching himself and wondering what was for supper. Hiccup hid his face in his elbow, for he was ashamed. Why are you helping me? I broke my promise to you the instant that I made it. You did not break your promise, said the wooden swang. You promised that you would try to do your best, and that is what you did. And I am helping you because you are not alone. For some reason, these two very ordinary dragons... Here, I say, protested Toothless. Toothless, not ordinary. These two exceptionally common dragons, continued the wooden swang, have not succumbed to the red rage. They have stayed loyal to you. There have been very few human beings throughout history who have created that kind of loyalty. The wooden swang sighed. His eyes looked back into the past. Humans have disappointed me, oh, so many times. Perhaps I am wrong, Hiccup the Third, but I think that you are different. You are the one, and for you, I'll hope again. Just one last time. There was such an ache in the old dragon's voice. Hiccup's face was still in his elbow. You see... This was a test, just like all the others, and perhaps it was the best test of all. A hero cannot triumph all the time. Sometimes he will be defeated, and how he faces that defeat is a test of his character. Flashburn had been given that test late in his life, and he had been found wanting. And now Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III had been defeated, perhaps even more thoroughly than Flashburn himself, He had lost everything. Tribe, friends, father, family. He was unarmed, in rags, alone and hiding in a cave. An outcast and an exile. For a while, Hiccup cried into his elbow. And then, slowly, 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 Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III brought down his arm. He wiped his nose with the end of his sleeve and, I'll try not to let you down, said Hiccup the Third. What can I do? 
you can find the dragon jewel, said the wooden fang. The jewel is the only thing the dragon furious will listen to now. He is afraid of it. I am afraid of it myself, for if it is broken, the jewel has the power to destroy dragons forever. Where is this jewel hidden? asked Hiccup. The jewel disappeared, like all the king's things, when Grimbeard the Ghastly died, replied the wooden fang. But it is said that the dragon sword holds the secret of where the jewel is now. Old Wrinkly said the sword points the way, said Hiccup. But I don't have the sword any more. Alvin the Treacherous has the sword. The wooden fang sighed. This is true, he said sadly. And this makes it even more important that we should get hold of the jewel first. After only a very short acquaintance, I can see that this Alvin the Treacherous is an extremely unpleasant human being. If he finds the jewel, he will not hesitate to use it, and dragons shall be no more. Gloom settled on the already gloomy little cave. Toothless was bored with all this talking, and aware that everybody had got their priorities completely wrong, and weren't really caring about the more vital question of what Toothless was going to eat next. He was getting sleepy again, so he climbed onto Hiccup's shoulder, took Hiccup's face between his paws, so that Hiccup had to look at him straight in the eyes, and said, "Mama, master, tell this old brown dragon that this waistcoat is a toothless's place, because toothless is Hiccup's hunting dragon." Of course you are, toothless," said Hiccup, stroking toothless behind the ears. "There's only one dragon for me." Satisfied. Toothless burrowed down Hiccup's waistcoat again, and as he wriggled around trying to get comfy in his special place right above Hiccup's heart, the waistcoat rustled, reminding Hiccup of something. A great surge of hope rose within him. Surely it wasn't possible. Wodensfang said Hiccup eagerly, "How does the sword show the way to the jewel?" "You're a clever boy, Hiccup," said the Wodensfang. "You must know that it is not the sword itself that is important." The dragon sword, or what did you call it, the endeavour, is a perfectly ordinary sword, more ordinary than most. What is important is not the sword itself, but what is inside the sword. There is a secret compartment. Yes, yes, I know," said Hiccup impatiently. "I found that ages ago, and inside the secret compartment is this." Hiccup reached into his waistcoat and took out the paper that was Grimbeard the Ghastly's last will and testament. He had shoved it into his waistcoat a couple of weeks ago when Stoic shouted at him from the battle arena, and he had completely forgotten to put it back in the secret compartment again. The warden's fang looked at him open-mouthed. Well, bless my wings and whiskers! I took it out earlier and forgot to put it back. Explained Hiccup. Grimbeard's map to show where the jewel is hidden! Exclaimed the warden's fang in delight. But it isn't a map, said Hiccup. Typical Grimbeard to make things even more difficult than they already were. It's Grimbeard's will. Hiccup read it aloud. I leave to my true heir this my favourite sword, because the storm blade always lunged a little to the left, and the best is not always the most obvious. Yours, in the hope that you will make a better leader than I was. G G. Hiccup's hands were still stained purple with vorpent venom from wrestling with the witch. And as he read, the venom seemed to be doing something to the paper. Hiccup was about to wipe them when, to his astonishment, he realised that words were appearing. The purple was bringing out a secret message, a message that had not been seen for over one hundred years. Courage, said the message. What is within is more important than what is without. This is not the end. I promise. Here is the map, and the map can lead you to the dragon jewel. Hiccup turned the piece of paper over. It was blank on the other side, but as he rubbed it with the vorpent venom, lines began to appear—the lines of a map, a map that would lead him to the dragon jewel. The rebellion could be stopped after all. The boy leapt to his feet. This is not the end! He shouted. Far, far away, there was another shout. Half burnt, their sails dark with fire, the Viking navy limped out of the eastern archipelago, 
singing the song of the dead. The Vikings were barbarians, but their voices were very beautiful. Turn their bones to coral, Thor, their song to wind and hearts to gold. They live forever in the skies, eating rainbows with the gods. And then the song turning darker, the rhythmic drums threatening. Give us now our just revenge, instead of corn, bring us blood. Turn our peacetime into war, let us feast on knives and swords. To the angry beat of this song came the ominous sound of swords being sharpened, axes banged on shields. Way at the front of the sneaking line of ships were the outcast vessels, once the pariahs of the archipelago, now its leaders. On the very first ship, the witch Excelinor and her son, the new king of the Wilder West. Let me show you, Alvin, dearest, cooed the witch, the secret of the dragon sword. Cloak flapping round her in the wind like a malevolent bat, greedy, bony fingers in the sword's secret compartment. A shriek as the witch Excelinor opened up the secret compartment of the sword and found that it was empty. A terrible, disappointed howl. That wretched, burgling little rat has stolen the map! No, this was not the end. Epilogue by Cressida Cowell, translator of the Hiccup Memoirs. When I was a little girl, living on an island in a deep blue sea, I asked myself a question. What if dragons really existed? So imagine my excitement when I was the first one to translate the first of Hiccup's memoirs, and I realised, trembling, that the frail, nearly not there writing on the document was answering that simple, glorious question for the very first time. A question that humans had asked themselves across the vastness of continents, across the inky span of centuries, here finally found in one tiny box, discovered one accidental day by a boy on a beach. Here, at last, was the answer. Dragons did exist, and this was the proof. Now I'm on to the ninth of his memoirs, and I know there's not long to go. But what I'm realising, slowly, gradually, is that the memoirs are asking a question to which I don't really want to know the answer. If dragons really existed, what happened to the dragons? Where are they now? I dread to know the answer to this question. I don't want to know. Because I have an awful feeling that Hiccup, whom I have grown to love, has something to do with their disappearance. I don't want to know, and if I'd known that this was the question in the first place, perhaps I wouldn't have started. But I can't stop now. I have to know the answer. The rebellion has begun. Things are not looking good. I told you right at the beginning of this book that things were getting darker, and now things are darker still. Snotlout is the new chief of the hooligan tribe. Stoic has been banished and given the slave mark. And Alvin the Treacherous has eight of the king's lost things and has been proclaimed the new king of the Wilder West. What can Hiccup do, alone as he is, and hunted now by both humans and dragons alike? Can he find the dragon jewel, mankind's last and only hope? And if he does, what will he do with it? Watch out for the next volume of Hiccup's memoirs, book 10, to find out more. You don't have to read the Hiccup books in order, but if you want to, this is the right order. 1. How to train your dragon. 2. How to be a pirate. 3. How to speak dragonese. 4. How to cheat a dragon's curse. 5. How to twist a dragon's tail. 6. A Hero's Guide to Deadly Dragons 7. How to Ride a Dragon's Storm 8. How to Break a Dragon's Heart 
Nine, how to steal a dragon's sword. Ten, how to seize a dragon's jewel. How the hook survived the flames. Things were so hectic there that I didn't get a moment to describe to you how Alvin and his mother survived the fire in Berserk. At the end of How to Break a Dragon's Heart, Alvin plunged into the heart of the Inferno and his mother, the witch Excelinor, jumped down after him. By some horrible miracle, they fell down into the only lake on Berserk. And although they are evil, you have to admire their resilience. They swam around in circles for nearly two days, a remarkable feat for an elderly woman and a one-legged, one-armed man, before the fire burnt itself out. Then they picked their way across the smoking remains of the island, and the witch's powers of persuasion managed to hitch them a lift with a passing Visithug ship to the outcast lands. I cannot tell you, however, how the witch managed to kidnap Ugg the Ugly Thug along the way. I know some of the witch's secrets but not all.